Let us welcome our guest of honour, Singapore's Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for Economic Policies, Mr Heng Sui Kiet, with a round of applause. A very good morning to all. My name is Usha and I will be your MC for today. On behalf of the organizers, the US National Academy of Medicine, the Ministry of Health Singapore, the National University Health System, the National University of Singapore, and the South Foundation, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all our in-person and online guests attending the Singapore Summit of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine's Global Roadmap for Healthy Longevity Report. Singapore is privileged to be chosen to be the first site for dissemination since the release of the Global Roadmap for Healthy Longevity Report in early June 2022. Today, we have here with us the commissioners who have gathered to discuss key findings and recommendations from the report. Without further delay, we would like to invite Singapore Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for Economic Policies, Mr. Heng Sui Kiet, to deliver the opening speech. DPM, sir, please. Professor Victor Chow, President of the National Academy of Medicine, Professor Linda Freed and Professor John Wong, Co-Chairs of the International Commission of the Global Roadmap for Healthy Longevity. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to join you this morning at the Singapore Summit of the US National Academy of Medicine Global Roadmap for Healthy Longevity Report. For much of human history, the average human lifespan was less than 50 years. Aging and retirement were not mainstream concepts. And for those who were lucky enough to live to old age, many continued to work as long as they were able to. It is noteworthy that even as life expectancies rose in the past century, the average retirement age has generally stayed the same or become even earlier. This is partly due to social safety nets and changing societal norms surrounding retirement. But as lifespan increase, the key question for all societies is how we can support our people in leading meaningful and purposeful lives throughout their years. This is something that we have been thinking about for some time in Singapore. We have one of the fastest aging populations in the world. Today, about 14% of our population are aged 65 and above. And this will rise to almost one in two by 2050. In fact, my classmates and I, including the president of NUS, will be joining this group soon. <laughs> this is a challenge that confronts almost all societies. By 2050, the number of seniors aged 65 and above globally will more than double, 
reaching over 1.5 billion people. With large elderly populations in countries like China, India and Japan, Asia will have the largest share of such seniors, at around 60%. But it is not just Asia. As your report points out, all regions will see an increase in the size of elderly population from now to 2050. So this new report is most timely, and I'm glad that you have chosen Singapore to present the findings. I look forward to the presentations by Victor, Linda and John. They are the experts on this issue. But let me offer a few brief observations building on some striking data points. The first data point is that if current trends continue, more than half of children born in developed countries will live to 100. The 100-year life may well become the norm. This would be a dramatic development and has profound implications. Societies and individuals will have to increasingly confront the challenge of how to sustainably fund their healthcare and retirement needs. More broadly, the current life structure that is built around three stages of education, work and retirement will have to be reimagined. Some have suggested a need to move towards a multi-stage life with transitions and breaks in between. As we reimagine our life journeys, we must grasp the opportunity to better unleash the potential of people to contribute as they age. Today, many still view ageing through the lens of a silver tsunami that will impose a crippling burden on society. This is a very limiting mindset. Instead, as your report points, rightly points, puts it, it is critical that we unlock the longevity dividend, which will in turn benefit people of all ages and societies around the globe. Mindsets will need to change. Take employers, for instance. It is, it is an unfortunate reality that ages, practices and attitudes are still commonplace. Legislation can help, but a more fundamental solution is for employers to recognise that offering opportunities to older workers is not charity. Rather, it is good for their companies. Research has found that older people in multi-generational teams tend to boost the productivity of those around them, and such mixed teams perform better than single-generation ones. Older workers can also guide and mentor younger or less experienced colleagues. Work is just one way that the elderly can stay active and continue to contribute. Some prefer to spend more quality time with their family. Some volunteer for causes they are passionate about. Others may decide that they prefer a different tempo of life and take up part-time work, gig or micro jobs. Mindset change is always difficult, but it is possible. Just look at how theme how female workforce participation has improved in most societies. It would have been unthinkable just a generation or two ago. I'm hopeful that in the years ahead, we will similarly be able to tap on the full potential of seniors to contribute to our communities. The second striking data point is one from your report. Over the last two decades, even though lifespans have increased globally, the years in good health have stayed roughly the same. This means that people are living more years in poor health. In Singapore, we have managed to make some progress on this challenge. Our health adjusted life expectancy, or HALE, H -A -L -E, is the highest in the world. It has increased from 66.6 .6 years for the 1990 cohort to 73.9 years in 2019. But this is an ongoing effort and we can and must do more to improve health and alleviate the stresses around the last years of life. As a Member of Parliament, on the ground I see many active and healthy seniors, but I also see cases where families struggle to care for their parents, grandparents and other lo elderly loved ones. Science and technology hold great promise to improve the quality of life. Advances in food and nutrition sciences can enable everyone, including seniors, to stay healthy for longer. For example, Changning General Hospital developed the first 
ready-to-eat texture modified Asian meals to help those with swallowing difficulties, which is common among seniors. Advances in automation and digital technologies can also create a more inclusive work environment for elderly workers and enhance their productivity. In fact, I once met a senior at a logistics company who used to be, be doing the heavy work of bringing cargoes in and out, and he was then operating a computerized system to move the cargo. And when I asked the manager, was there an advantage in using this senior? He said, absolutely, because he knew every step of the way, and if the computer didn't quite work, he knew exactly how to fix it. <laughs> and when the seniors develop frailties, assistive technology such as robotics can help support aging in place. At the same time, it is critical for us to gain a deeper understanding of the social and behavioral dimensions associated with aging. Given the multifaceted dimensions of the challenges of aging and the opportunities of aging, we must adopt a multidisciplinary approach to make progress. The US National Academy of Medicine has launched the Healthy Longevity Global Challenge, Global Competition, which has garnered many projects. In Singapore, we introduced a National Innovation Challenge on aging to find new approaches and solutions to challenges associated with aging. The project spanned a wide range of domains like cognition, frailty prevention, and chronic disease management. For example, NTU is working on a project to use predictive analytics to determine the risk of pre-frailty or frailty for an elderly and subsequently provide personalized adaptive intervention plans. The initial findings are promising. SUTD developed an application that aims to improve the cognitive functioning of seniors by engaging them in a series of dual language cognitive tasks, such as object categorization. The application was well received by seniors and was shown to be effective in improving their cognitive performance in terms of verbal memory. Moving forward, we will continue to partner innovators everywhere and provide support for good research projects to be translated and scaled to benefit more seniors. The third data point is that the number of elderly living alone in Singapore has doubled over the last 10 years, although the absolute numbers remain small. This is not surprising with a growing elderly population and changing family structures and living arrangements. But this gives rise to greater concern over loneliness although loneliness is not limited to elderly staying alone. Loneliness has a significant impact on life and health expectancy. A study by Duke NUS and Nihon University found that lonely elder adults in Singapore and Japan lived at least three years less than their peers. They also spent less of their remaining life in good health or being active. As your report rightly points out, health is not just about healthcare, but the state of fiscal, mental, and social well-being. We need to therefore take a holistic and human-centric approach in promoting the well-being of the elderly. In Singapore, our aspiration is to build a city for all ages. This includes designing cities to be empowering and senior-friendly. Our aspiration is that even seniors with physical and cognitive frailty should have the confidence to continue to go out and lead active lives. We have silver zones to enhance road safety for seniors and also ensure that public transport is barrier-free. Our parks have also incorporated amenities for seniors, such as senior-friendly fitness corners and shelters. We also opened therapeutic gardens that offer horticulture programs to improve well-being of visitors, including seniors. And it is not just about infrastructure. It is also about strengthening the social and community support for our seniors. For example, Singapore has put in place schemes such as a proximity housing grant to encourage children and their parents to stay near each other. Beyond schemes, Singapore has also been working towards better coordination and support for seniors in the community. In 2016, I worked with several of my colleagues to pilot the community network of seniors 
in our constituencies. The goal was to take care of seniors' well-being through better integration of efforts across the many institutions and community stakeholders. The results from the pilots were encouraging, and we scaled it up nationally. Today, I'm glad that we have a Silver Generation office that organises this effort across the entire island. Silver Generation ambassadors proactively identify and reach out to seniors in need and connect them to the support in the community. We'll continue to experiment with new approaches. One major new effort is the health district at Queenstown. Queenstown has one of our oldest populations, with almost one out of every four residents aged 65 and above. We're developing a suite of bold solutions in Queenstown to support residents in their journey towards healthy longevity, such as senior-friendly infrastructure, community-driven programs, integrating health services into the community, and providing opportunities for seniors to stay active and engaged. This is a whole of society effort involving the Housing Development Board, NUHS and NUS, as well as other multiple stakeholders across the public, private and people sectors. John is one of the co-chairs of this trailblazing project and I look forward to it helping us to learn more deeply about what we can do to create longevity-ready neighbourhoods. So let me conclude. There are common challenges that all societies face. Healthy longevity is one of them. I'm therefore glad to see so many of our public health experts involved in this meaningful project. Apart from John, Cho Chuan and Mary Ann, there are also many others. And I'm delighted that the International Commission for this project involved members from all over the world, from the US, UK, Australia, Japan, China and more. And I want to thank Victor and his team uh, at the National Academy of Medicine for this partnership and for co-organising this summit together with the institutions in Singapore. This summit is an excellent platform for us to learn from one another and forge new collaborations. Across countries, we should continue to expand collaboration on major challenges that affect all of humanity, such as ageing, pandemics and climate change. Instead of frittering away our energies in conflicts and discord, let us work together to advance science, technology and innovation to address our common challenges. So I look forward to hearing the presentations and learning from all of you. Thank you. Thank you, DPM Sa. Now to the Global Roadmap for health long Healthy Longevity Report itself. Now, may I invite Dr. Victor Zhao to give an introduction to the report, please. Dr. Victor Zhao is the president of the US National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Victor Zhao, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister Hang, for a really inspiring speech. We are truly honored that you have honored us today with your presence. And I know you're going to stay for the next couple of presentations so we can actually have more interaction with you. So let me give you another round of applause, please. So Professor Tan Chuan. Dr. Marion Zhao, Professor Tan Anchai, and Professor Yeo Keiguan. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. So on behalf of the US National Medicine, it's really my great pleasure to launch this really important report, the NAM Roadmap for Health Longevity in Asia, but importantly in Singapore, a country that is a beacon and a great model of leadership and certainly you heard that from the DPM, the inspiring and thoughtful approach of, to this issue by Singapore. So we're very excited to sharing the findings of this seminal report 
on, as he said, a very important topic for all of us, healthy aging, or better still, healthy longevity. My job is to provide the background and the framing of this particular work, how it got started, and who the leadership, particularly John Wong and Linda Freed. And, but before I do that, I know none of you are familiar, not all of you are familiar with the US National Human Medicine, so I would like to just spend a couple of slides introducing ourselves. So we are the preeminent medical academy in the United States. And of course, we like to believe we are playing also such a preeminent role internationally. The National Academy of Medicine is part of three academies in the United States in science, engineering, and medicine. We were founded in 1863 by Abraham Lincoln and Congress as an independent academy to advise the government at the time, particularly during the Civil War, on matters of science that can help make policy. And that's what we have done for the last 160 years. Over the years, because of the specialization of engineering and medicine, we've evolved from National Academy of Science to three academies, Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. And the three academies co-govern the National Academies with the structure as shown here with divisions that perform specialized work and of course now ever more convergence in bringing disciplines together. Now, what the NAM has two important functions. One is that it has members who are highly distinguished. We elect 100 members a year with 10 international, and about 85 of our members are Nobel laureates, and of course, large number, Alaska awardees, National Medal of Science, etc. But we are particularly honored to have three Singaporeans in our membership. Che Chuan Tang, Chen Wong, because uh, Wang Tian Young, and uh, Suresh Subra. And they have, as you can see, what they've done not only for Singapore, but globally and for our academy. I certainly have, over the years, worked closely with Che Chuan Tang and learned so much from him. And of course, now John Wong leading this very important initiative for all of us. Our report is not meant for US but men for global, as you hear later on of the commission. The second thing we do very importantly is actually the policy issue. Generate reports, convene stakeholders and experts to shape the agenda for health and medicine in the United States and globally. I want to give you a series of examples of our previous work. Many of this you probably know but have made major impacts. In 1999, the report on To Air is Human, I think everybody knows this report, was the first to point out that about 90,000 deaths occur because of medical errors. At the time, it was groundbreaking, and certainly I, then a young man, didn't believe in the report. Of course, doctors can do everything. And I think it started the whole movement of patient safety and quality globally. In 1986, when AIDS was felt to be a disease of very small population, we pointed out this is a global crisis and epidemic and set the framework for research and clinical care. And we were the ones that reauthorized PEPFAR, which as you know, is a major fund that supports HIV treatment globally. In 1998, the first report to say we should map the human genome at that time, even geneticists says that can be done. That's too ambitious. We don't know how to interpret. We don't have the technology. And of course, now we can sequence human genome for $500 or less. And in Singapore, precise the precision medicine initiative under the Ministry of Health and others is groundbreaking looking at how to bring precision medicine to health and healthcare, which leads to 20. 11, when we coined the term precision medicine and point out the tremendous potential. We have also led the studies on human genome editing, the ethical and societal implications in 2017 and 20, 
19. And I put this up because Singapore is really discussing population health. I looked back and of course found that we coined the term population health in our 2011 report. In 2013, as you can see there, we said primary care and public health should come together. And it's the future, you can see the small words of population health. And of course, today Singapore is leading, not only in that concept, but implementation of population health. And of course, in the setting of COVID in 2016, we generated report on Ebola. And I remember Cha Chuan, you traveled to Hong Kong when we launched our report. And of course, the Ebola report said many things that uh, was really prescient in terms of what the world needs to do for preparedness. Uh, I don't think we were quite, uh, shall we say, had people taking up seriously. But then, as most recently worked with Senior Minister Tarman, we ran the G20 high-level independent panel and generated this very important report called Pandemic Preparedness and Response Financing, which we're still very much working on to create the funding for this global financing mechanism for preparedness. So, so much for that. Now, why do we take this topic on? This is the first grand challenge that the National Academy of Medicine ever taken. We believe in this issue as an important one because of the data that you can see right here. On the left-hand side is a graph that shows fertility rate. And I guess it's easy to see that the global fertility rate is, continues to drop. On the right upper panel, shows a curve in green of the number of people, a percent of the people in globally who's over six, age 65, and in blue, under age six years old. Now, it's obvious to you, but I think it's important to point out, in 2020, the two graphs cross each other, and you can see we're now on the trajectory of a massive increase in the older population and much fewer in the younger population. The bottom slide shows you what they call population pyramid. Indeed, in 2050, it was a pyramid. You can see the younger population at the bottom as now fewer older, and then the population is distributed in this fashion. But by 2020, you can see this pyramid is taking a different shape. Increasingly, the younger population are entering middle age, if not people like myself, the uh, the, 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 what I call myself, the generations, you know what I'm talking about, I have reached over 65, right? And, uh, and you can see that 2050, as the Deputy Prime Minister said, this will change substantially. Singapore enjoys one longest life expectancy in the world. But I think it will be alarming when you see this slide of where you are in 2012. In fact, increasingly, the younger are actually becoming the uh, middle age. But it's my prediction by 2050, as the Deputy Prime Minister said, you'll have significant, if not 50% of them, over age 65. Now, we all know that, as he has pointed out, that people have looked at this as an alarming concern. Uh, the word silver tsunami was used by him. Sometimes I'm afraid to use that word because it labels the older people in a negative way. Because we do see tremendous opportunity with aging. But importantly, this slide just soon points out that with an aging population with three to four times more non-communicable diseases, frailty, and many others, it puts tremendous strain, as you know, even in Singapore, family structure, relationships, social infrastructure, insurance retirement programs, transportation, housing, chronic conditions, healthcare delivery financing, and of course, workforce. Ultimately, as more and more people retire without the number of younger people replacing the retired. So this poses a very important question. And of course, our report asks the question, what do we need to do and are we ready for this? When I look at the studies, which includes CSIS Global Aging Preparedness Index and the Help Age International Global Age Watch Index, 
of concern is very few countries are really prepared to meet both the needs and seize the opportunity of longer lives. But instead, they're assumed by the concerns about old age dependency ratio. Importantly, many countries that do well on one dimension do poorly on the other. And there are also few countries that score well on the multiple dimensions of aging preparedness. So it's obvious that while some countries' governments have begun to act and started to plan, too many have not. This is really one of the driving forces for us to say, what do we need to do to sound the alarm? And how do we actually mobilize the leadership of different countries to address this issue? In this regard, I think it's a global imperative to prepare the globe much better for, in fact, scientifically, socially, and financially for a longer lifespan. Now, one of the things we've recognized is there are already reports, as you can see up there, existing efforts. So our job is to build on these reports and to be more focused on actions and policies and needs to be take, undertaken to address this. So the NAM Health Longevity Roadmap builds on these reports by recommending effective solutions for promoting healthy longevity across sectors and stakeholder types and prioritizing needs for science, technology, and innovation to transform the field and generate a longevity dividend. You're going to hear from our speakers the great concept of longevity dividend. You already heard from DPM the definition of health longevity. It's physical, social, and mental well-being as you age along the life course, a health span. So we launched this. With that background, we decided this has to be a major grand challenge for us to take on, and of course, a major grand challenge globally. And we launched this event at our annual meeting in October 2019, uh, the, the Global Grand Challenge. Our Grand Challenge has two components. One, as you heard from DPM, is a global competition on your right. This, in fact, has been greatly supported by my good friend Chechuan Tang and MOH and NRF as well uh, to look at how to catalyze breakthrough ideas and to expand the health span by achieving transformative and scalable innovation. And so we actually have done this program now in the third year globally with a great partnership with uh, Singapore to look at to mobilize innovators and young people to be involved with this. Yesterday afternoon, we had a mini scientific symposium that Brian Kennedy, along with Church Fund's office, organized, bring some of the catalyst awardees. In our first round, globally, we had inclusion of over 50 countries and territories, 1,500 applications, which we funded globally, 150. The second round, comparable data, and we're now in our third round. We're looking forward to extending this for another three years or more. The left side is what we hear today, the roadmap for health longevity, because we want to conduct a comprehensive assessment of challenges and opportunities presented by global aging and recommend promising solutions for policymakers, government and non-government organizations, and private sector all of them are here today. And of course, globally want to disseminate this report to improve health productivity and quality of life. Now, so this is the organization of this roadmap. As you can see, we start off with the International Oversight Board who oversees this activity, and I'll say a few words about that. But importantly, we create an international commission. A commission truly that's international, that involves 17 members across six continents and eight different countries. And this commission works on three work streams, social, behavioral, environmental enablers, healthcare and public health, and science and technology. And the last time I was in Singapore was February 2020, in this same room where we launched, in fact, the workshop on healthcare systems. And the next day, or after I got on the plane, you had the lockdown because of COVID. 
And I'm so, back, I'm so pleased to be back here now, two and a half years later, to discuss this important work. And of course, it's important to understand this cross-cutting themes, which is policy and practice, oops, down at the bottom to look at policy and practice, health equity disparities, innovation, financing, and of course, monitoring metrics. Now, the commission is co-chaired by um, John Wong and Linda Fried, are both here. I am grateful to them for their leadership. I said to DPM earlier that coming to Singapore to me was preordained and also pre-planned. Because of what you've done, so much in this area, as you heard from his speech, and my great admiration for this country. And of course, being the hub of Asia, being able to bring people together to look at this report. Pre-planned because I know John Wong and of course, you know, your ministry and, and, and your NHS and are really great organizers to help us move this forward. I won't have time to go through this. Suffice to say, the expertise cover um, ger geriatrics, social determinants of health, behavioral science, build environment, business workforce, economics, healthcare delivery, financing, basic science technology, and health and finance policy, among others. So it's very carefully chosen to present a global and uh, expertise. The oversight board, which is co-chaired by Keizo Takemi, my good friend from Japan, the parliamentarian from Japan, and John Jenkins, the CEO of ARP, has members such as Marin Zhao and Che Chuan Tan. So they have done a great job by overseeing this work, making sure giving strategic guidance, global relevance, and of course today, dissemination of this report. So I want to end by saying, what do we ask this group to do? So the statement of task says, we must strengthen communities and enrich the lives of older people. So the commission will, assess the challenges presented by global aging, and demonstrate how these challenges can be translated into opportunities in society globally. Second, to explore and recommend approaches to enhancing structures, systems, and environment. Third, identify and analyze potential approaches and reforms across the entire spectrum of institutions and systems. Fourth, avenues for innovative age-related research, and finally to coordinate with other global initiatives to achieve an integrated synergistic effort. I think you'll be very pleased with the breadth and the depth of this report. Now, I won't have time to talk about anything about the report because you're going to hear the presenters. Suffice to say, we're now, this is the first summit in launching this, and we came to Singapore. We plan one in DC in November, where we'll bring together also the major leaders in the United States and North America. And of course, working along besides dissemination's meeting with leadership, such as DPM, the Minister of Health, Mr. Ong I've met with, and others, to discuss, and also internationally, to discuss the implementation of the report. And of course, the idea of being able to help community level discussions inspired by Marianne Zhao's approach of meeting the box and tools to allow communities to in fact implement plans for health longevity. And we're so glad that the press is here today with publication op-eds. We want really this to be widely known. I'm certainly not gonna to touch on this because you're gonna hear about this, but this is just to set the stage there are many important recommendations. But I think importantly is the next slide, which is the cost of inaction. Just like the report about Ebola, we have seen now the cost of inaction substantial across the globe, both in terms of human lives and economy and society. I think the cost of inaction in this field will result in more people living with poor health suffering and dependence. A GDP that is lower than it would be with better health and full inclusion of old people, an increased fiscal burden on 
the government and society, increased burden on individuals and families, loss of contribution of older people to well-being in society, and of course, loss of opportunities for people of all ages. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm so honored to be here with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comprehensive introduction, Dr. Zhao. Now, we have Professor Linda Fried, the co-chair of the International Commission of the Global Roadmap for Healthy Longevity, to share on Vision 2050. Professor Fried is the Dean and Alama Professor at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health and Director Robert N. Butler, Columbia Aging Center. May I invite Professor Preet, please? Okay. I'm sorry, this is what is it? Okay, thank you. So can you put the full... Can you put the first slide up? Yeah. All right, thank you. Well, good morning. I am deeply honored and thrilled to be here with you this morning to join uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Dr. Zhao in welcoming you to the launch of the National Academy of Medicine Global Roadmap for Healthy Longevity with the hope that all of you will be our partners in really the implementation of this call to action and the recommendations for how we transform to the opportunities of a world of longer lives. I'm, I'm here uh, to represent the vision uh, in this first segment of the roadmap. And, um, and I'll start by just recognizing first the immense accomplishment of our societies over the last 50 and 100 years that we have actually, for the first time in human history, lengthened intentionally through societal investments in human capital, lengthened human life expectancy. 30 to 40, even verging on 50 years of longer lives unprecedented accomplishment in human history. The question that comes after recognizing that this is actually a success of human and societal investment is to ask what this could mean. And I think the challenge from the National Academy of Medicine from Dr. Zhao was to focus on what it would mean if these long lives could be lived with health or if the costs of inaction lead us to having longer lives without health. And what would the implications for individuals be? What would the implications for society be? And this perhaps is the grand challenge of this second century of longevity. Now that we've accomplished longevity, is to say what we make of it. Now, I think a very exciting part of the roadmap report is the recognition that scientific, really, breakthroughs of the last several decades have led us to understand what we didn't know before, which is that it is possible to live a long life with health. We could describe that as a longer lifespan uh, involving a longer health span so that people are living with health to approximately as long as the length of their lives. 20, 30, 40 years ago, there was not evidence that this was possible. Now we know that in the face of the conditions that amplify health at every age and stage of life, people accumulate the opportunities of health into longer lives, that if people arrive at old age healthy, they're tracked to stay healthy, and that we actually as a society can invest in the conditions 
that would enable the accomplishment of a health span approximately equal to our lifespan. The fact that prevention works and matters at every age and stage of life, we, couldn't, we can say now, but couldn't have said a half a century ago. And now the question is, what will we do with it? Perhaps the first question, even before deciding to do something, is to say, is it valuable to have longer lives with health? <laughs> Does it matter? Who would it matter to? Um, certainly, and, and I tried on the behalf of the commission to offer a few responses to that, uh, a question that we delve deeply into. The first thing, of course, is that many would consider it a gift to have the opportunity to live out what looks to be the full human lifespan and to experience the different ages and stages of our lives. And of course, we're already seeing that um, with longer lives, there are many generations in a family alive at the same time. Uh, what's been called a beanpole family is becoming the norm. Um, and the opportunities for intergenerational supports um, comes, as you would say, very close to home. But there are also other things that scientific work of the last several decades reveals and offers us a wider lens than we previously had on what the opportunities for individuals and society might be as they live longer. Because in fact, as we get older, we accrue what we would call intrinsic assets uh, in our, by our 60s and 70s and 80s that really were not available to us when we were 20 and 30. What are some of those intrinsic assets? Well. Of course, the abilities and skills and expertise of a lifetime of accomplishment. Um, these are both objective expertise and the subject experience of what it takes to live a life. In addition, there is early evidence that as people get older uh, with this vast experience, they accrue new kinds of higher problem-solving skills, cognitive abilities that they don't have when they're young people, abilities to recognize complex problems, to decide based on values which ones really matter for the future to be solved, and the skills to break those complex problems down into their integral building blocks in order and then to solve them. As people get older, the, socio-emotionally, maturation and development actually leads to a number of assets uh, for the individual and for society, prioritizing what matters most to the individual and for those around them, what will bring the most meaning for the rest of their lives, which they realize are limited, and um, how to actually value and amplify connection that brings meaning and purpose and supports a better future for people one loves. And finally, very clearly, even in the last few years, scientific research has demonstrated that older adults, uh, over the course of adult development, uh, acquire pro-social goals that are quite dominant, a desire to assist people around them and to assist the future of the next generations. In addition, um, these capabilities are amplified, uh, perhaps associated with the, the problem-solving capabilities that I talked to you about, with um, advanced skills compared to younger people in conflict resolution, um, and, a, and a commitment to really looking at the long term of what will matter for future generations, showing up when, when a path is possible and seen to contribute to that long-term future for the generations that succeed us, coupled with something we have never had before at scale, which is a sense of urgency that we better get it done. I'm not going to be around forever. <laughs> All of this adds up uh, in part and in sum to what many over millennia have called the wisdom of getting older, 
And in fact, there is a burgeoning science to try and understand what wisdom really is and to um, be able to even suggest that we could train people, all of us, to be wiser. And finally, the other attribute as people get older is how goals change. And in fact, um, as people get older, the drive both for personal meaning, to figure out what, one li what one's life meant, whether one is leaving a world better because you were on it, better than you found it, um, these pro-social goals, generative goals to invest in future generations and to leave a legacy that will live beyond you. These are assets that we could think about when we consider that for the first time in human history, a quarter to a fifth of the human population will have these. But we have not yet learned how to make use of them. So what are the implications? Well. Often, when we talk about aging and not longevity, there is a tendency to segregate what is going on for those older from uh, whether or not this will benefit those younger. But in fact, just thinking about these attributes of older age, uh, for young people, has the opportunity to create optimism about what a long life might mean. And in fact, um, as Dr. Zhao already mentioned, the opportunities if we design a world, a society, a nation, a city that will utilize and enable and deploy these assets in powerful ways, appreciating the scale that it offers of positive and altruistic capabilities, that in fact, it opens up opportunities for people of all ages that pre previously um, have not been experienced. So both the societal import of the assets of older age and their presence at a scale never before seen are critical opportunities for all of us for the future. Now, one of Dr. Zhao mentioned um, that many policymakers are subsumed by a focus on the old age dependency ratio, an assumption that we have declining productive uh, population and increasing um, dependence, dependent populations. But in fact, the data do not support that. And the evidence has consistently debunked the myths that many of our policies of the last hundred years were built on. Uh, we now that know that, of course, getting older is not just about needing things. It's not just about the potential for dependency, but older adults, as I just said, bring assets of immense, real, and also of great potential value if we enable them. We also know that despite our fears, generations do not need to be in competition and that generations need each other. Um, and that healthy longevity, if really implemented, could benefit young people and strengthen all of society. We know, as Dr. Zell mentioned, that intergenerational teams, for example, in the workforce are more innovative and, in fact, more productive. We know through countless examples that cities designed for old, to benefit older people are designed better for people of all ages. And that example pertains as well to healthcare and, uh, and probably all other dimensions of our lives. And finally, we have learned that the, a population of older people are an age group deeply committed to the future, deeply committed to the future of subsequent generations, and could in fact be conceived of, contrary perhaps to public opinion, as the pay it forward stage of life. So, Dr. Zhao and the Deputy Prime Minister have mentioned the definition that we have arrived at for what healthy longevity is and what it could mean. The state in which years in good health approach the biological lifespan with physical, cognitive, and social functioning, enabling well-being across generations. This foundation of preserving health for all has to be carried out across the life course by life course investments, 
but accrues into the potential for health span in older age, um, which can be the foundation of unleashing the opportunities. Now, what are the implications? Well, we would like, through the course of today, to really lay them out and explore them with you. But they start, of course, by the observation that if we increase the health span and accomplish healthy longevity, that societies can minimize individual and societal burdens of unhealthy longevity. And then we have the opportunity, if people are healthy, as individuals, as families, as societies, to benefit from the continued engagement of older of old adults into the oldest ages in their communities, their families, and, uh, and what makes a productive society. We can unleash the potential of older people in the near and long terms through the combination of healthy longevity and enabling productive engagement to utilize these untapped assets of older age. And through that, design it to benefit people of all ages uh, and to underpin the potential for societies of longer lives to be truly thriving societies in a world of optimism about what it means to have a long life. The result could be, as Dr. Zhao said, a longevity dividend for individuals and society. To attempt to portray what this could mean, the commission decided to adopt what is called a future back vision approach. Because of what Dr. Zhao said, that most countries, if not all countries, are not fully ready to create or benefit from healthy longevity, we don't really have models of what this will fully look like. Nor do we believe that it's just a matter of tweaking everything that's already in place to make it slightly more aging friendly. In fact, in many circumstances, a real transformative vision is needed to create a world for longer lives for the second half of our lives that we never had before. And so to make a leap into a world we never had, it's important to take the evidence and say, what does the evidence suggest this could look like if we did it? And so, in fact, um, we sought in to roll out the roadmap for all of us with a vision of what the evidence says this could look like if we built a, a vision in, by 2050 of a society that successfully utilized the evidence of how healthy longevity could create a positive future for all of us. I offer you two visions, one for each of us as individuals of what our lives might look like in 2050, and one next for us as a society of what society could look like if we accomplish this. And I urge you to read the roadmap report, which, which lays this out in greater detail. But in brief, for individuals, all people, between now and 2050, we could make the investment so that all people are enabled to have long lives with health and function into the oldest ages and have agency in their own part of how they create their health. That we have a society in which we meet the aging associated needs well. So to enable people living long lives to do so with dignity. And at the same time that people with health in older ages have full opportunity to engage in meaningful and productive activities that matter to them, that meet their goals, whether they're working for pay and, or bringing their social capital to contribute to societal and intergenerational well-being and cohesion and leave a better future for all. With these approaches, what we will find in 2050 is that loneliness and isolation are not the default experiences of aging. And that young adults have greater intergenerational support and more job opportunities, not less. And finally, that the life course experience at all ages, no matter what age, is of recognition of the value that you bring to your community, to your family, and to your society. For societies, these investments could roll up uh, to the economists in the room 
to a long health span, decreased health disparities, and unprecedented assets for nations and societies. Where the intrinsic assets that I talked about and goals of older people are valued and enabled, with all of society benefits from their contributions in terms of monetary and non-monetary roles. Younger people more successful, more jobs, less disaffection, enlarged workforce, stronger economy, increased ability to invest further in human capital, human potential, as well as public goods. Enhanced social capital with increased pro-social goals shared across society and, and invested in. And the realization that with older people thriving, all people and economies thrive. And finally, equity, intergenerational cohesion, and decreased precarity exist within and between countries. So what would this possible future of culturally appropriate, thriving societies of long lives look like? A lifetime of good health, learning and growth, enhanced human social and financial capital, basic protections for thriving are met for human beings through social determinants of health across the life course. That we are able to value the complementarity of contributions by different ages and benefit from the assets and goals of maturity. That we are, have invested in bringing people together in ways that create diverse and intergenerational relationships and cohesion within our societies, and people are, have the opportunity at all ages for productive and rewarding work. And finally, that societal roles have been created that enable people of all ages to be invested in their society, to be able to contribute, to live with meaning, purpose, and impact, to meet societal needs and create a better future. That sounds like utopia. Uh, what we would like to do is say that the evidence suggests the possibilities here uh, and that the assets and capabilities of people of older age in longer lives could be the key to unlocking this future. What will be required is an all of society transformation in an incremental way to a society for longer lives that's good for all ages. System changes will be essential, led by government. All sectors must, must understand what we're going for together and how we can align and implement together the, the areas that we can affect within each sector in order to accomplish healthy longevity some of the change will be incremental, some will be transformational, and, but we will do it to recognize that societies are complex systems. Um, Dr. I will introduce Dr. Wong in just a moment who will talk to you about what that will mean in terms of accomplishing these aspirational goals. But we recognize that to have healthy longevity at the top with individual and societal well-being and the ability of older people to be contributing in ways that matter to them and create well-being for society, we need to imagine uh, expanded ways to invest in human social and financial capital and how to transform the enablers of healthy longevity on the bottom right in terms of work uh, and, and volunteer roles, our social infrastructure, our physical environment, and our health systems. So I'd like to conclude by saying that Vision 2050, at a time when many countries will have more than 20% of their population being over 65, is an opportunity to transform to thriving societies of longer lives with the opportunities recognized, built, and harnessed, and needs met, where all ages benefit, all of society, and all sectors are aligned with the shared vision of what we could be, and the opportunity to build a longevity uh, dividend for all in society. Thank you so much, and it's my honor now to um, invite 
my co-chair for the National Academy Global Commission, uh, Dr. John Wan, up to share the podium. John. Uh, DPM Heng Sui Kat. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, we're indebted to you for, uh, for being here and actually sharing um, the deep thought um, that um, you and your cabinet colleagues have been giving to such a profound um, uh, issue that will shape Singapore and is going to affect the whole world. Like climate change, Demographic change is the other big change that humankind has never experienced before, where there are going to be more people over 60 than under five. But again, we're very indebted uh, to Professor Victor Zhao and the US National Academy of Medicine for inviting Singapore to be part of this effort um, because uh, you know, NAM has such incredible convening power and to convene 19 commissioners uh, over six continents, the north, south, the east, and west, all addressing, um, all addressing uh, uh, this very profound issue is enormous. And of course, uh, you know, to my fellow commissioners and to uh, uh, Professor Linda Freed, uh, you know, certainly uh, I have learned a lot and I think this will greatly benefit Singapore. Our international oversight board with uh, Professor Tan Chuk Chuan and Dr. Mary Ann Zhao uh, have really been critical. And Mary Ann has been involved in this uh, since 2002 as uh, one of the major shapers of the Madrid Declaration. So uh, we do have people who have been thinking about this for a very long time. Now, Professor Fried talked about a vision in 2050. Um, 2050 may seem like a long time away, that's 28 years time. But when I look back what happened 28 years ago for myself, that's when I saw Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> and that's when I saw Les Miserables. Um, and I clearly remember that. So I posit that actually 30 years is not a long time. And in 2050, every continent in the world except Africa will be a super-aged society. Every continent in the world except Africa will be a super-aged society. And so what do we want our future to be? A future where we are pessimistic or a future where we unlock the unprecedented potential of yet a third demographic dividend? So I'd like to spend the next few minutes uh, uh, describing uh, um, what the Commission uh, um, uh, has been debating. But I, at this point, I would like to acknowledge one person who could not see the release of this report, and that's Dr. Tachi Yamada. Uh, Dr. Yamada, uh, a good friend of Singapore, um, was actually part of the planning group uh, which convened uh, these discussions, I believe, in 2018. Um, and uh, he chaired the third workshop that we had on science and technology before his untimely passing. So why is it so difficult? Why is it so difficult to address uh, this issue of uh, uh, health throughout our lifespan? And it's largely because health is really a, a, a complex system. Uh, poor health is an outcome of a multitude of interdependent elements within this whole framework of our lifespan. Uh, social determinants are determinants across our entire life course, and these determinants interact with each other, both in profound and subtle ways, and I'll show you some examples. And we need a broad spectrum of methods to address this. We, we need to design programs, implement and evaluate this with a complex systems viewpoint. And for those involved in complex systems, this diagram is not, again, I, not meant to read it in detail, but this is from the World Economic Forum, just to show how complex 
the issues are in health. And let us take the example of obesity. Obesity demonstrates the principle of emergence, where a problem is more than just the sum of its parts. And so issues of urban design, quality and type of food, the person's socioeconomic status, whether they're employed and what type of work they do, what, what the availability of public transport, uh, the climate, air pollution, physical safety, are just some of the factors that, implement, that impact obesity. Let me just highlight one example, which came from our first workshop. And this was a slide shared by Sir Michael Marmot, who has been really uh, one of the champions of social determinants of health. And this is showing UK data. And in the UK, if someone wants to eat a healthy diet, according to UK Living Well guidelines, if that person is in the top decile of the socioeconomic bracket, they spend about 6% of their income on eating a healthy diet. But if someone was so unfortunate to be in the bottom decile of society, they can spend up to 74% of their income trying to eat a healthy diet. And so this is just one, but one example of why we need to approach health from a complex systems viewpoint. You know, the remarkable impact of smoking bans in public, in public including restaurants, led to reduce visibility and convenience of smoking. And because there were less people smoking, it wasn't considered to be cool. And fewer young people started smoking, and then it created a positive feedback loop. So that's an example of how uh, feedback can really reinforce or balance further changes. On the other hand, there's a concept known as adaptation, where adjustments in behavior of, in this case, companies. So smoking ban in public, this leads companies to lower prices of cigarettes and to develop new products, such as electronic cigarettes. And what happens is we may not see the decrease, and there may even be a possible increase in the number of smokers. And then there's the issue of dependencies, where the outcome of one individual is affected by the outcome by many other individuals. For instance, if parents are unemployed or poorly educated or socially marginalized, there's a higher chance that parents are going to have poor mental and physical health. And this has profound impacts on their children, who are more likely to face levels of uh, increased physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, mental and physical health issues. And they themselves, that next generation, is challenged to achieve their full potential, and the cycle continues. So the commission looked at four domains. Um, the first domain is the longevity dividend itself, looking at work and retirement, volunteering, and lifelong education and retraining. The social infrastructure, looking at the pro-social strengths of older people, ageism, which is one of the most profound discriminations, ironically against our future self. It's the only bias that someone has against their own self in the future. It's very unusual. Issues of social inclusion, financial security in retirement, which is a huge issue, and digital literacy, which again, I mean, when I buy a new piece of technology, it's my children who help me set it up. And then the whole impact of the physical environment, from housing, public spaces and infrastructure, safety, public transportation, broadband access, and very importantly now, the effects of climate change. And then the health systems. We're faced with increasing burden of chronic conditions. Uh, the issue of public health, the report revealed the important statistic that um, the percentage of the na total national health care expenditure in preventive health in OECD countries is approximately 2.4%. 2.4% of the entire national healthcare expenditure is on prevention in OECD countries. Canada leads the effort at about 5.9%. But one can really see that we need to see how do we realize those resources required to address the problem. 
issues of long-term care, issues of healthcare delivery, issues of the healthcare workforce. The healthcare workforce are also aging. And then the opportunities from geoscience, technology, and big data innovation. So let me just use one example, and I'll just call out work and retirement. The impact of work and retirement is profound. It impacts nearly every aspect of the domains that we have covered. So I would like to conclude by saying that healthy longevity, or the lack thereof, is the result of an interaction of complex systems. And that's why it's so challenging. It's so challenging because multiple systems within society need to be activated, transformed, and coordinated. And that innovation in any one sector by itself, unfortunately, will not lead to a transformation achieving healthy longevity. So we need to review how we live, learn, work, and play. And as DPM Heng mentioned, this is our order of society approach. So I'm delighted to see in the audience, both physically and virtually, we have people from the public sectors, the private sectors, the social sectors, and we have citizens from at least 12 countries. Um, and very importantly, we have the media here, because we need to get together and say, how do we want to unleash the opportunities which are currently still latent if we all want to have a thriving and robust society in 30 years' time? There are several actors required, uh, um, uh, individuals, governments, non-governmental organizations, employers, trade unions, professional societies, the academic research community, and local and community organizations. Everyone has to be involved in this effort. And this, again, is the key diagram that Linda showed. Um, at the heart of this is the social compact. And Singapore has a strong social compact. It's one of the few countries in the world which puts its social compact on the web. Um, and Singapore wants to revisit the social compact and see how can we strengthen it with equity and social cohesion at the heart of the social compact. And if we invest in the enablers, if we invest in work, the social infrastructure, the physical environment, and health systems, we can lead to increased health across the lifespan. And once we increase health across the lifespan, we can unlock capital. We can unlock human capital, the capital of people between 60 and 90 to 100. That's an enormous amount of capital. We can unlock social capital. And when we unlock human and social capital, we will unlock economic capital. And that will create the virtuous cycle. But we have got big disruptors that we need to acknowledge and plan how we want to address. So the Commission has laid out a set of recommendations for the next five years. And we really urge every society to look at these recommendations and say, how can this help their own society? Because we believe that the time for action is now. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm so, we're so delighted to see so many of you here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wong. I know we have uh, just gotten started, but let us now take a short break. We will resume with session one in about 15 minutes' time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Just a gentle reminder, we have a few housekeeping notes to make before we resume our program. Kindly switch off your mobile devices or put it on to silent mode. Please take note that food and drinks are not allowed in the auditorium. Do remember to wear your masks in the auditorium. Speakers can remove their masks on stage. Thank you for your kind cooperation and, and attention.
The International Commission of the Global Roadmap for Healthy Longevity envisioned a future of healthy longevity in 2050. In identifying targets and recommendations within the domains, the Commission focused on actionability, impact on people across the life course, equity, and importance to improving healthy longevity in the long term, and tackling needs of older people in the near term. Principles for healthy longevity were established to spotlight critical aspects of healthy longevity that are relevant across all countries. Today, the commissioners will present on the following domains. The presentations will be followed by a Q&A session. The first presentation is on social infrastructure. Let us now invite Professor John Piggott, Director of the Australian Research Council's Centre of Excellence in Population Aging Research at the University of New South Wales. Professor John Piggott, please. Thank you very much. Um, it is a great honor uh, to be able to address this very distinguished group and to guide you through the Commission's deliberations on the domain of social infrastructure and how it interacts with healthy longevity. It's a very complicated area right, social infrastructure, and the interaction between social infrastructure and healthy longevity is, if anything, even more complicated. The Commission came up with a number of findings, and I'd just like you, i just like to um, list those because I haven't got them on the slides, and then we'll work through the slides. So, first of all, the Commission acknowledged that healthy longevity was very much influenced by events all the way through the life course. So early life experiences could impact healthy longevity. And uh, we acknowledge that, but the major focus of the uh, commission was on the second half of life. We were, as Linda mentioned earlier, we were, we were persuaded that older people, right, became very pro-social. They were, had increased motivation to use their accumulated wisdom and experience to help society, to help the younger generation, to help those around them. And that was something that we treated as a finding and something that translated, as you will see in a minute, to a target. We saw ageism as an extremely important barrier and very pervasive across many countries. But we thought that in some countries, positive expectations, you could develop a culture of positive expectations, which would ameliorate that and that that would empower the older generation. And then there was a set of recommendations around intergenerational sharing and social cohesion. Um, loneliness was thought to be less pervasive amongst older people than amongst younger people, except for the very old. So it increased again after age 80 and intergenerational programs, co-residency programs, they were seen as ways in which we might bring society together in the way that Linda in particular outlined earlier on. And then there were a set of recommendations around financial security, access, I'm sorry, a set of findings around financial security and its importance for dignity in later life. And finally, we identified the digital divide, digital literacy, and perhaps um, the possibility of education and training amongst older people, right, to equalize digital literacy, to increase digital literacy, so that that would be less of a barrier to um, this is a barrier to uh, um, um, interaction with society generally. Next slide, please. So that led us to a series of targets, and you see those key targets there uh, correspond to the findings which I've outlined. And I've marked in red financial security, because as well as taking you 
to the general deliberations, I have a few slides just focused on Asia, since this is an Asian launch. Um, and I want to focus, there's no time to do everything, I want to focus specifically on financial security. And the reason for that is that I think there are many people in emerging Asia in particular, who face very severe financial constraints once their earnings capacity has been exhausted. We ended up with just a couple of goals, uh, social cohesion, and that's built around the whole question of pro-social strength and social inclusion and so forth, and then social protection and financial security. Next slide, please. So we also identified, this is just a, a four example list, supporting structures. So these are ways in which one might implement some of these goals derive. So laws and policies, clearly public inform information campaigns, mechanisms for getting multi-generational links together through community, pensions and social security systems. Um, and uh, also there was a concern that people should become more self-reliant. Uh, so programs promoting individual savings and institutional arrangements, which would protect those savings. So they were the supporting structures that are listed there. there are, obviously, one could come up with more uh, housing and so forth, but these are the ones that we have for the moment. So now what I'd like to do is to turn to the situation as I see it in emerging Asia particularly, but in Asia more generally as well. Next slide, please. So this is information from um, uh, ILO on the share of informal employment in total employment. Many countries in Asia, right, the number of people or the proportion of people in total employment who are in the informal sector is very large. And that means that one has to think somewhat differently about social policies to support those people as we move forward and as we think about what's necessary to um, buttress and to underpin healthy longevity. And these large proportions are remarkably stubborn. So I was doing some work on Indonesia over the past period. Next slide, please. And Indonesia is fortunate in having a, a panel survey, which goes back to the same people every so many years. And so we're able to track people from 2007 to 2014. So if we identified people in Indonesia who are working in the informal sector in 2007, we took two groups, those in their early 40s and those in their early 50s. What were they doing in 2014? Well, only 7% of the 40 year olds were in the formal sector. Only 3% of the 50 year olds had moved to the formal sector. Most stayed in the informal sector. And some, of course, had moved out of work altogether and were not working. Next slide. If you did this the other way around and you started with Indonesians working in the formal sector in 2007, then you found young people in the formal sector. Next slide. Young people in the formal sector. Next, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, stayed in the formal sector. But if you are older, if you're in your 50s, it was likely that in that seven year period, you would move into the informal sector. So 58% um, of those working in the formal sector in 2007 were working in the informal sector by, 24, uh, by, by 2014. It shows how um, uh, central the informal sector is in many of these emerging economies. Next slide, please. Now, in response to that, a natural response is a social pension, because if you're in the informal sector, you can't really have contributions that mean very much. Contributions are hard to collect in the informal sector, and um, records are difficult. Even identification can be difficult. But when you look at the social pensions, many of these countries, or at least some of these countries, have social pensions. Indonesia doesn't, really. But most of them have something, but they're extremely low. So if you look at the 
percentage of GDP per capita, 5% is the kind of number that you look at. You can see those countries along that bottom section there, which is, is a very low percentage of GDP as a social pension, well below the poverty line in most of these countries. And, and then as well as that, the coverage is not great. So we look at the social pensioners over the population of 65 plus. Many of these countries, it's less than 30%. Some countries have much better coverage like Thailand, but you can see with Thailand, for example, the level of the benefit is extremely low. It's not particularly meaningful. And so one has to do something about making those social pensions so that they actually help. Um, next slide, please. So we did some calculations about what it might cost. And I know this is a very busy slide, but if you take the right-hand column of this slide and then the second last entry, 2.17%, what that represents is how much it would cost as a percentage of GDP in China. This is calculations for China and they're old calculations. This was done around 2015, 2.17% of GDP. If you are going to give 15% of GDP per capita to the poorest 50% of the elderly, where you define the elderly as people over the age of 65. So that's not an impossible fiscal ask. It would be entirely possible to get that generous. And yet the number is more like 6%. 15%. Next slide, please. So it's important to realize that social pensions come not just with the financial benefit to the older person, him or herself, but also with non-monetary benefits to that older person and with benefits to the family. The social determinants of health, it's easier to gain health access if you have some financial security. But as well as that, it will reduce inequality because in emerging Asia, as opposed to the developed world, inequality amongst older people is very high. So in the developed world, it's actually younger people, single parents and so forth, where you get the greatest inequality. But in emerging Asia, it's, it's more likely to be older cohorts that are very unequal. And so by introducing a, a meaningful social pension, you can reduce inequality. And then if there is co-residency, the fact that older people get an income means that, for example, um, child education right, can be increased. Grandchildren can get a better education. It was found in South Africa that young prime age males were more able to move around and get better employment because of the means-tested age pension, which exists there. And this also has the effect of increasing the social status and the inclusion of older people. So it serves those targets and goals with which we began. So social pensions become a quite important piece of the puzzle. And they're particularly important, I think, in emerging Asia. Next slide, please. So we did come up with three recommendations. And once again, they're in two groups. The first one really focuses on um, ageism and, and it's, it's, how can I put it? It's, it's counterpoint, which is social cohesion. And then the second and third are around social security and social protection. And in particular, the one in red there is that in the next five years, we recommended that all governments should develop plans for ensuring basic financial security for older people. So I think in 10 minutes, that's all I can do. Um, I commend the report as a whole to you. It's a great chapter to read. Now I should pass uh, the podium back to the uh, MC. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Piggott. Next, we have Professor Zhong Yuli Wong to present on physical environment. Professor Wong is the Isabel Chan Professor in Medical Sciences and Senior Vice President for Health Innovation and Translation at the National University of Singapore, as well as Senior Advisor at the National University Health System. Professor Wong, please. 
Thank you, Usha. Um, so in the next uh, 15 minutes, uh, 10 minutes, I'd like to uh, basically cover the uh, section on the physical environment and its impact on healthy longevity. So this is a complex slide, but it just goes to show, and you can get the actual diagram from the report, but the impact on people, um, besides age, sex, and hereditary factors, the physical environment impacts their work-life balance, um, their, uh, their, network, their social networks, uh, the local economy, uh, their activities in terms of living, playing, and learning, um, the built environment in terms of streets and routes, uh, again, allows them access to everything from work to social engagements, the natural environment, and then the whole global ecosystem. What is the impact of all of this in terms of actual health and longevity? Well, WHO estimates that up to one quarter of death and disease can be linked to environmental hazards. So the Commission has identified the following key targets, uh, uh, housing, public spaces and infrastructure, safety, transportation, and especially public transportation, digital technologies and broadband access, and then climate change and environmental hazards. And we propose that we should really strive to meet these goals by 2050 to develop environments and infrastructure that support functioning to allow people to remain independent and engaged across all ages, especially at an older age. So how can we go about this? So these are the supporting structures that are being proposed. Very importantly, we must include older people in the design of the built environment. You know, having uh, a very well-meaning, uh, but generally younger uh, people involved in planning, they may not understand the issues faced by older populations. Secondly, we need to make sure that public spaces enable and generate social cohesion and intergenerational activity, and very importantly, encouraging physical activity. Third, we need to make sure that we always look at the issue of access um, because we may assume that food sources are uh, accessible, but for people with mobility issues, access becomes a very critical issue to food, transportation, social services, and very importantly, meeting with other people. We need to develop programs to mitigate climate change. We know climate change is here to stay. How can we mitigate it? Because older people tend to bear the brunt of extremes of temperature, extremes of weather, and reducing air pollution, which is so critical. So the recommendations are at multiple levels. At the city level, we need to look at how can we address strategies to, uh, to address climate change, air pollution, flooding, hurricanes, typhoons. At the neighborhood level, how do we develop uh, uh, how can we enable the, the environment to allow uh, intergenerational connection as, as well as cohesion? At the home level, how can we make sure that the home is safe? Uh, as well as how can we ensure that affordable housing is, 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 is affordable and accessible to allow people to remain independent as well as connected? And the importance of broadband access. If COVID has taught us anything, is that without good broadband access and knowing how to use it, it's very hard to do everything from purchasing food to, uh, to engaging other people, learning opportunities, and so on. And the importance of public transportation. This is a critical platform for people to get to work, to shop, uh, to meet other people, and looking at, very importantly, last mile and first mile issues. You can have a great public transport system, but if a person can't access it, and if a person can't get to their date destination when they get off it, we, ha we have not served its ultimate need. So the key targets in housing, universal design. Uh, there are basic principles of universal design, and uh, it's uh, quite alarming that uh, that is not standard in terms of uh, uh, built housing, that all homes have universal design, and these Five steps are quite basic. Um, availability and affordability of housing, health and safety of housing, 
and then access. The return on investment, well, this is just one paper that the Commission found in 2017, that if you have good housing and support, you can reduce emergency room visits. For every, so for every uh, uh, dollar that is spent, uh, the, the return is $1.57. In terms of public spaces and infrastructure, to have green space, walkability, safety, physical safety, and leveraging opportunities for community design. And the return on investment, well, in Africa, in Gambia, it showed that community gardens, which were accessible to older adults, uh, led to basically uh, job creation. It empowered women and youth, provided greater food security and nutrition, and health for all involved. Canada looked at 8,777 neighborhoods, and those which were designed for higher walkability had a lower prevalence of diabetes and obesity. In terms of, public, in terms of transportation, and I emphasize again, it's public transportation, uh, um, driving, uh, how do we look at issues of driving as, as uh, populations age and drivers become older? Uh, and this whole issue of can we use technology in terms of autonomous vehicles? The return on investment, um, if we look at, uh, um, if there's limited public transport, it definitely impacts the health, especially in the lower socioeconomic groups. And the UK did a very interesting study of people aged 40 to 69, where they used uh, their own transportation, then they stopped, and then they used public transportation. And when they used public transportation, there was a decrease in body mass index when they used public transportation. So again, how you can nudge people to adopt a healthier lifestyle. In terms of digital technologies, we know how important broadband access, and yet only 15, 15% of the world's population have access to broadband. Um, information and communications technology, where well, we know the concerns about cybersecurity, uh, for older populations, the issue about financial scams. Um, and we need to see how we can have older people, if they are involved in co-design of technology, know how to learn and use digital technology. And the return on investment, um, just doubling broadband speed can increase GDP by 0.3%. And then climate change. But well, we know that extreme weather events, uh, uh, again, particularly hard on older populations, air pollution affects everyone from, from the time you're born until the time you pass away. And again, return on investment. Well, in Frankfurt, they showed that if you have green rooftops, you can actually reduce the temperature of the rooftop by up to 40 degrees centigrade. That's enormous. And the number of lives lost just in the United States from air pollution. So these are just some of the factors in which the physical environment plays such an important role in healthy longevity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wong. For the third domain on public health, health systems, and the long-term care, let us invite Professor John Beard from the Australian Research Council's Centre for Excellence in Population Aging Research at the University of New South Wales, and Professor Hiroki Nakatani from Keio University, who is joining us online. Thank you very much. Um, as Victor, I think, mentioned this morning, it was two years ago that uh, the Commission convened a workshop here in this very auditorium of experts from around the world to consider what we need to be doing in, in, in these areas. Um, and uh, the findings were, were actually quite stark. The yeah, here we go. Uh, the first and most important thing to realize is that just as the world is undergoing a, a very rapid demographic transition to older populations, we've also experienced an epidemiologic transition from acute conditions to chronic conditions being the issues that dominate the health and well-being of older people. Uh, and that has a number of very serious implications. The first is that most of those conditions, there, there are things which we can do to prevent them or to ameliorate their consequences. Uh, and so we need to be emphasising public health much more. Uh, the second is that 
there is a very inequitable spread of health in older age and of these chronic conditions. Um, the people with the poorest health in older age are often those with, who have experienced the consequences of a lifetime of uh, inequity, of uh, financial insecurity. And we need to make sure that the, the strategies we put in place don't just reinforce the inequities that those people have uh, experienced. And the third consequence of this shift to chronic conditions is that our health systems are really poorly designed for the issues that confront older people today. Our health systems largely developed in response to acute conditions and injuries. They're, they're designed to identify a problem and to cure it and to say goodbye to the patient. But in fact, for older people who are experiencing chronic conditions and, and the majority of people over the age of 65 actually are experiencing more than one condition at the same time, these people need chronic care of quite complex issues. Uh, and that requires a very different type of system. Uh, and so the, um, the uh, key targets which we identified in, uh, in this chapter uh, look at each of those three domains and try to suggest a transformative, not just an incremental change, because that is what's uh, fundamentally required. So the goals which we identified for 2050, are, um, sorry, and I'm having trouble reading it here, uh, integrated public health, social services, person-centred health care and long-term <laughs> this change and long-term uh, care systems designed to extend years of good health and support the diverse needs of older people and quality long-term care systems to ensure that people uh, receive the care they require in the setting that they desire for a life of not just meaning but of dignity. Um, and I think the second issue of long-term care is also a critical one which we need to think about, particularly in this region. Often when we talk about long-term care, people think about institutions. We're talking about providing the care that people who have experienced significant losses of capacity require, and that might be in their home, it might be provided by their families, it might be provided by their communities, and sometimes it might be provided in institutions. So we're talking about a, a, a vast continuity of care, and I think we need to think of some very innovative ways of, of providing that. Um, so the, uh, I'm coming up with different things on different slides, but um, can, yeah, sorry. So if we think about uh, health systems, how do we actually start to think about providing the care that people with these chronic complex uh, conditions require? The first one is to think about making the, that the services which we provide, ensuring that they're person-centered rather than service-driven. Uh, and that being person-centered, they're thinking about the individual, the, the, the situation which they're experiencing and their aspirations. And thinking about how we can engage both vertically and horizontally across all the systems of uh, the, the different uh, primary, secondary and tertiary health systems that, that are in place. Uh, and also trying to emphasize the uh, primary care, uh, the, the public health uh, system, uh, and the increased role which we have for prevention and, uh, and health promotion. Um, so if we think about public health, uh, and we think about these chronic conditions, almost all of them are influenced by the, our health behaviours. They're influenced by the food that we eat. They're influenced by the exercise that we take. Um, and these are things which a public health system, if it was strengthened, can really have marked uh, impacts on. Um, this needs to be undertaken in uh, collaboration with social services, which address those social determinants which people have mentioned repeatedly today, and which lead to those inequities which we see in older age. And, and, and in doing that, we need to be thinking about how we not only can we, how we can prevent the development of those chronic conditions, um, but also how we can help people to compensate for and adapt to the consequences that they may be experiencing. And finally, we need to be thinking uh, about the, the vast advances which we have experienced recently in terms of the data that is collected and how we can be using that to monitor people's health, how we can um, be using it to inform in, in a very personalised way the interventions which they may need to take to actually ensure that they uh, have better health across the life course.
In terms of health care, the focus needs to, again, be on integrated care. Um, what we uh, have seen, not only have health systems developed in a way which is focused on acute care, but we've seen the emergence of professional silos and that an older person with multiple complex conditions will go from one professional silo to the next professional silo, each treating their condition independently, and with the uh, older person uh, ultimately uh, sometimes being uh, experiencing polypharmacy or disjointed care, or care that's not really focused around their aspirations, but around the professional convenience of the service silo that they've engaged with. Um, we need to be thinking also much more, putting a much greater emphasis on primary care rather than the secondary and tertiary care where we tend to focus at the moment. And as we look at primary care, we need to be thinking in innovative ways and not just thinking that that means a GP in the community. There are a whole range of other organisations and providers who can provide that care as long as they have the opportunity to integrate with the other services. Um, health records are important in achieving that. We need to ensure that health records are transferable between the different settings where the person engages with the health system. Um, and uh, uh, also we need to have a workforce that's appropriate. Um, not just geriatricians, we need more geriatricians, but we need many more people across the health system skilled in providing geriatric care. Uh, and that is unfortunately not the case at the moment. And finally, we, we mustn't uh, forget palliative care and hospice care for people who are in the last days of life. Um, Long-term care, as I said, we're, here we're talking about not just institutions, but a continuum of care from the community right through to um, the, uh, the institutions themselves. And I'm really excited by some of the innovative activity that's happening in this field within Asia. Uh, and particularly, I'd like to comment on an uh, initiative of HelpAge um, who, uh, have I, who have built systems of uh, uh, groups of older people where you bring together uh, older people within local communities to help themselves and also to reinforce the community and, and its development in a variety of ways. And those, those older people's associations can not just provide care, um, but they can provide health promotion and keep people healthy before they require care. Uh, they can uh, encourage people through cash uh, transfers uh, to uh, more actively generate incomes themselves. Uh, and I think that they, it, what we need to be thinking about is how we can integrate them much more with the other levels of care that we're talking about, other forms of primary care and also secondary care and, and tertiary health care. Uh, and, and finally, we also need to be thinking how we can engage technology in providing those, that sort of, uh, uh, th those sort of opportunities. So these were the, uh, the recommendations which, uh, which we uh, identified through the process of the workshop and our late subsequent deliberations. Um, the, the first one is uh, to achieve the goal of the best possible health for older people. Governments should, over the next five years, develop strategies for increasing investments in robust public health systems that can build and lead collective actions for promoting health at the population level and across the life course. We need to shift the focus of health systems uh, to a focus on healthy longevity, and we need to identify markers of healthy longevity and monitor them, and we need to think about how we fund health systems and reward them for supporting healthy longevity, not just for uh, the throughput which they, uh, they provide. Uh, and finally, and I think probably most challengingly for this region, Governments need to work with health and long-term care systems and researchers to develop strategies for making available culturally sensitive, person-centred and equitable long-term care. Uh, and again, I think we need to think in terms of how we can do that in very innovative ways that work with the communities who will ultimately be receiving that care. So now I'd like to pass to Hero, who's going to identify why this is important for uh, Asia uh, and uh, some of the trends which are already occurring here. Thank you. So thank you, John. My name is Hiroki Nakatani, connected from Tokyo, Japan. I have been honored and privileged to serve to the commission for the past two years. And um, my role here is uh, to bring to your attention that how important this commission's report is 
uh, particularly in public health, health systems and long-term care section, which was beautifully presented by um, our Professor John Beard. So I would like to supplement by a few slides. Next slide, please. I think everybody agrees that our, our commission's aim, that is to realize person-centered services for senior citizens by integrating public health, medical care, a social service, and long-term care by 2050. But uh, we need long journey, which requires system thinking and future back approach over many years, which uh, Linda illustrated in the, the first part of this um, our meeting. And we need whole society approach, but governments should play an important role as innovator, rule makers, and also investor for the new systems. Uh, this slide shows some difficulties and some challenges, uh, difficulties, challenges, and opportunities. 7% and 14% is, um, is a doubling uh, of number. So this duration is that our populations aged 70, 65 exceed 7%. So we call it, uh, we come to an aging society. Over 40%, per percent, we come to an aged society. How long does it take? Japan took 24 years and Singapore 70 years shorter than Japan or quicker aging than J Japan. Korea 18 years and your neighbors uh, Brunei Darussalam will take only 13 years. So Asia in general is aging very quickly, even quicker than Japan. But on the other hand, some um, um, friends countries in this region, such as Fiji, who takes uh, 47 years, Solomon Island, 44 years, and the Philippines, 30 years. So. Uh, they feel that aging is uh, something like a very, very long, long future issue. But let's look at the example of, of Japan. Next slide, please. Japan, oh, that is a little bit a um, uh, 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 disturbed slide, but I'm sorry for that. Uh, Japan introduced the health um, uh, insurance and pension universal coverage in 1961 and long-term care insurance was initiated in 2000. It took 40 years. So when we started universal coverage of health insurance and pension, at the time, Japanese population of, of uh, age population is, is something like 6%. Same level uh, of Indonesia now, and same level of Republic of Korea in late 80s. So we took nearly 40 years uh, to, uh, to bring to to uh, universal coverage of long-term care by introduction of long-term care insurance, 40 years. And we need systemic in investment. Starting from uh, 1990, we started invest investment for uh, long-term care facilities, both institutional care and also home, home uh, uh, care services. So this means we need long-term investment. Next slide. But um, we feel we can see our population quite um, um, uh, accurately. So I think um, we can start planning from backward, future back approach. And this is really needed uh, by COVID-19 experience in this region. Many countries of, of region responded very well. But we had some investment of public health infrastructure, also some investment for humans. I think um, our obesity rate is uh, lower. That is perhaps a very, very big contributor of low death rate in this region comparing to other parts of the world. So a long-term investment is needed. Next slide. Already we are moving. Uh, UN have uh, decade of healthy aging. So this movement was uh, initiated by WHO. And at the time, our director of, of WHO was a very famous person you have seen. That is um, Dr. John Beard. So uh, his um, our legacy is really this um, um, uh, healthy de uh, decade, decade of healthy aging in UN-wide. And from Japan, 
uh, aging is our very, very important issue. So we brought to, uh, to um, a G7 Health Summit uh, hosted by Japan in 2016. At the time, uh, Ebola response, health emergency was a big subject. Other one is universal coverage, including uh, aging. So that is, uh, we are insisting that this need to be um, further elaborated. So we brought to uh, um, Japan hosted G20 <coughs> a summit meeting in Osaka 2019. At the time, uh, we, it was first time to bring health minister and financing minister at the same time. And then uh, we discussed about universal health coverage. And this time uh, of the host of uh, G20 uh, is Indonesia. And Indonesia still, uh, they continue to have joint meeting of health ministers and financing ministers. And the result of this time was a creation of financial uh, intermediate funds for pandemic preparedness. So we can prepare uh, well for the next pandemic. But um, uh, these activities lead to regional common activities and country activities. In the region, uh, in the Western Pacific region of WHO, they have regional action plan for healthy aging in the Western Pacific. And the neighboring region uh, of Southeast Asian region, which covers India, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, uh, Myanmar, and other countries, in Southeast Asia have their own healthy aging uh, regional framework. So a uh, time is concerned, it's uh, nearly come to, uh, to, to for the next version of this uh, strategy and action plan. Healthy longevity report is very timely and to put to uh, other sort and new idea and new encouragement for regional activities that will inspire countries some um, plan building Japan has one. Other country has um, aging action plan or national plan. Some countries integrating aging uh, issues within national health plan or strategy. So I think this uh, report will be very influential. And um, uh, as commissioner, I will, will commit to bring to uh, this uh, report to any international forums. Thank you very much. And I return microphone to moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nakatani. As for the fourth and last domain, the longevity dividend, we have two presenters. Professor Chao Yaohui from the China Center for Economic Research of Peking University, who is joining us online, followed by Professor Linda Fried, who is the Dean and Delarme Professor at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health and Director Robert N. Butler, Columbia Aging Center. Professor Chow, please. Thank you. I'm pleased to speak to this uh, distinguished audience. Um, so uh, previous uh, speakers, uh, can we turn to the next slide, please? Our previous presentations are about how to achieve healthy longevity. Um, healthy longevity can enable older workers, older people to contribute to the society, uh, something we call um, the longevity dividend. Linda Fried will elaborate on it in a short while. However, a healthy longevity does not automatically generate the healthy dividend, the, the longevity dividend. Currently, most countries are not fully utilizing the work capacity of older people afforded by their health status. Next, please. To illustrate that point, uh, let's look at differences in labor force participation between high and low income countries. Uh, labor force participation in low income, uh, low and lower middle income countries too high. Many people lack the resources to stop working until they drop. For these people, healthy aging improves their well being, even though it may not increase employment. But for, for, but for high income countries, even though people have better health status than their low income counterparts, they retire too early, leaving much of the work capacity unutilized. <clears throat> 
Next slide. With, within a middle or low income country, differences may exist between formal and informal sectors. Uh, the, left, the left panel shows um, retirement rate in China. Uh, and the, the top two lines are urban uh, men, urban women, and the lower, the bottom two lines are rural men and rural women. Um, we can see that urban people retire much earlier than rural people. But uh, urban people's health status, uh, which is shown on the right panel uh, for cognition, is much better, implying that um, there's a large underutilized work capacity among urban people. Next slide, please. Uh, estimated by the network of HRS family surveys indicate that all high income countries have substantial excess work capacity, more among women than men, um, women on the, at the bottom, the men on the top. Um, and there are significant variations across countries, indicating that uh, the policies and institutions matter a lot. Uh, work decision is not entirely made by the older people themselves. Employers often discriminate against older workers, and older workers often lack the skills required by the job. A paid employment is not the only form of productive use of older people's time. They could also help their families and volunteer. Next, please. So the commission emphasized work and retirement, volunteering and lifelong education and retraining as the key targets for achieving a longevity dividend. Longevity dividend describes the economic and intangible benefits that come from healthy longevity and for participation of older adults in society. The goals are to generate economic and social benefits by people living, working, volunteering, and engaging longer. Build societal structures that enable safe and meaningful work and other community engagement at every stage of life and create education and training opportunities that will be needed to retool probably more than once across uh, li longer lives. Next, please. High and upper middle income countries have unsustainably low rates of labor force participation among people age 50 and over. In these countries, increasing participation in paid and volunteer roles will be necessary. Employers and governments have a role in putting incentives in place to recruit and retain older workers. Currently, laws and policies such as the work tax or mandatory age-based retirement are disincentives to working at older ages. New laws and policies are needed to re retain em employees. Next, please. Other structures needed are formal volunteer programs to help older people to give to younger people, and by doing so, adding meaning and purpose to their own lives. Commissioners foresee a future where people cycle through education or training, work, absence from the workforce, and back into training, potentially several times during their work lives. For this to be possible, new models are needed for educating adults beyond their early 20s and even into their 60s. In many countries, access to secondary education sets the stage for lifelong earnings and, uh, and other outcomes. Expanded access to secondary and higher education will support healthy longevity in the near and long term. Next, please. So the commission recommends partnerships between governments, employers, and educational institutions that include designing work environments and policies to encourage older people to work after age 50, redesigning education systems using evidence about how people learn at different ages, and providing incentives for retraining and full participation in volunteer programs and the workforce. 
I now turn the podium to Linda Wei, uh, Linda Fried. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhao. And it's my honor to conclude this session before we turn to uh, hearing your questions and comments um, by talking about what the return on investment would be uh, in creating the conditions of a longevity dividend. I'll start with the present. And uh, these are data published by David Bloom two years ago and his colleagues, in which he looked at the economic contributions of older adults currently in the US and the European Union. And what he found was that you could, typically we only look at contributions from paid work, which is the large yellow area, um, and the amount of um, contributions to the GDP by paid work by older adults, people 65 and old, 50 and older, sorry, going to 80, you can see at the bottom of each graph. Um, but historically, we have not looked at the amount of contributions that older adults currently provide without payment. And so Dr. Bloom actually created a methodology to monetize the value of non-monetary contributions in terms of, uh, in the blue, caring for grandchildren, in the orange, support for non-household members, and in the gray, in terms of volunteering for, um, as I said, the European Union on the left and the US on the right. And what, what he found was, in, in quick summary, that we can begin to develop methodologies to appreciate that even currently, without having developed the systems to, uh, the improved systems to engage older adults in work and volunteering that Dr. Zhao just discussed, that 7% of the EU and US GDP can be attributed to the monetary and non-monetary contributions of older adults in those countries currently. That's even before we begin to actually create the new structures to enable uh, contributions that match people's goals and capabilities. In addition, we have learned, as we think about return on investment from the creation of healthy longevity, that delaying the onset of chronic conditions themselves, following Dr. Beard's discussion, just uh, the investments that would delay the the onset of chronic conditions by just one year is estimated, looking at the US, to be worth $37 trillion in the GDP. One other measure of return on investment. If we look at people in high income countries um, who will need to work more years to support their longer lives, uh, it's very clear that the creation of increased health, such as through the prevention of chronic conditions, will enable them to actually work uh, when they feel like they need to, which in fact, of course, will be part of the return on investment for society. Uh, we've already mentioned a couple of times that having more older workers in the workforce will uh, have many benefits, one of them uh, in, in beyond just increasing the workforce capacity is that age diversity in the workplace improves team performance, productivity, decreases absenteeism, and improves innovation. And finally, it's obvious um, data-wise that labor force participation rates among older people are positively correlated with labor force participation rates of younger people. To put that in different language, um, the economic, what is called lump of labor fallacy, is the, the apprehension that older people working will diminish jobs for young people. That has been shown to not be the case, and in fact, older people working increases jobs for young people. So let's talk for a minute about work 
barriers. Um, it's clear that workers in poor health, those who have not benefited from healthy longevity, are more likely than their healthier counterparts to transition out of work and into unemployment, disability, pensions, and early retirement. So health clearly is a driver of whether people are able to stay engaged. Further, age discrimination in employment, which is quite prevalent, is a barrier to older people who want to work remaining in the workforce. And finally, uh, as John Pickett spoke to, workers in informal and gig economies lack economic sec financial security and protections of having uh, some form of pension that would enable them to stop working when they need to. Let's turn uh, for uh, in the closing comments to the issue of volunteering. Formal volunteering, contributing your time to uh, the betterment of your community and your society in later life, it's been shown, supports the creation of healthy longevity, improves health, uh, physical health, but it also improves an older person's sense of meaning and purpose, having a reason to get up in the morning, and that they are contributing um, in ways that are of deep value for the present and the future. And it also improves the social and financial value, if you will, of appreciating what older adults contribute to society. There is strong evidence now that um, older adults volunteering lowers mortality risk, improves cognitive function, lowers depression, improves physical function, positive affect, and happiness, and enables people to realize their generative goals to leave the world better than they found it. So in sum, volunteering is positive for both older adults when it's well designed, when it's well designed, and for their communities. And the combination uh, is particularly of import. So um, volunteering, uh, the practices of contributing, giving, and passing on have an important role in the self-identification of older people as contributing citizens, as individuals with self-worth, significance, and meaning, and enables older adults to, to meet their basic psychological needs of self-esteem, socialization, life satisfaction, and contribu contribution to others. But it also in, provides a vehicle in older age when people want to do it, not that they have to do it, but when they want to do it, to actually create, um, join together with others in shared objectives that creates connection, cohesion, and lowers isolation and loneliness. So in conclusion, um, we have strong recommendations that we don't need to stop with the status quo, that older people want to, when healthy, um, want to contribute uh, and be engaged, whether it's through work or volunteering. But we need to turn to how, uh, just as HelpAge is doing so effectively and other programs around the world, we need to focus on how to develop formal volunteering programs, essentially structural social capital, to provide older volunteers with roles that have meaning and purpose, that have impact for the future, that build connection and cohesion, that create um, social capital, and that create uh, collective efficacy and impact. And these new roles could define the roles, even responsibilities, of older age in society to bring collective good, uh, to benefit communities and next generations. We want to think about new kinds of national and community service, as well as the kind of work-related encore careers that have been discussed, and recognize older age as an opportunity to build a pay-it-forward stage of life. So I'll conclude by this section by saying, what is this longevity dividend that we talk about from healthy longevity? What could the returns on investment be? Well, certainly, health is an asset, 
Um, it can be translated for people who want and need to do that into workforce productivity and decrease disparities in both the opportunity for health and for economic security. For society, de potentially decrease medical care costs and vulnerability to pandemics due to having a healthier population less susceptible to novel infections. The economic returns on healthy longevity, which we've mentioned, um, can be reaped into the oldest ages, contrary to as assertions that human capital investments don't pay off over age 65. The evidence absolutely contravenes that. Older workers mean increased labor supply and fewer accidents. In many sectors, consumers actually value the service of older workers and trust older workers in, uh, to support them in their consumer decisions. As I've said, uh, more jobs for older people translate into more jobs for young people. And an increased older population, if, to, if enabled to, to do this, could provide the kind of mentorship and hands up to young people uh, as they enter a work life. Volunteering and caregiving by healthy older adults um, can be extremely important contribution to the GDP if we learn how to recognize the value of that, as David Bloom pointed out. And the capabilities and goals, in summary, of older adults, if utilized and enabled well through new social infrastructure, could bring new human and social capital potential at scale to society. All of this could result in an increased GDP, plus uh, fueled as well by new businesses and products for older adults that add um, money into the economy. So I'll end by this section by saying that we have tried to portray in these presentations the recommendations from the commission in the bottom right in terms of the enablers of uh, health, um, healthy longevity, what has to be done in four areas in work and volunteering, social infrastructure, the physical environment, and health systems in order to transform the potential both for healthy longevity and the return on investment in terms of a longevity dividend. We've also focused on the disruptors of this virtuous cycle, which need to be addressed. So I'll conclude now by um, inviting our audience to raise questions and comments. And I'd like to invite Dr. Wong and Dr. Beer to, the po to uh, join me on, here on the stage. And um, our other presenters will be online. And we would welcome your comments and, and questions. Thank you. I didn't see the mic. <laughs> so uh, I've just been given uh, uh, on the iPad uh, a first question from the audience. It's from Dr. Jeff, Professor Jeffrey Halter, who's here. Uh, Jeff, would you like to uh, say your question yourself? Thank you all so much for the remarkable job you've done, the tremendous work I know that went into putting this report together and the cha grand challenge you faced before all of us. And for me, I'm trying to understand my question simply is what role can I play in this grand challenge? And I'd like to put it kind of put some context around that. I'm a geriatrician, academic geriatrician. I work in a big academic health center, University of Michigan, which is remarkably similar in many ways, geographically and organizationally and structurally to the national, wonderful National University health system here in Singapore. Um, and we focus on 
in my whole career, we focus on diseases, and for me, it's age-related diseases, and particularly for me, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which is an age-related disease, and it's an example of many of the age-related diseases that just get in the way of healthy longevity. And in di what have we learned? Well, a lot of things we've learned, many people around the world have been working on diabetes. D despite all what we've learned, the rate of diabetes is skyrocketing in the United States and in Singapore and in China and all around the world. But we've, I think we've learned some things that are relevant to this challenge you put before us. One is, it's not just a chronic disease that you get one day and then you have for a long time. It's a disease that starts way, the precursors start years and years before it reaches the clinical threshold where those of us in the health system start to get involved. And we've learned in diabetes, uh, we can actually identify the people who are at highest risk for developing diabetes. We call them now pre-diabetes. And we've learned there are interventions that we can institute that around lifestyle, nutrition and exercise, that can at least delay the development of diabetes for years. And for some people, maybe forever, for their whole life, which is great. But beyond that, even going back further, we know who's at the highest, the seeds of diabetes later in life are sown early, way earlier in life. And it's the most vulnerable people in our society who are at increased risk for that. So here I am dealing with people with this disease way at this end of their <laughs> life. And I, do I have to be over there? And how am I supposed to translate? I'm, I'm not very good at changing society. <laughs> I have trouble changing one patient. So it's, and it's not just me. So wh what should I do? But how should we be training the next generation of health providers that we do at these wonderful medical schools and health systems to be able to respond to this wonderful grand challenge you presented to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, on the podium are three uh, physicians who both provide clinical care and uh, pub public health leadership. And so I'd like to ask, um, maybe we can go down the line. And, and also, Dr. Nakatani is online, and I'd like to ask everybody to, to provide a quick response. Um, Dr. Beard, would you like to start? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question, Jeff, and the first thing I'd do is encourage the next generation of the workforce to be just like you. And the reason I say that, not just because you're a nice guy, but because you're a geriatrician, and geriatricians are trained to think about the whole person, to think about their aspirations and how they need to bring together the care they need to help them achieve those aspirations. So in terms of clinical care, I think we need to be thinking about the workforce and how we can train them to adopt that more integrated approach, which is not the way it's delivered at the moment. In terms of the other side of things, the prevention, I don't think clinicians should take on that burden. You know, it's great to have your support when people uh, advocate for greater expenditure in public health, for more focus on prevention. That's what you can do is, is support that and show that, the, that, you, that, that, that there's not a, a pushback from clinicians. But really that's for policy makers, it's for health promotion people, it's for those sorts of people. And, and, and then what we need to do is look at how we can connect you all so that it's not just them and us, it's actually an integrated system that works across the whole life course. Thank you. Dr. Nakatani, would you like to comment? Uh, yes. I have a vivid uh, story to tell. Uh, I came from a northern part of Japan uh, in the 60s. I think one third of the uh, population uh, became uh, a hemiplegia by stroke. So I think we know that the salt was, and high blood pressure was a major uh, source or underground sources. So what we did is that community intervention to reduce salt intake, it's 
drastically reduce average uh, blood pressure, and then consequences coming as a lower uh, mortality and mobility by brain stroke. Uh, so as uh, to me, I would, um, uh, would um, uh, humbly suggest three things. One is as uh, clinicians, you can document and uh, um, put to a uh, not New England Journal, but I think some uh, popular journals or media. So that number one, as an implementer, you can have uh, small community projects which reduce, um, I mean, uh, uh, glucose intake in your case, or in our case, was a salt intake. So that is second. If it is um, demonstrating effectiveness, why don't we bring a uh, work with um, with patient group and bring to uh, community leaders, or, or even community leaders goes to uh, regional leaders and national leaders. So high blood pressure is concerned it is the same as uh, in, in Japan. So uh, salt intake was reduced, and that is linked with other sectors like package of, of salt uh, is uh, reducing every every year. And also, many uh, restaurants do not put the soy sauce and salt on the table. So that is uh, perhaps social movement you can initiate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wong, what would your response be? Um, well, I think I would probably say that there are four things that we need to do. Uh, firstly, I think that certainly um, schools and academic health systems have to, have to realize it's more than just clinical excellence, education, and research but actually prevention and population health. Because we need to move away from being a reactive system to actually a proactive system. And that requires a huge mindset. And as healthcare professionals, I think we're extraordinarily privileged to be able to know our patients intimately. And when we know our patients intimately, we will see all the social determinants. And so I really do think that healthcare professionals need to move away from being a reactive uh, a, a profession to a proactive, really looking at this, what the definition as John and Hero have so eloquently said, truly patient-centered and not disease-centered. And, you know, as a practicing oncologist, I'm, you know, equally guilty. And so how do I move from, instead of treating cancer, to preventing cancer? And I think that that ultimately is going to be the challenge of the entire healthcare profession. And we can't do it on our own. So we have to do it with the whole whole spectrum of society. It really is a complex systems issue. Healthcare professionals cannot solve diabetes. And I think that's my message to, to Jeff. And the, fi the fact that the faster that all healthcare professionals realize that they can't solve the disease, that it really requires tapping on the whole of society, the faster we're going to achieve healthy longevity. So I'll just add that, um, you know, the, the science of the last 30 to 50 years shows that prevention works and matters. It also shows that about 70% of, of, of that has to be delivered at a community and population level in order to do prevention across the life course. And that it's not an issue to go along with what Dr. Wong just said of what, what happens in the clinician's office. It's an issue of how we deliver the kinds of prevention on the ground and at the policy level uh, that make the opportunity to prevent diseases like diabetes possible, uh, and that it has to happen across the life course. That under All of that underpins the commission's recommendation that we need to invest in a new generation of public health systems in countries that are adequately invested in um, to deliver prevention at the population level and that complement what a clinician can do in the doctor's office to counsel an individual. Thank you all. Um, so uh, we'd like to invite other comments or questions. Please raise your hand and yes, somebody will bring you the <laughs> microphone. Yes. Uh, there's, a, there's a comment right here in the third row. Yes, we've got many people in the audience have thought long and hard about this issue for decades. Dr. Soin, please. Maybe if you just introduce yourself to those who don't know you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a just retired orthopedic surgeon who was a former nominated member of parliament. And I'd like to make two uh, comments. One is that in, uh, Singapore has done a lot for aging, but we are still keeping to our retirement age, which we are 
you know, uh, going forward very slowly to increase it. But we know that people's lifespans increase by at about three years every decade. So I think countries that have a mandatory retirement age should at least factor in this, even not accounting for healthy longevity. That's one. Th the other thought I think which has been mentioned is ageism and the perception of negative thoughts towards aging. I'm 80 years old and I'm quite happy to tell people my age. So these negative perceptions from one of the studies that was quite revealing was done by Yale in Yale University by Becca Levy. I hope I pronounced her name correctly. And she said that younger, they did a study, younger people who hold negative perceptions towards aging show many more, um, show much more evidence of tangles and plaques in their brain, indicating that they are going to get Alzheimer's. In a way, it is, it is karma having a bite. If you, if you feel you don't want to grow old, well, then you're going to be punished for it. <laughs> so I think ageism is one of the most important things that we need to attend. And unfortunately, in our national plan for aging, which had so many sections and so many suggestions, I found that ageism was not you know, included in that. So that are just two, two suggestions I have, you know, to look at the ret mandatory retirement age and to look at ageism. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very valuable <laughs> comments. I wonder if I could uh, talk to, uh, turn to Yowie Zung and to uh, John Piggott to comment. Do you want to get first, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, a mandatory retirement uh, policy exists in most countries, and it is also very, very difficult to change. Um, in many countries, uh, uh, the, it has to do with social security provision. In many countries, um, the social security is pay as you go. And in such cases, um, retirement is viewed as, as entitlement. Um, therefore, people resist um, the postponing retirement. And, and to change that, uh, you, you should change the way uh, the, the Social Security is, is contributed and distributed. Um, I'm curious about Singapore, because Singapore has a very different uh, pension system. It is a purely um, individual account based. Uh, so there's no um, free ride on, on other people, on, on other people's accounts. So I, I'm curious why uh, Singapore does not allow people to um, to draw to start drawing their retirement pension later, or just just let people choose when they want to start um, uh, drawing pensions, because uh, the the whole. Um, benefit of retirement, a postponing retirement is, 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 is enjoyed by the individuals themselves. Uh, so it is it's ideal for having a flexible retirement age in the core system. Thank you. So I'm sorry, question to, to so, people. In so we'll go to Professor Piggott and then Beard and then um, maybe Dr. Wong can, can comment on Singapore's policy. Um, John Piggott. We have three yeah, Johns so, so, in a row here. <laughs> I mean, the idea of a mandatory retirement age and its connection um, with retirement benefits um, is a little bit complicated and it can be decoupled. So the first point I, I would make is that it's quite possible to not have a retirement age at all, but to have an access age for a pension. So you have a minimum access age for a pension, which say is 65, but there's nothing to stop you working for longer if you wish. You don't lose your pension, you get it anyway. Uh, and that's sort of what we have in Australia. Um, it's what you have in North America, except there in, in the US, you can postpone when you draw down your benefits, right? But there's, there's no requirement. There's a, there's a modal age when most people retire it's no requirement that you should retire exactly then. But there are a series of access ages with associated benefit structures. So 
So I think that's the first point. You can separate these things out. Um, uh, Norway, for example, um, uh, changed its policies in 2010, and now people work longer. They can take their pension, but they can continue to work regardless of whether they take their pension. And the evidence is that what they do is they work a bit less hard, but they work for more years. And so there's a, a gradation to retirement, which makes good intuitive sense. And um, I think that's a very simple way of allowing uh, workers to continue being productive in work that they enjoy for as long as they want to do it. Thank you. Dr. Beard. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to support John there. I think it's really important to decouple this idea of retirement and when you can access uh, a pension. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting if you talk about mandatory retirement and, and limitations on employment on, on, based on age, only one of the six members of this panel could actually work for the United Nations or the World Health Organization because we're too old. We're too old to actually be productive and contribute because of these entrenched ageist attitudes. So I think your comment on ageism is, is, is also ties in with your first comment on re mandatory retirement. It's just a form of institutionalized ageism. On the other hand, I think we have to be really careful about your first comment about raising retirement age. I mean, I think, as John said, we really need to think through what this idea of retirement is. Um, the problem with raising retirement age, if, if what you mean is when you can access a pension, is it's inherently inequitable. Because the people in the poorest health and the people who actually need financial security uh, are those who are in the lowest socioeconomic groups. And so by raising the retirement age, you're probably making it harder for people with greater levels of disability to access this, the financial security that they need. So in fact, it's, it's, it, it is important that if you're gonna do that, you link it not just to life expectancy, but to healthy life expectancy. Um, and, and otherwise, we reinforce those inequity. Thank you. Dr. Wong, do you wanna comment? Uh, I mean, I, I fully agree with all the, the, the comments made. I, um, if you, uh, I really urge everyone to read that section in the report because uh, the conclusion is that it has to be nuanced. It's a very heterogeneous issue. Um, there is, a, I think the first is that many of the policies in place were put in when, when life expectancy was only 65 or 70. Um, and to change entire mindsets with all the ramifications. And there are governments around the world who have faced, you know, who have, who have basically lost the election based on issues like this. So it's a very contentious issue. And I think this is where engaging the media and really engaging society, saying, how do we want to plan a hundred year life? Uh, because Yahui mentioned Singapore's uh, uh, system this, uh, where we have our own savings plans. Um, but the issue is, in many people, that saving plan may not be enough. Uh, raising retirement age is a very blunt tool, as uh, John Beard mentioned. Um, and I think that it's no, you, you can raise the retirement age, but equally important, it requires job redesign. And it really requires looking at this issue about how do older people remain skilled. I'll give you one figure. If you look at universities around the world, the number of people over 40 in university is, OECD countries is less than 2%. Now, we all know the challenges of learning remotely by Zoom. I mean, if COVID taught us anything, is that learning online is very different from learning in person. So, and we also know that learning on the job is so critical. So there's a whole science of learning in older people that really needs to be uh, developed. Someone said that we should have a Ministry of Education which currently looks after everyone until you know, 2022 or average. We actually need a, perhaps a Ministry of Older Education to look at what do we really need to have in place for people from the age of say 50 to 80 or 50 to 90. Uh, Dr. Nakatani, would you like the last word on this? Thank you. Just I'd like to, um, to, uh, to mention very interesting development in, in Japan. Uh, our aging populations, absolute number is not growing so much. 
But um, a sharp decline of working population is our biggest headache. So I think um, a healthy uh, senior workers is needed. So most likely, I think if we um, uh, change our definition of senior citizens from 65 to 75, that only we can, uh, if we need to extend the one year uh, plus two, uh, 1.2 years for male population, that our healthy aging is uh, coming to uh, 75. So we can change our uh, definition of uh, senior citizens from 65 to 75, and then Japanese uh, aging headache is over. So I think uh, that is linking to our, our argument. So uh, it's an opportunity for invest for health for senior citizens, and that is good for our society as well. Thank you. Thank you all. I, I think we, we, we'd like to... Should we just comment on ageism? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Go ahead. So I think that's a really critical issue, and I'd like you know, other members of the audience and the commissioners to comment, because I think ageism, as I mentioned earlier, it's a very unique bias that, that individuals have against their future self. And the worst thing about ageism is that it compounds all other biases. So ageism and sexism, it just compounds the issue. Ageism and racism compounds the issue. Um, the report, and I get the, if you read the section in the report, the US Federal Reserve released about 44,000 job applicants of fictitious people. And all they did was look, change the age. And they found significantly less callbacks for older people, both men and women. And the worst issue is COVID has actually increased the, the, the issues, the, the, the prevalence of, of, of ageism. So I think in every society, Singapore included, we have to address this because uh, it, it, like all biases, it really, it, it really has a nefarious effect uh, you know, on every aspect of society. And, um, yeah, I really welcome input. I mean, Linda, you've been thinking hard about this also. Well, I'd like to uh, ask our timekeepers, can we take another question or two? Yeah? Oh, good. Please. Yes. Please introduce yourself. Hi. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm one of the media contingent, uh, and I've managed to fight age ageism long enough to be what I describe, and no one's challenged it yet, the oldest working journalist in Singapore. <laughs> but I wear, I wear a few other hats as well. <laughs> but uh, the age, ageism one is very important, but, and I, I have lots of questions as a, as a journalist, but I'll, I'll try and focus on just one. And I think the medical profession, government, society in general, uh, is making a mistake, and has made a mistake for many years, to encourage specialization. And I think the medical profession has done this uh, exceptionally well, uh, and to its credit, at the same time, I think it becomes a barrier to getting the sort of medical attention that we all need, particularly as we get older. And I think it was the other John, John Beard, who mentioned disjointed care. And I think that's something that's become very apparent to me as not as a journalist, but as a patient in this very institution over the last couple of years. Nothing to do with the pandemic, but to do with other issues that went wrong in that time. But I, you have to come to a hospital or go to the doctor with one particular problem. But at the same time, the medical profession, I don't think, is adjusted enough to treat all the other issues that you might have as well, that are connected in some way. And I, and I think this is where this report obviously highlights issues like this, just like diet is so important uh, and leads to a lot of other problems. So I suppose it's an emphasis on preventative care. What more can be done to introduce and manage preventative care, not just for seniors, but for whole of society? Thank you. So uh, maybe I'll start with one comment and turn to my colleagues for more. Uh, as a geriatrician, I can say that geri um, clinicians who are trained in geriatrics are trained in hearing not just one concern but many and being able to, ha to actually understand the complexity of a, any of our health concerns and find the elegant and simplifying solutions that can address them in a holistic way. And it goes to Dr. Beard's point that we really need to train 
a much larger cadre of people with a background in geriatric medicine and public health to be able to meet the needs of all of us as we get older. John, do you want to comment from there? Yeah, I think two, two points. I mean, the, it comes down to care coordination. Uh, and you can do that by training everybody better in terms of they need to integrate with others. But you can, can also create new professional streams of workers, care coordinators, who take on that role and help people navigate that complex system. Um, at a more fundamental level, though, I think it comes down to how we think about health and how we measure health and how we fund and reimburse births in, sorry, reimburse health services to actually provide the care that they provide. Because if we were able to monitor the impact of the care that people provide on health and reimburse people for that rather than throughput, what you'd find is, is there would be a whole series of incentives for coordination and disincentives for the sort of disintegrated care that we're talking about. So I think we need to think about it fundamentally, but uh, we, we can also in the meantime think about the mechanisms for how we can coordinate better between the existing silos. John Wong? Oh, I fully agree with John, and I think I'd go one step further, not only coordination, but in terms of uh, actually implementation, because actually we know a lot about how to prevent disease, but the last mile implementation is a challenge. And you know, for the Singaporeans in the audience, I would really urge everyone to look at the National Population Health S Survey in 2020. It reads for sobering reading when you see the gaps between what we know needs to be done and what's actually done. And you know, um, you know, expecting a ministry or somebody else to 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 do it for us as individuals. It, it, again, you you know, you can lead the horse to the water, but ultimately the horse has to drink. So I think that there's going to be, it's a, it's a complex systems issue. And, and, and again, engaging the media and finding out how do we create the narrative that people do see the value in going for their vaccinations. They see the value of going for their colon cancer screening. There, there's many social economic issues to address. But I think that, you know, firstly, understanding the gap and then figuring out how to address it is probably one of the first steps. Thank you. Would any of our commissioners online like to comment on this? No, oh, I think you guys covered it. Thank you. Uh, other questions from our audience? Dr. Zhao. Hi, thank you. Um, this is more a comment than a question. One is I just want to echo the issue about education and how we train our medical students uh, not to be perhaps not doing the social, but have the awareness of so important social determinants so they'll think of referring to a coordinator. They're not even aware of that. They won't even make a referral. So I think the education overall have to shift how we think about health and care from medical students up. The other thing is actually general published by health literacy. The best patient as a doctor is a well-informed, motivated patient, so to speak, if I call them patient. So I think there isn't enough preparation to our general population of health literacy. Echoing what John was saying, you know, that it's important to get immunizations, it's important to live a healthy lifestyle, that sort of thing. So I think in, in general, an Asia can do a lot better ground up and using different kind of manpower community to better educate health literacy for self-care. That's one. The second thing is that is we always kind of couldn't figure out how to engage a private sector. I think we have all kinds of people in this room, but not many private sector people. Private sector offer a bulk of employment. They produce products and services. And I remember when I was working in the South Bronx for a very low income family, they, all the kids are obese, feeling of huge bottles of Coca-Cola and chips from a very young age. They also the people who, you know, produces insurance that excludes primary care or they can include primary care. So there are a lot of issues about private sector role that confuses every aspect of life that affects this. And lastly, investors. I run my family office. I can choose to invest in things profitable but terrible or, in, in, or invest in things that, like such as like low glycemic rice and things like that. So I think we need to find ways of engaging the private sector in this entire journey because they play such a huge role, but it's a little, a little difficult to engage them. So uh, my question is that how can we engage the private sector in this entire journey? Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I, I'll invite comments from the commission, but also to to conclude the session, invite comments from the audience as to how to engage every sector um, to align on these issues so that we accomplish a world of healthy longevity together. I'll start with Dr. Beard. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the, the private sector is, uh, I, I mean, there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening in the private sector, but it suffers as broadly as anywhere else in the community, the, the, the consequences of ageism, because often it's a, it's a case of the tail wagging the dog with the private sector. They, they come up with some device, for example, and then they think about how they can market it. Oh, older people, that's a big market, so we'll try and market it to them. Whereas it may not actually be meeting the needs or, or be appropriate for that for, for that market. And I think what, Linda, you mentioned earlier on, the issue of co-design is absolutely critically important. That what we do is we encourage the private sector to engage with older people so that they can identify the gaps and the needs and also to design the best solutions which work for the people who, want, who they're looking to market to. Thank you. Um, John Wang, did you want to add to that? Well, I would just, I mean, the, uh, your slide on the return on investment for the, the longevity dividend, I mean, the, the private sector is, is uh, it, looking to how to, you know, ultimately generate more capital, and I think that your slide says it all. Um, colleagues online, uh, do you want to add? So I would like to conclude by inviting you in the audience to think about how we can engage every sector, the sector that you work with, how, how to begin the change in narrative, how to think about how to implement the first stage of interventions in every sector um, so that we can develop a excitement, positive vision, and positive momentum toward creating the changes that could realize Vision 2050. Uh, I invite comments from anybody here right now in terms of perhaps starting with the private sector and how even in Singapore uh, this kind of change could be initiated. Any comments from audience members? Well, if not, we will be, yes, please, go ahead. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. A very quick, uh, the private uh, corporations have their ESG agenda. We could make it EHSG. Make them put the health in it as well so that they become conscious about encouraging the employees to go for you know, immunization and health screening. So it has to be accounted for in their bottom line. Thank what you. What a great suggestion. Yeah. So, so I just, um, uh, you know, Dr. Son, I fully agree. Um, DPM Heng mentioned um, uh, a major program that the university and NUHS and Housing and Development Board are developing in Queenstown, and there's substantial interest from the private sector to be a partner in this. And I think it would be wonderful if every person and every leader and decision maker looked at things through an environmental lens and then through a healthy longevity lens. If we look at everything through those two lenses, then I think we've got a much better future by 2050. Well, what a great place to stop. So we will conclude now, uh, and um, Emma or, or Dr. Dr. Zhao, anybody want to comment on the proceedings from here? Yeah. I think, uh, um, I think uh, Usha, uh, uh, do you want to comment? Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, I think um, our discussions were gaining momentum and we shouldn't lose the momentum, but we have to take a break now. We've come to the end of session one. So session two will resume at uh, around 1.30 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Before we continue with today's program, once again, this is a gentle reminder to switch off your mobile devices or put it to the silent mode. Thank you for your kind cooperation and attention. Session 2 will be focusing on the Asian perspective on healthy longevity. Aligned to the key findings and recommendations of the global roadmap shared earlier, this afternoon's symposium will view healthy longevity through Asian lens. The panel discussions and keynote addresses lined up will address how we can approach healthy longevity in a manner best suited for Asia's financial, political and social contexts. To kickstart the symposium, let us invite Professor John Piggott to share his views on healthy longevity in the Asian context. 
Professor Piggott is the Director of the Australian Research Council's Centre of Excellence in Population Ageing Research at the University of New South Wales. Professor Piggott has worked with Japan, Indonesia, World Bank and in Asia on ageing issues. Prof John, please. Thank you very much. I'd, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the organisers for this opportunity. Um, ageing in Asia for me is, uh, I guess, a passion, um, something that I, I feel very strongly about. I think it's one of the most important issues in the world today. Uh, so many people are here in this region and many of these countries are ageing very rapidly. Uh, so let me begin with that question of numbers. Next slide, please. So everyone presents numbers about demographic change. So I've tried to do something a little bit different here and look at the 80 plus population globally divided up by continent. So if you go back to 1950, Europe had more 80 plus year olds than Asia. But now, Asia has more people, twice as many 80 plus year olds as Europe. And by 2050, more than half the world's population of 80 plus year olds will live in Asia. So that's the way the demographic world is developing. And these are numbers which are kind of real numbers. We're looking at 80 year olds everyone on this chart has already been born. It's not like we are trying to project the fertility of women who have not yet been born in order to come up with these numbers. This is what is going to be. Next slide, please. The other point to make about Asia, I think, in the context of, uh, of demographic change is that it's very diverse. It's very heterogeneous. And here, what we have tried to do is to divide the Asian region into three broad categories. So that red ribbon toward the top of the chart comprises what I think of as developed Asia, Japan, Korea, Singapore. <clears throat> and you can see that because fertility is so low, the ratio of the population aged over 65 relative to the population between the ages of 15 and 64 is increasing and is projected to increase very rapidly. I hesitate to use the phrase dependency given Linda's comments this morning, but it's the ratio that actually matters. And then there's a second group of countries which are depicted there with a, a kind of pink river, and they comprise countries where fertility is very low, where in many cases population is already falling, um, and where aging is happening very fast, but which are much poorer. These are countries um, with only a fraction of the per capita incomes of Japan, Korea, and Singapore. And then there's a third group of countries where fertility is higher, uh, and population aging is not yet causing the uh, very critical uh, change in demographic structure um, that has been depicted in the other two categories. Next slide, please. So how do we ensure the well-being, the sustainable well-being, the active well-being of all these older people? Well, one way of thinking about it is to think of three categories. You have people living longer, but with less disease and disability. So healthy aging is much more than the absence of disease, but the absence of disease is certainly some of what we mean by healthy aging. And then we want people to live productively and with purpose. This could be in the labor force or it could be through volunteerism, or engagement with family or community, um, but productivity is a piece of it. Purpose, I think personally, purpose is an extremely important piece of it. And thirdly, we want these people to be adequately resourced. 
even if they have a life, which is, as I mentioned this morning, many in the informal sector may end up without adequate resources and support, that has to be provided. So they're the three elements which would go a long way to improving the healthy longevity of much of the Asian population, particularly those in emerging Asia. Next slide, please. So how are we going? Well, if we look at the evidence, here's what the World Health Organization thinks has happened to change in life expectancy and change in healthy life expectancy in the first 20 years of this century across the countries of Asia. And you can see with the exception of the Philippines and Timor-Leste, healthy life expectancy falls short of life expectancy. That is to say, another way of thinking about that is that there's an increase in the years of unhealthy life expectancy. And so that's something to bear in mind and to ask the question whether increases in resources of support might correct that. Next slide, please. And then living productively and with purpose. Well, if we just look at labor force, which is where I have data across all these countries, what you find is that in once people get to the end of their 50s, they tend to leave the labor force. So what we've got here is 50 to 59, 60 to 64, 65 plus. We look at labor force participation in those three age categories across a number of Asian countries. And in every case, you find that by the time you get to 65 plus, the number of people who are in the labor force is only a small fraction of the number who were there in their 50s. And this is a phenomenon which is gradually changing in the developed world. We're seeing an, up, an upswing a little bit in uh, mature labor force participation, but that's not really reflected here. We see, we see quite a serious drop. The poorest countries still have quite high labor force participation, um, Indonesia, for example, uh, at later ages, and that's the informal workers working until they drop because there's no social support. But even so, there's a drop from the 50s to the end of the, uh, to, to the 65 pluses. Next slide, please. So here I need to say next, 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 next. Thank you. Um, so this gives an indication, one indication, right? Or an indication of one reason why we might observe that. So what we have done here is look at the excess age of pensions in these countries for women. And we have combined that with their life expectancy at that excess age. And we have asked, well, that means they've got so many years of expected retirement duration. Now, frequently women get an earlier excess age than men, a form of sexism combined with ageism uh, that Hero was talking about this morning. And you can see there's a whole slew of countries, Vietnam, Asia, China, Indonesia, Thailand, right, which have much higher retirement duration expectations than the OECD average for women. So in some ways, it's, it's not surprising you get that drop in labor force participation at relatively early ages. You could redesign many of these pension systems and you should design social pension systems as they're introduced so that access age is related to life expectancy or at least mature age life expectancy so that there is an adjustment as people's longevity and people's health um, continues for longer. Next slide, please. So here we have a kind of three-way division of what's needed in retirement. Ideally, 
I would have liked to have captured in this diagram mature workforce conditions as well. Someone was saying this morning, I think it may have been John Wong, that we need job redesign. We need to be able to continue with people in the workforce for longer. I was unable to put that into this chart. Nevertheless, this chart covers what happens once you retire, and it's the best I can do for now. So you can see along that needs axis, right, there's three components, the retirement income system, the health care system, the long-term care system. Next slide, please. And then you look at coverage. So those three systems have components. So long-term care can be home care, institutional care. Healthcare system can be primary or medicine or hospital. The retirement income system can be poverty alleviation or income replacement. But then you've got to look at who's covered. And the coverage is extremely heterogeneous, even within a single country. The informal sector is treated differently from the formal sector. And sometimes the civil servants get the best access of all. Rural and urban look very different. Poor and rich look very different. And sometimes women and men look very different as well. And that heterogeneity has to be made more homogeneous as a piece of reform as we move forward to give everyone more equal opportunity in uh, their expectations around resource into retirement. And then that third axis level, next slide please, really refers to how this is going to be resourced. So at the top there, there is just yourself and your family, and then perhaps community. So for example, in Vietnam, you have community arrangements for aged care. And then finally, the public sector and taxation. So they're the different levels of support. And as countries become richer, governments get more and more involved in this. And that involvement has to be informed. And I think much of what is in the report that we are discussing and launching today would inform well-designed public support. We've touched on two or three items already, right, where that, that link would occur, but it would, it would repay close study so that that public involvement as it develops, as it becomes entrenched in a country's public policy framework is well-informed and well-designed. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, I need one more slide after that. Okay, so this slide is a 2010 slide, right, which looks at uh, resources and support. So this was from the WHO, <clears throat> and it looks how looks at how um, uh, out of pocket expenses. Um, are, are ranked. And you can see that out-of-pocket expenditures are still really quite important as a proportion of overall health expenditures. Um, there's some support from tax and some support from social insurance, and they're indicated in those um, uh, columns. Um, but the red is out-of-pocket, and there is a lot of it. And that could be fixed, I think, as well. Next slide, please. And why I say it can be fixed as well is this. So what we've tried to do in, in this slide is to look at what the GDP per capita is of some of these Asian economies, Asian countries, and compare that with the GDP per capita which prevailed using purchasing power parity when those countries introduced universal health care or social security and welfare in the case of the US. Now this chart only goes up to 2010, it's a little bit old, but it shows that already there are a number of countries which where GDP per capita is rising above the levels of GDP per capita at which these now developed countries introduced universal health care. So I was saying this morning um, that it would be possible to introduce a social pension, it's fiscally affordable to introduce an adequate social pension. And I gave some examples from China. Right? Here I'm saying 
that if you do this comparison between the now developed world and when they first introduced universal health care, right, these countries of Asia are now ready to introduce universal health care. That big red blob of out-of-pocket expenses could be substantially reduced, and that would be an affordable fiscal, a fiscally affordable strategy. So in doing these three things, I think that would be a bedrock upon which so much more could be built in terms of builder engagement and involvement in society generally, and would be a stepping stone toward active, healthy longevity. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Bigger. Next, we have a panel discussion on population health, healthcare, science, and technology. Moderating the discussion, we have Professor Tan Cho Chuan. Professor Tan is the Chief Health Scientist at Singapore's Ministry of Health and Executive Director of MOH Office for Healthcare Transformation. On the panel, we have Professor John Beard from the Australian Research Council's Center for Excellence in Population Aging Research at the University of New South Wales. We also have Professor Guan Chen Tai. He is a President's Chair Professor in Computer Science and Engineering at Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, as well as the Director of the Artificial Intelligence Research Institute and co-director of the S Lab for Advanced Intelligence, which are both based in the university. We also have Professor Brian Kennedy. He is a distinguished professor in biochemistry and physiology at the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine at National University of Singapore and serves as the director of the Center for Healthy Longevity at the National University Health System as well as the Healthy Longevity Trans, 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 sorry, Translational Research Program. And online with us is Professor Hiroki Nakatani from Keio University. Professor Tan, please. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome back from lunch. We have uh, arranged a very special treat for you uh, by assembling a really stellar group of uh, panelists who will uh, address uh, some really important questions that relate to health, healthcare, science and technology, and its relevance to healthy longevity. We'll uh, first hear uh, uh, comments from our uh, distinguished panelists, and then uh, we look forward really to your comments and questions from the audience, both online and offline. So I'll start first with uh, Dr. Nakatani. Uh, thanks, uh, Hiro, for <laughs> uh, calling in uh, from Tokyo. And I wanted to ask you, Hiro, in your uh, remarks this morning, you uh, spoke about how many countries in Asia uh, are aging rapidly but don't see it as a particularly pressing problem. We also know that uh, health disparities are a very major and unaddressed challenge that uh, we have to address as we seek to improve overall health span. So Hiro, why do you think countries need to act now despite the many health priorities that they have already? And how could we better address health disparities in rapidly aging populations in Asia? You, thank you, Pro thank you, Professor Tan, to uh, pose me a very um, a hard questions, and that you usually do for me. Uh, I, I will try my best, and uh, I uh, um, uh, prepared some slides, but I changed at the last minute because I heard that your uh, DPM said that um, silver tsunami is not a good word. So my first slide was uh, silver tsunami, so I changed my slide. <laughs> so let me show the slide uh, to. To yeah, share. It was a Hokusai uh, tsunami. Yes. Is it? You, you can see the slide? Not yet. 
You can see the slide. How, how is it? You can see the slide? Oh, seems uh, now working. Ah, okay, yeah, we can see now, Hiro. Okay, good. So, let me start. I think um, what um, uh, you, you posed some um, question, why do countries need to act now? But I think um, really hard question is that how we could maximize health span and reduce time spent in ill health and disability? What challenges are required? And sub-component of uh, this big question is why do country needs to act now? But uh, uh, let them um, uh, digest, uh, I may mean, uh, analyze why countries uh, uh, matter aging as challenge and opportunity, but why some countries' uh, is awareness is low. And that brings to the second question, why do countries need to act now? And then uh, why health disparities matter? and how we can better address them in Asia. So I think I would uh, uh, pose myself a little bit uh, more questions, uh, expanding from uh, uh, Professor Tan's uh, original question of uh, why uh, do countries need to act now? Let's see some uh, funny um, geographics. So that is a uh, maps. That is, um, is the size of the country reflects a um, number of uh, persons over 100 years of, of age in 2015. Japan and India and Vietnam are, are big players in, um, in Centurion's Club. Uh, but I think um, other side of story, uh, this is uh, actually what to be a uh, reality we face. There. So uh, for us, uh, aging is very serious, serious problem or not problem, but the challenges and opportunities. But the uh, other side of the coin in um, population dynamics is that, um, well, low fatalities uh, as consequent of uh, age, age society, uh, number of children is declining. So population decline is coming. So um, for the next uh, 30 years or so, I think the population decline is sharply observed in Japan and China and Taiwan. And then some of our Asian countries population decline uh, doesn't exist. So. This reflects uh, the sensitivity of um, population issues, aging or small uh, number of children. And th this is slide which I showed um, um, in the morning. The speed of aging is different um, or valid. Japan took uh, 24 years um, between uh, population of senior citizens over 65 exceeds 7% to 14% we took uh, 24 years. Singapore uh, took 70 years. And um, uh, Republic Korea, 80 years. And China, 24 years, I think. Uh, yes, 23 years. Uh, so I think major continental countries, um, populations are aging is something like 20 uh, years or 25 years. Contrary, in the Asia, island nations such as Fiji, Samoa, and Solomon Island, Vanuatu, uh, these countries, it took, um, uh, it will take um, uh, 40 years. So that is another uh, difference, creation of difference of sensitivity about aging. And also current issue is concerned. This is a change of life expectancy at birth in a variety of countries. Uh, LET is, um, is um, life extension uh, caused by alleviation of infectious diseases. That is LET part. And this blue part is uh, non-communicable diseases. So if you look at India uh, from 1990 to 2015, two years again was observed in life expectancy at, at birth, but most of them are generated by control or better control of communicable disease. So I think it's a quite natural communicable disease is a major focus of public health and medical attentions. Same apply to Indonesia. But the um, uh, other side of, uh, of this uh, figure is that India and Indonesia, a remarkable gain was observed in non-communicable com disease control. So then left part is non-communicable disease control. So that is coming, future issue, if we look at the, uh, for the future. And already in many countries in Asia, uh, like uh, China and the Korea, Japan, 
So major uh, it, uh, mortality comes from non-communicable disease. We need to, to address. But uh, so this is some um, is, um, discrepancy of how some countries are sensitive, but some countries are not too sensitive at this time about our uh, aging challenges. But, um, uh, and though some countries feel that, well, aging is a matter of other 40 years. Island country may, may claim so. Uh, but um, a change in shift of um, our health system, public health systems and social systems takes time. So that is the slide which I showed you uh, in, in the morning, but I think this arrow was a little bit um, uh, funny uh, located. So that is a proper one. So Japan um, has introduced uh, universal health coverage and uh, universal coverage of pension in 1961. And then it took 40 years we come to, uh, to bring or add long-term healthcare, long-term care insurance in 2000, 40 years. And then after um, another 10 years, so we are quite busy in looking at social security as a package a pension and health and long-term care and also tax at the same time. So that is, uh, we need to look at uh, continuously uh, or uh, change uh, continuously our system. So that is long journey is needed. Uh, but um, countries cannot um, uh, wait until the last minutes. Oh, population is getting old. So we need to do something. So that is not possible. We need to uh, have long visions. And from the future, we will come back to see what we need to do at this time. So consequence is, uh, or as a result, Japan <laughs> developed a quite complicated system uh, to, um, to look at uh, placing uh, users or patient in the uh, center. And the municipality is coordinating welfare and uh, um, health services for senior citizens and um, home visit service can be provided by clinics and sometimes institutions like hospitals, um, they are occasionally admitted and then return to hospital, some uh, return to home, then home uh, visit care can be provided by either hospital or clinic and also home visit nursing center and others. So these are quite complicated system, but uh, coordination is a uh, key and that is a, uh, usually done by municipality office. But I think this is always um, is, is, uh, evolving. And sometimes um, is, um, is, um, nursing care uh, center is now, uh, is, um, is, um, is, um, uh, is offering child care at the same time. And the, and the primary school, which um, uh, taught many, many students uh, when population is growing, is now turning to community senior citizen center. So that is very interesting uh, development is always happens. But I think this change requires some resources. And if we compare uh, uh, some countries, um, uh, high income countries and Asian nations, Asian nations uh, health resources is still uh, not um, uh, sufficient and healthcare cost is relatively small. I think that is the government needs to invest for health and welfare for senior citizens and also entire population. And then I think um, uh, universal access or universalism is sometimes is not sufficient. Uh, that is, I think, reflecting the nature of diseases. Used to be, it was uh, rather clear, health, healthy or disease is a very uh, distinctly um, distinguished by single instance typically uh, infection, typically can accident. So if uh, infected, become ill. If it's cured, it's becoming healthy. But now uh, many diseases is, uh, is healthy and poor health is something like graduation. There is, there is in the middle. Sometimes like me, if I eat um, a very delicious Chinese food, my cholesterol level is uh, elevated, so poor side. And if I behave well, exercise well, and eating vegetable more, we, I'm coming to healthier side. And these are influenced by health behavior, genetic factors, environment and social determinants of health. So multiple factors are involved. 
I think this is, is perhaps uh, important uh, things to consider for senior citizens. Uh, Japan has um, is, uh, achieved universal health coverage, but still a lot of problem. In the morning, uh, uh, Flora asks that social determinants and others issue in, in the context of uh, diabetes. Uh, left side is, um, is winner of public announcement awards 2013. That is Adachi Ward, uh, one part of Tokyo's uh, uh, public information from municipality office, saying that why health span of Adachi Ward is two years shorter than average Tokyo citizens. So uh, that is Adachi Ward is, is, um, is uh, acknowledging uh, their shorter lifespan. And then in the city of Osaka, a second largest city of Tokyo, both men and women, life expectancy is shorter. And also uh, healthy lung, uh, uh, life expectancy is uh, also shorter. So that is a very much problem. So they acknowledge it and they are trying to tackle. And this is a picture and the life expectancy of a male in Japan. Black side is bad and blue side is good. So usually I think uh, metropolitan areas is uh, uh, fairly well, uh, but the rural area is poor. But if some um, um, map is transformed reflecting population size, so is like this funny picture. So uh, this um, uh, northern part uh, is, is still life expectancy low that it is visible, uh, but uh, here in metropolitan area, there's a black spots, quite large black spot in Osaka area as well, which means uh, life expectancy is very much lower. So in, in urban uh, issues, that is disparities and inequity exist in Japan where universal health coverage we accept and we have exercised for 50, more than 50 years. So in conclusion, uh, we aim to uh, realize person-centered service for senior citizens by integrating public health, medical care, social services, and long-term care by 2050. That this roadmap report is, 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 is stressing. But this journey requires system thinking and future back approach over many years. We need whole society approach, but governments individually and collectively. Individually means each countries and collectively as sort of, of um, un under WHO or uh, ASEAN uh, should play an important role as uh, innovator, uh, investor and rule maker for new systems. Without these efforts, uh, alleviation of health disparities is not possible. I conclude here. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much, Euro. Uh, terrific comments. I wonder if I can move to you, John, and ask you to share your thoughts on uh, two points that uh, Hero had raised in his remarks. The first is, as he pointed out, in many countries, communicable diseases are more or less generally coming under control, but non-communicable diseases are not, and they have a huge potential to cause illness, ill health, and disability. So, what do you think is the potential? for preventative health strategies and how, what are the things we could do in Asia to realize that potential? And the second point that Hiro raised uh, was uh, the very interesting need to adapt, to cater for those who, despite our best wishes, still develop ill health and disability. I mean, what, how should we in Asia start to think about how we can really do much better in catering for those who, in whom we can't prevent ill health and disability, despite our best efforts. So, can yeah. you just comment on that? I, I think these are really critical issues. It doesn't matter where you live, the overwhelming causes these days of morbidity and mortality in the second half of life are non-communicable diseases, uh, particularly heart disease, uh, cerebrovascular disease, and uh, and respiratory disease and cancer. And we know that to a certain extent, those conditions are preventable and we should be investing much more in 
preventing their arrival. Uh, and you know, we, we know most of the things which uh, the, the, the messages we need to be getting out there um, to encourage people to undertake the behaviours which will help re reduce the incidence of those conditions. So uh, focusing on, on physical activity, on nutrition, uh, no smoking and, and, and so on. Um, but health, as, as Hero also raised, is more than just the absence of disease. Uh, if you ask an older person, and most, most people over the age of 65 have multiple NCDs, many of them will report being that they're healthy. Many of them won't. And the difference is the impact those conditions are having on their functioning, on their capacity. Uh, and that's where we need to be thinking about the uh, provision of chronic care, uh, how we can how we can provide much more integrated and 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 better directed care that minimizes the consequences. So we, we don't just need to to focus on the prevention of the disease. We has also have to focus on the prevention of the declines, which are often associated with with disease later in life. Um, and that's where we we also need to be start thinking about the the health system. So we need to invest much more heavily in public health. And, and the, the prevention activities, the prevention of disease activities, but we also need to be restructuring health systems with a much bigger focus on primary care uh, and trying to understand how we can personalize that care. Because I think something we, we haven't emphasized enough so far today is the heterogeneity of the experience of older age. Um, and uh, the, 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 there's incredible vast difference between the experience of one 70-year-old and another 70-year-old. Uh, and as we mentioned this morning, a lot of that comes down to the impact of the cumulative impact of disadvantage across people's lives that increases the, the risk of developing conditions. It also undermines their likelihood that they will seek help for those conditions. And it also means often they don't have the resources which are required to do what's necessary to, to address them. So we need to be thinking about reframing the health system in a way that can much better undertake those secondary prevention activities. Um, I think we, we also need to understand that messaging isn't the same across the life course. Um, whether you respond better to positive messaging or, or negative messaging in terms of trying to encourage you to do what's good for you is very different. Older people respond much better to positive messaging than, than younger people. Younger people you have to scare, but older people you need to encourage. So we need to <laughs> tailor the public health interventions for the population we're focusing on at, at, uh, at any point in time. Um, and uh, I, I think... Oh, no, and then I, I think one of the other things in the, the systems we currently have in place, if you have a fee-for-service system, um, what that by definition leads to is people responding to problems. What we need to do is develop new systems which enable us to actually follow, think about people holistically, think about their, the course of their health, and think about the investments we need to be making now to prevent the consequences of either their behaviours or the development of conditions like diabetes and so on. So I think, yes, we need to prevent things much, much more, um, a much greater focus in, on public health and, and primary prevention, but also we need to reframe the... Um, uh, the health system and the services we provide to have a greater focus on primary care. Now that's where I think your, your second question in terms of Asia becomes interesting because there aren't many developed Western countries which do that right. You know, there, there are some which do a pretty good job, the Scandinavian countries, some, some, some countries in, in Europe. But, but mo many developed countries have entrenched systems, fee-for-service systems which are service-driven and are very resistant to change. It, um, we need to change them, but, but that we have in, entrenched professions which will push back. In Asia, it's not the case in many instances. In many of those countries that Hero had up on the map, uh, or John Pickett had up uh, on his slides, they're developing new systems. And now is the opportunity for them to be thinking about what are the systems they're going to be putting in place and not to replicate the systems we know no longer work in the West. And so that's where I think looking at primary care, how you can provide it, thinking beyond it just being provided by one clinician, 
and thinking much more of a community-based approach. As I mentioned this morning, I think the, the idea of involving groups like older people's associations and trying to find an integration between older people's associations and, and, and health services, and, and, and there will be other models. But Asia has the opportunity to develop new models, not to rely on what, what, what's already happened and prove not to work in other places. Yeah, John, I think that's a very powerful message that uh, we should attempt to innovate or even to leapfrog. And, and not just go along more traditionally explored routes. Maybe I can move now to Brian. And uh, Brian, some experts say, well, very good, you know, treat NCDs, try to prevent problems from occurring from them, but we are still dealing with manifestations of a deeper problem or a deeper set of issues, which is the fundamental process of aging, and that we should really be tackling the aging process as opposed to these manifestations. What would you say is the potential for modifying the aging process, the, the biology of aging itself, with a view to extending healthy longevity? And do you think that there are significant differences between the aging process or what we can do in Asians as opposed to Caucasian populations? Uh, well, thanks for those questions. Uh, a lot to answer there. Um, I, I guess I wouldn't be in my career if my answer to the first question wasn't yes. <laughs> um, I think that you know when when I started doing aging research, uh, base, basic biology of aging, I'm a little bit out of place. Uh, we were trying to ask some very simple questions. This was around 1990. You know, what causes aging? What are the mechanistic determinants that drive aging? And most of this was done in poking and prodding various uh, animal models. Uh, mice, but, but even then it was more prominent in worms and flies and yeast cells. And I remember we published a paper in 1994 saying that there was a genetic mutation in the sirtuin complex that extended lifespan in yeast. Um, and that was a big deal at the time because it was one of the few mutations that could extend lifespan anywhere in any organism. Um, I don't think many of us were thinking about human aging or how to slow that down very much at that time. I think the questions are much more basic. Uh, but a combination of technologies has really accelerated this field. Uh, the first, a lot of it being advances in early on in genetics, molecular biology, but then high throughput came in. And so it was possible to screen you know, many different genes at the same time in many different species. Uh, and more recently, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, large human data sets to, to analyze have really changed the, the biology of aging. And so I think what we're seeing now is that the questions we're trying to ask in the basic sciences are merging into the same questions that people have been thinking about with gerontology and geriatrics and even social sciences. And so uh, one thing I take away from this meeting and, and the report is that really uh, we're at that point now where we need a holistic strategy where people are talking to each other and trying to tackle problems in ways that make sense on a broader level, not just for their narrow area of science. And so what are the questions at this point uh, in the uh, biology of aging? And I, and, and I think they're what you just brought up. Is it possible uh, to slow the rate of aging? Can we reverse the rate of aging? How, how far can we go? Uh, what kinds of interventions are going to be necessary to do that? How do we validate those interventions in humans? Uh, if you're a mouse, we don't need to have a report. We already know what to do. You're in good shape. But most of us aren't. And so we need to take that knowledge that we have and translate it. And it's pretty easy to measure aging in a mouse. You wait till they die. Uh, but it's not so easy to measure aging in humans. Uh, we don't want to do a 50-year experiment. Uh, so uh, I think the fundamental changes that have happened in the last five years are now we have a, a wealth of potential interventions to slow or even reverse aspects of human aging. We don't know which ones work yet, but there are a huge list of candidates. Uh, a second major change based on uh, largely on large data and AI is there are a number of new candidate biomarkers for aging. And one of the common things in the language now is that you have a chronologic age, which is your passport, and a biologic age, which is the rate that you're really aging at. And we all know that people age at different rates. Uh, and so now we have strategies to measure biologic age. I don't think any of them are validated completely, 
but they're far enough along to be used in research and clinical studies. And this raises the possibility, and really what our goal at the Center for Healthy Longevity is, is to take multiple kinds of interventions, uh, implement them in people that are still mostly healthy in middle age, and use biomarkers as readouts to figure out which interventions are slowing or reversing aspects of the aging process. So I think, what do we know at this point? Um, most of the intervention, uh, first of all, we know that lifestyle works. I think it's safe to say that. Um, and I think m much of the effect of lifestyle is correcting the problems people have that are shortening their lifespan. So I think of aging as a sliding register, not as a fixed process. So it's possible to extend it, but through bad lifestyle choices, it's possible to accelerate aging as well. You mentioned smoking, that's a very good example. Uh, obesity, uh, eating an American diet, um, you know, not managing our sleep by keeping lights on all night. All these things, I think, are accelerating aspects of our aging. And making correct lifestyle choices um, can reverse that process. Uh, and so that's the first step, and it's part of what we're studying is to how do we how do we validate which lifestyle interventions are working along those contexts? I think that's becoming almost more of an implementation science. Uh, is that we can more or less tell people what to do, uh, but how do we get the, the large percentage of the population to adapt to those changes? I think a second thing and something we're very focused on are small molecules, drugs, natural products, maybe down the road, stem cells, gene therapy, what's possible on that end to try to alter aging. Uh, and I think that from the early data, it suggests that a number of interventions, mostly supplements at this point, can reverse biologic aging by a small amount. Um, we don't know if you stop taking them, do you, does that go away? <laughs> There's a many questions we don't know the answers to, and we need to re really rapidly accelerate these studies. Uh, my best guess is that it's going to be feasible to extend healthy life expectancy by five to 10 years using interventions that are already proposed. Um, whether we can break a maximum lifespan barrier and get to 150 or 200 or numbers that other people have proposed, I think is still a, a, an open question. And that's more at the early stage of research. We may need completely different kinds of interventions if we even want to do that kind of thing. But I think for the purposes of today, you saw the slide that life expectancy is going up faster than healthy life expectancy. Uh, that to me is the most important slide uh, from a biologic perspective. And it's partly because we're trying to treat diseases rather than treat the, the, the causal factors driving those diseases. And I would argue we're already treating aging in a way. If we reduce blood pressure, if we reduce hyperglycemia, those are risk factors at the, inter at the interface between disease and aging. We're impacting aging by doing that as well. And so I think if we target even more on those basic concepts of aging, we'll have an even bigger impact. So at its core, I think it's a preventative approach that we're taking with the biology. And it's really about how do we intervene in people before they get to a late stage disease and keep them from getting sick and maintain their functional capacity as long as possible. And that's really the goal. Um, you know, I think that coming back to the question of Asian populations, uh, there's still a lot of research to be done. Uh, we're doing a study right now with the National Precision Medicine team looking at biologic aging markers uh, across Singapore in Chinese, Malay, and Indian populations. And I can't comment on the results of that yet, or people might kill me, but uh, the, there are going to be differences. <laughs> and I think that uh, we, these uh, ethnicities here in Singapore, especially Malay and Indian, are underrepresented in aging studies. Uh, we need to really understand this population in much more detail if we want to develop uh, strategic interventions that are targeted to Singapore. So uh, it's critical that we continue these longitudinal studies and expand them beyond just Chinese population to look at Malay and Indian uh, in this region. Uh, I think there'll be a lot of commonalities in how people age. But I've already said that, li and we've all said that lifestyle impacts the aging process dramatically. And we know that different ethnicities have different lifestyles. So it's clear that there's gonna be different impacts on, on aging from that. Uh, I, there are also similarities with the genetics of longevity, but there are also differences with ethnicity. So 
Uh, I don't think that's been explored nearly enough. So I think we need to move in parallel at this point to test interventions, do it in a way that we can move to the next step into the community and, and maybe even change health policy. Uh, so that means cost-effective interventions and cost-effective biomarkers to measure whether they work. Uh, and then we need to have a much better understanding of personalized aging, not only how everybody ages the same, but how they age differently, and ethnicity is going to play a really big role in that, as well as sex. So I think there's a lot to do still. <laughs> uh, John? Yeah, I was just going to add, I think this idea of personalized care is really overlooked. And um, because some interventions are likely to work with some people and some interventions are likely to be better in other people. And we need to be able to tease that out and to focus our efforts in the right place. Uh, absolutely. Well, uh, uh, Brian, I know a lot of people are hoping your work will go even faster. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to turn to Professor Guan because we've not actually spoken a lot about technology. Uh, the use of uh, data in artificial intelligence uh, in, um, and its role in uh, healthy longevity. So I wanted to ask you, uh, what do you thought? Uh, we hear and read a lot about the transformative impact that technology is going to make on the process of aging, on helping older people, particularly wearables, digital health technologies, and so on. But... Uh, Yet, uh, and, and we also see the many, many challenges that we face, but yet we don't really see really many at scale examples of uh, technology in action and effective. So a question for you is, uh, what do we need to do to develop technology solutions that can effectively address the most uh, pressing challenges on the ground? And what can we do to scale these um, to a degree that they will really move the needle? <coughs> Thanks, uh, Prof. Tan. This is a huge question, <laughs> but it's a worth discussion at th this forum. I think uh, we have uh, witnessed a lot of uh, applications, AI for medicine, in some area which actually achieve close to human performance, something even better. For instance, uh, I think genomics is one, it's big data. Right? Whenever we have a big data, the AI will probably do better than our, you know, human work. Uh, especially, uh, you have a multi source of data from different mortality. That is really complicated. So, uh, and uh, one example, also uh, AI make impact in in the hospital environment is the imaging, right? Imaging is a huge, uh, rich information there. So it's very difficult for people take a long time, take a long time to do it. So uh, AI can do faster and then probably more accurate. However, I think the, the impact of AI uh, probably will be, um, be seen even bigger in another area to uh, make a paradigm shift from hospital to community. That's especially for aging for you know, uh, human health. Uh, not only make it um, uh, more, uh, you know, reach to more population, and also AI can help to come up with a personalized, actually, uh, Brian just mentioned, we have uh, something which is tailored to individual uh, people that will probably uh, help improve the, the outcome eventually. And uh, even further with the variables, uh, now variables, there's a lot of sensors at home, motion sensors, uh, you know, sleep sensors, variable sensors, we have uh, glucose monitoring, blood pressure, although the technology still need to improve over time, but there are uh, things which can work uh, certain, uh, in certain environment. So this actually can help to uh, go uh, extend healthcare to uh, wellness. Okay. So eventually, uh, I think the the wish is to from intervention to prevention. So nobody want to uh, come to you know see doctors anyway <laughs> to to get a treatment or you know do this. But uh, if we can prevent, at least delay. Uh, certain diseases like uh, dementia or Alzheimer's, uh, so far still, the cure is still uh, very uh, difficult, very challenging, but uh, we, there are evidence if you can uh, identify at the early stage, uh, we call either physical frailty or cognitive frailty, then and hopefully provide certain intervention, which is non-medical intervention. In many cases, actually, uh, people use uh, gam gamification, uh, some other in feedback. So uh, one example is at the NTU, we have this Lily uh, Research Center. We focus on aging, uh, only on AI for 
we call ageless aging for the last decade. Actually, they are, um, we developed various applications from all the way from early diagnosis, uh, detection for dementia, uh, and for intervention use uh, game for people with uh, stroke, with cognitive uh, impairment to try to, try to uh, improve. Uh, as Prof Dan said, uh, there are a lot of efforts uh, in many countries in, uh, across the world develop various applications. However, the mainstream, I mean the large scale use, still not many. Uh, still, that's the, that's the biggest uh, uh, thing, I think, for the entire uh, research industry. We need to have a private and a government and a hospital work together. So maybe I just uh, give a few thoughts on why, uh, what we need to do to scale up. That could be the big thing we need to do in the future. I think uh, we'll probably look at a few layers uh, still, uh, from a technology perspective, uh, not all the sensors, especially wearable sensors, can reach the level uh, we can have high quality data, which is trust trustworthy, for for use the health knowledge to make diagnosis. Uh, but this actually uh, keep improving. Uh, Apple Watch has improved a lot on the measurement of the vital sign, and there are also continuous glucose monitoring. Although it's a semi invasive, you can put on your arm. To monitor over time, so those actually uh, provide uh, higher quality data for us to monitor or make diagnosis. Especially for diagnosis, is more critical. We need to make sure make decision right. So uh, there are uh, new sensors. Just a few weeks, actually, there's a news you can see. MIT come out with this uh, uh, ultrasound array, this size, this very small size. It can provide you clear picture, even video of your heart. That is never seen. You know, you cannot. You can use that to do continuous monitoring at home. That will change because you don't need to stay in the hospital to do a CT, do MRI. So that give you more information for doctors, for caregivers to to, to take care of. So these are the examples. I think for technology perspective, even AI algorithms. Oftentimes, people criticize deep learning. It's a black box. Okay, you tell me the decision, but don't tell me why. So that is the part uh, uh, we need the. Uh, not completely solved, but there's some progress in this area. So we know in the, in the old days, we have a decision tree, right? Decision tree is very clear. If you come to here because of this, you belong to left or belong to right, that this tree will grow. So it's very easy to explain, not, uh, not only to the patients, or to the, also to the uh, uh, clinicians, how the decision is made. And uh, deep learning is everything, you know, uh, connections within the network, very sophisticated. But there is one progress, people combine these two. So that's the beauty of uh, you know, the technology progress. Be decision tree provide a clear explanation, but the less lower accuracy. However, however, deep learning provide very high precision, especially for uh, imaging diagnosis, but it cannot be explained so well. So people combine them. They call neural-backed decision tree. That's something Keep, keep growing. So that's one aspect. I think technology still, uh, al although we see a lot of uh, good uh, uh, I mean, trials or experiment, but uh, come to the deployment, that part still need to be further improved. A second part would be the data, data part. Uh, data is the key, uh, is involving uh, privacy, also the you know, uh, security of the data, and uh, quality data, right? You need to have data you can trust when you collect not in the hospital area, not controlled environment, at home or in the community. So that's another thing. But more challenging, probably another thing, is how do you integrate those data with the uh, hospital data? Those are the you know, EHR data. So you can make decisions because a lot of things actually being well studied, well done, and well uh, diagnosis. How do we combine these two together? So this also need to change the, probably the organization itself, the workflow. And, and so on. So these are the things beyond technology, but it's probably uh, to eventually make technology be deployed in a larger scale. Uh, just a point, a few things for discussion. Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Juntai. I, I think at this stage now, I would like to open up uh, to uh, any questions uh, from the audience. Uh, just please put up your hands and uh, somebody will come up with a microphone. While we're waiting, can yes, I ask go ahead. Brian a question? Because I, I are you allowed to ask questions? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> um, wh wh 
one of my, I, I, I really buy what you're getting. Oh, I, I really get what you're, what you're selling. <laughs> and I'll buy it. But, but one of the things that worries me about the geroscience agenda is the focus is very much on the second part of what you were talking about, identifying a magic pill that will prolong life and allow us all to live for as long as we, we want. I, whereas there's much less research being done on the first part of what you were talking about, and I was really pleased to hear about it, and that is how behavioural interventions might also operate. And let, let me give you an example and, and then ask for your response. So we know that um, physical activity is good. Everybody should be physically active. But as you get into older age, the sort of physical activity you need to do needs to change you actually should be focusing much more on uh, resistance training and ways of building muscle mass and balance and things like that. And um, why? I've always thought, well, that helps you keep enough muscle so you can keep your locomotor function. But in fact, there's probably other ways that that operates because muscles actually are anti-inflammatory. Uh, and central obesity is pro-inflammatory. And so by doing exercise, you're actually changing that inflammatory balance, which is a key geroscience sort of mechanism. But I don't hear people talking about that. You know? And I, I'm just wondering, are you alone or is, is there a body of work now happening out there that's starting to think much more about the, the behavioral interventions which might we, we can focus on, and then thinking about personalizing the advice we give people because we would be able to understand that for you or for you, that perhaps it's really important high intensity physical activity will, will have this impact, whereas for you and for you it'll be, it'll be different. It, it, what's the research going on out there at the moment? I, th I think there's certainly a body of work in this area. Uh, and. Uh, I think you've identified many of the key questions. And, and one of the things I, I think about exercise and muscle is that it's, it's so comp compensatory. You know, it compensates for balance issues neurologically. It compensates for uh, metabolic problems. The more muscle you have, the better you burn glucose. And so uh, I think there's lots of reasons you can point to for exercise being beneficial as we get older and we have different challenges. Uh, but there hasn't been a lot of work to try to personalize that. And I still hear scientists who work on muscle biology arguing for endurance exercise versus resistance training, but they're not talking enough about personal needs of the individual based on age and their health status. So uh, we have a small, very small study going on with uh, Jormin Go, uh, who works in our group, and Dean Ho, where we're trying to take sedentary people at different ages uh, put them through one-week exercise regimes, measure a bunch of stuff, and then use AI to try to optimize the particular exercise for that person. Uh, it's so it's very small, and so whether it's powered enough, I don't know. But I think it's a start. It's a pilot to really begin to understand that. And I think you can make the same arguments about uh, diet. Um, you you go out and buy health books for aging. You'll get. Everything from milkshake diet to keto diet to you know high carb low protein to vegan, and uh, there's not a lot of consensus on that. And probably there's a lot more personalization there that we're really looking at right now. So um, yeah, I think a lot a lot could be done there. We generally know these things are good for you, but optimizing them is not being done well at this point. Well, thanks, Brian. Uh, if you uh, ever have physician exercise prescription, don't let your spouse be in charge of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll have Christopher Chen first. Uh, please, Thanks Chris. so much, Chow Chuan. Um, I, I just want to take on what uh, that lovely phrase that Professor Beard used, that you uh, have to scare the young but encourage the elderly. Uh, because uh, we were discussing aging and anti uh, well, uh, lifestyle uh, changes to prevent aging with a distinguished colleague who told me the story of how he went to see his GP and said, you know, tell me how I'm going to live to 100. And the GP said, you know, do you like eating rich food? And he said, yes. Do you like um, drinking wine? He said, yes. Uh, do you like sort of being a slob? Yes. Then he said, well, you're not going to enjoy reaching 100. <laughs> so uh, seriously, you know, how do we encourage people? Because what we are telling folk is that we have to live like saints in order to go and live longer. Is there any sort of behavioral way, any way that we can use 
um, data to go and nudge people into sort of be uh, living well and living longer and living happily. Uh, let's uh, let's take a couple of questions at a time uh, to speed up. So uh, I think Dr. Soin, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, Jeff. Since uh, the mic is here, yeah. uh, I want to ask: uh, in Asia, most of the older population is going to be women because of the feminization of aging, and I haven't heard enough about how women, f you know, factor into this whole issue. That's one. The second thing is to address, uh, look at uh, Professor Brian uh, Kennedy's thing. I mean, I applaud the work that's being done in to slow down aging and even hopefully reverse aging. But is it not going to make inequity between the, the poorer old and the richer old much worse? And how are we, what is going to be the challenge to overcome this? Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so maybe you have uh, uh, John, Brian, and then uh, Hero, you can talk about inequity. John? Okay. Um, first of all, I think in, in terms of the question, how do you convince people to act? We're not asking them to be saints. You know? and, but I think at a deeper level, what we're trying to do is get people to reframe the second half of life to understand that people are living a lot longer and what's the quality of those extra years that they're going to have and to understand that there are things that they can do which will have a direct impact on that. But I don't think we communicate that very clearly and I don't think we actually have the evidence as clear as we need either. So I think, first of all, building the, the evidence and then getting people to shift these ageist perspectives that once you hit a certain chronological age, 60, 65, you're an old person, and an old person equals this. There is no such thing as an old person. Life is a continuum, and for all of us, it's a very diverse experience, and we need to break down those stereotypes to get people to understand that they can influence where they will be on that continuum. Um, I, I think that's the, the first step. The rest, the rest is not easy, but uh, it's not about being a saint. It's just about living a, a much more healthy lifestyle. Brian? Let me uh, come back to a couple of issues you brought up uh, on the inequity, first of all. Uh, you know, I think that medical tech interventions uh, and new therapies often, at the initial phases, enhance inequities. Uh, and then it's, it takes a long time to balance that back out or try to balance that back out. I think we need to be aware of that here when we're talking about healthy longevity. And I, I've used the phrase that, you know, it's not for billionaires, it's for billions. Uh, and because I think we have to have strategies that are accessible. So uh, that's one of the reasons we're focusing our research on low-cost interventions and low-cost diagnostics to measure aging and trying to think hard, in part with uh, John Wong and the uh, health district about how can we take things and scale them to the community rapidly in Singapore. I, I think that what we really need here is a, a life course approach to healthy longevity where people and kids you know, in school need to be better educated on what healthy lifestyle is, how to do it, and that needs to be emphasized in addition to spending all night studying so that we can get more balance in kids as they're growing up and so that they're better prepared to live healthy longer. As people reach middle age, we should probably be measuring biologic age at a population level, identifying people that are biologically older and at risk, and thinking about interventions in that group, regardless of their socioeconomic status, um, uh, to try to reduce their biologic age and extend their health span. And then, of course, when people get sick, they need to, uh, geriatricians, they need specialists to manage their disease. Uh, this is really something that a government needs to solve. Uh, if you let, I work with private companies and I think some of what they, they're doing is great, but a lot of them are developing very high cost st stem cell based strategies, for instance, that are at least initially going to cost $100,000 a treatment to slow aging. And uh, that's great from a research perspective, but it's going to, that's the kind of thing that's going to enhance the inequities. So we need to be thinking progressively about these changes before they're happening and developing policy that allows access to them. Uh, so that, we, and I think if we do that, we'll diminish the inequities. But but it's a, the challenge is staying ahead of the game rather than chasing the game, which is what often happens with with technology development. Thanks, Hero. Uh, you want to take the question on women in healthy longevity? 
I always ask you the simplest questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I was muted. Um, I think that a woman's uh, life expectancy is long. And also, I think uh, in many countries in Asia, I think usually uh, women get married with, um, with a, a little bit senior uh, a man. So I think uh, even more long life, I think 15 years or 20 years after a losing husband is quite common. So I think uh, uh, um, aging policies is really a need to address the need of women. That is, I think we need to design um, 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 uh, aging policies and emphasizing the need of women. That's one point. And taking opportunities, I'd like to um, make uh, two points uh, with regards to 100 years issues and also inequity among uh, anti-aging, among poor and uh, uh, rich. Uh, with regards to 100 years, uh, KO has um, as a cohort about 70,000 uh, persons over 100 years uh, old. Used, used to be our doctors uh, um, uh, visiting uh, over 100 years person all over Jap Japan. But it's now, it's very difficult because the number of, of, of population is aging 100 is uh, mushrooming. So we are focusing uh, super centurions defined by 110, but still it's quite uh, 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 handful. But I think uh, oftentimes I'm disappointed that those who live long, uh, they oftentimes they smoke and they drink, they gamble. So all the things uh, they are doing, but still living long. So that is a, what is a miracle. Uh, but I think I'm uh, much uh, expecting outcome of uh, a study of Brian, so that I think by my uh, uh, secret will be finally, finally uh, disclosed. That is my high expectation to you, Brian, your work. <laughs> and with that to uh, poor and rich, and that is uh, linking to, uh, I'm afraid to ask one question to uh, Guan uh, is that, and um, for example, I think we have a, um, um, long term care insurance data. So, who will become a uh, 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 beneficiary of long term care? So, what uh, is the difference? So, um, must some um, big data identify that those uh, senior citizens are closer to living in, in to the park and e they usually walk longer and not heavy exercise, but uh, quite. A daily walk, and uh, most of them have uh, formed some uh, walking group and chatting and walk. So that is uh, becoming. Uh, we find that they are um, best performer in terms of preventing uh, the user to be a user of long-term care. So I think uh, if uh, we publicly invest for for building more parks, safe walking road. Uh, that is, um, is perhaps um, a rich and poor. Both can benefit from uh, longer, healthy longevity. That is my uh, one point. And second, that well, such data is uh, oftentimes uh, welfare data is, is, is kept in some, somewhere else than health sector. And combining this is very challenging. And um, even without um, um, uh, not using uh, long-term care insurance data, I think some other sort of big data so like um, uh, uh, cameras or street can identify senior citizens, how, how many persons are walking and so on. So I think something can can done from AI expert and the IT expert. What will be um, your uh, suggestions? I'm very interested here from Professor Guan. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just quickly, uh, I think that the data you talk about, sometimes you need to really protect the personal privacy they don't because yeah. it's revealed to the insurance company they maybe have some adversary uh, effect for them so that AI they can uh, anonymize all the identity of the data so those are the things uh, already in place uh, the further uh, one technology called federal machine learning so they don't have any personal they look at the aggregated information so you can find the chain but not going to back to individual but you want you can still trace back to individuals uh, for medical doctors to take care so I think that's some, some uh, areas still a lot of research. Is, uh, actually, uh, new, new new technology can help in this area. Can I Thanks. just add one comment on uh, sure. female aging? Uh, we're, uh, 
there are big differences, I think, between the male and female aging. We can see that even in mice. Interventions often work in one or the other, and we don't know why. Uh, and I think we're very lucky here because we've gotten support from the Bio Echo Foundation to start a center for Asian, Asian Center for Reproductive uh, Aging and Equality. Uh, uh, and so we're looking at reproductive longevity and equality. We're looking at ovarian aging, uh, which is one of the first organs to age in the body and uh, has a number of consequences on systemic aging in women. So uh, we're beginning to look at those studies and I think they uh, need to be looked at a lot more because I, th I think we underappreciate the biologic differences inherent in aging between men and women. Thanks, Brian. So maybe a quick question from Jeff and then Linda and then we'll have to end. Jeff, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, I'm a strong proponent of lifestyle intervention to reduce risk and so forth. I am not personally convinced that the mechanism by which lifestyle affects disease risk is by changing the rate of aging. So I'm going to push back on you, John, a little. Um, the promise, and maybe Brian can comment, the promise of changing potentially changing the rate of aging is the, the possibility that as age is the biggest, by far the biggest risk factor for many of the age-related diseases we've been talking about, for cancer, for Alzheimer's disease, for diabetes. And rather than attacking each one of those separately, which has been our history, largely unsuccessful, if we can actually, if Brian and colleagues can actually find ways to change the aging rate, there's the potential to change the rate of development of all of these diseases so that people can live longer, healthier. Not necessarily live to 150, but if they could live to 90 or 100 with a much lower rate of these diseases, that would be wonderful. Comment? Great. Uh, Jeff, I would let Linda come in here first. Uh, you wanted to have a question, right, Linda? Yep. So, so I have a behavior change question as well, but uh, Church One, I think it's for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, because um, building on what John Beard said earlier about the need to change our health care and public health institutions to focus on um, both prevention and care of complex chronic conditions and move away from acute care systems. What are you learning in Singapore as to how to incent that kind of major institutional change so that it actually, uh, so that we end up with health care institutions devoted to healthy longevity? Okay. <laughs> John, go ahead first. Okay, well, I'll, I'll push back against your pushback, Jeff. Um, I wasn't proposing the mechanism, but what, what I guess I was saying is, um, I mean, it's interesting what Hiro said. A and and there's, a, there's a stat from Japan which always blows my mind. He, th there are now over 70,000 centenarians in Japan. Do you know how many there were after the Second World War? 98. Like, think about the transformation of the society we're experiencing. You know, to, to me, that really brings home the urgency of what we're talking about. Um, but why? And, and why, as Hero says, to some people who, who, who don't follow what we would think of as a healthy behavior, why do they survive? Is it just their genes? What is the aging process? Now, I am firmly convinced that behavior influences the aging process. Whether it's the only way that it has its impact, I, 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 it probably not. But I think in the past, we used to think very mechanicalistically about the risk factors for NCDs. So, you know, I used to think if I eat fat, I could imagine it lining my arteries. You know, as I ate it, it I, I could see it getting in my bloodstream, pushing up my cholesterol and, and clogging up my arteries. Um, and, and I thought, well, physical activity, um, it, it keeps the fat level down. That's a pretty simplistic way of thinking about it. And, and what, what, what I'm was suggesting is as we, I hope, understand the aging process better, what we need to look at is what are the lifestyle determinants 
of the aging process and then we will see the impact on these other conditions and I'm, I imagine that lifestyle influences both it influences NCDs directly but it also influences those underlying drivers and we need to understand it better. Brian penultimate comment. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. And, and I also, I think we need to reimagine what biologic aging is. I, I, we tend to think of it as like chronologic age. It just goes up. Uh, but when we're measuring it, if these measures are accurate, it's more going like this. And so uh, I think it's probably possible to accelerate your aging or to decrease your aging, uh, depending on your behavior. If you get COVID, what you to develop healthy lifestyle. And I think things that are out of your the register of your evolutionary biology, sedentariness, um, overnutrition, or accelerating aging. And so you can argue that maybe we're not dramatically delaying aging by lifestyle, maybe healthy lifestyle, maybe we're just compensating or getting people back closer to what their normal aging should be. I think that's a reasonable argument. But I do think these lifestyle changes are impacting biologic age and I think biologic age is going to be much more malleable than we thought it would be. That's my best guess at this point. I, I think the other question which has always troubled me is why are populations living longer? Why are the Japanese or the Chinese living to the ages they currently are? And you know, I, I, you could think, okay, they've had less exposure to risk factors across their lives. Well, in China, the older population now went through the Cultural Revolution. You know, so why are they living longer? They didn't have access to healthcare in the 70s and the 80s, not like, certainly not like, like the, the, the West. Why are they living longer? And so I think understanding the aging process is a much more fundamental question than just finding a pill to slow it. And once we understand it, then it will open up a whole lot of new um, panoramas for us to explore. Well, th thanks so much. And maybe I was just uh, uh, close by trying to, attempting to answer Linda's question and I, which is really about how you transform a health system <clears throat> from what it was set up <clears throat> and incentivized to do to something which is fit for a different future where you have a lot more older people, much more chronic disease and where prevention has to play a much more central role. How to get from here to there, right? And I would say firstly, uh, you'd, you'd have to have a, a clear vision uh, and break it down into a number of... Uh, clear objectives and then you'd have to convert that into a series of tractable steps that people can understand and can work towards and then we hope to be able to stitch those tractable steps into something that uh, is coherent so let me explain what i mean very briefly in the in the singapore context so we have a excellent health system uh, the first tractable step that we have to do as we move to population health is to secure the uh, collective uh, agreement to a vision that we are now going to move to preventive health. And I think, uh, thanks to the leadership that we have throughout the system, medical, non-medical, I think we are reaching that consensus. Then the, the first tangible step is to strengthen primary care, which for historical reasons in Singapore developed uh, largely through small private GP practices. And uh, so that would represent a very significant, a very big transformation effort, but one which is completely necessary. And there are a number of steps that are needed to do that. Then the second part is then how to really empower patients. So we all talk about empowering patients, but how does that actually happen? And uh, we would need, in Singapore, we think that we need a multi-level type of engagement in order to do that. So we, we certainly need education, we need uh, to uh, connect people to other people who can support them, either in the community, professionals, non-professionals, support groups, social groups in the community, uh, so that uh, they can help to encourage and sustain behaviour change. I think digital engagement will become an uh, important part of this, uh, particularly for uh, younger people. Uh, and then understanding using analytics uh, with consent to, uh, to, to learn how to engage and to sustain behavioral change. Uh, I, I, I think it'll be a combination of these things uh, that sent on the individual, making the environment and the community uh, much more supportive through establishing new community norms for 
what is healthy behaviour and what is not. Uh, that's the only way I think in which we can truly empower patients. And uh, um, we have to be uh, sensitive to the heterogeneity of the population, uh, but uh, there, has, there are some basic things that need to be done. And then the, the third part really is uh, integration of the system. Uh, the, the vertical and the horizontal integration that uh, John Beard talked about uh, this morning. Uh, and that's a function of data, that's a function of organisation, and it's a function of financing. And uh, in Singapore, we have taken the first step towards capitation payments for subsidised patients. Uh, but eventually, you will have to roll out so that we create a financial payment system that uh, creates a motivation to align the uh, objectives and incentives of uh, providers, payers and patients. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a huge <laughs> effort, clearly. But I, uh, at least how we think about it is uh, we have to have a big vision, but we also need a series of very clear, tangible steps that uh, are milestones along the way. And uh, then this is a multi-year journey that uh, we all know will uh, require a lot of effort. And as you go along, how we are going to bring all these together in a coherent manner. And the final thing I want to say uh, that uh, central to the success of all this is trust. Is trust. Uh, so the health professionals, the health people in the health ecosystem have to trust uh, the payer, the government. The uh, patients have to trust that all this is going to be much better for them, that this is an exercise in fundamentally improving health. And uh, that trust will also have to extend to the use of data in a judicious and uh, confidential manner. And uh, preserving, building that trust between all the different parties is a critical part of this entire exercise. So sorry, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, that's all I can say uh, uh, in the limited time, but that's how we're thinking about it. So with that, I, I really, uh, I think you all agree, we had a fantastic uh, set of comments from our panelists. Uh, fantastic questions from our audience. I'm so sorry, uh, we had some uh, uh, on the iPad which we didn't have time to go through. Thank you very much for sending your minds and thank you to all our panelists. Thank you very much, Professor. Next, we are truly honoured to have Dr. Srinivas Tata with us here to deliver the first of two keynote lectures at today's summit. Dr. Srinivas Tata is the Director for Social Development at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. To introduce him, may we invite Dr. Marianne Sao, please. Dr. Marian Tao is the chairman and founding director of the Tao Foundation, a Singapore-based but regionally oriented non-profit operational foundation dedicated to aged care and aging issues. Dr. Marian Tao, please. Good afternoon. I hope everyone's still awake. <laughs> anyway, this is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Srinivas Tata, your next keynote. Um, Dr. Tata has been a great champion of well-being of older people at the international United Nations level. So Dr. Tata is the director of the Social Development Division of United Nations um, Economic Social Commission on Asia Pacific, or UNESCAP for short. He has 15 years of experience working with United Nations, and as his current role as a head of a social development division, his responsibilities include supporting member states in the promotion of social protection, um, fostering gender equality, strengthening social inclusion of persons with disabilities, older persons, youth, migrants, amongst others, is a very large portfolio. Um, he is also a physician by background and with experience in social policy, public health, and program management. Prior to joining United Nations, um, Ms. Dr. Tata was Director of Public Health and the Minister of Health in the Government of India, dealing with 
I don't know if you dealt with India, but India is complicated. <laughs> but anyway, but, but, but there is the Ministry of Health. He deals with financing implementation of large-scale health programs and, of course, specific look at policies involving access to affordable drugs. Someone in earlier in the morning had mentioned about MIPA, or the Madrid International Plan of uh, Action on Aging, um, uh, which is really the United Nations principal document um, blueprint in that regard for the member states addressing issues of aging and longevity. And we just completed, or actually I participated in the completion of the recent 20th year review of the member states of Asia Pacific. So Dr. Tato will be able to share with you the key insights it gained fresh off the print, so to speak, of the recent review of the 20th anniversary of MIPA um, from Asia Pacific member states. So without further ado, Dr. Tato, please. Thank you very much, Marianne, for a very generous introduction, which I'm not too sure I'm very worthy of. When someone tells me I have to deliver a keynote address to this, this very distinguished audience, um, uh, which is consisting of such great experts, then I realize it's somewhat like preaching to the choir. But on the other hand, I think it gives me a great opportunity. I'm going to grab this opportunity to perhaps draw upon what we have heard from member states recently, to tell you how important this report is for this region. To say why this report is especially important for this region. To say what were the most critical issues that were identified during this recently concluded MEPA review and our analysis that kind of uh, demonstrate this and why what would be important for the region which could really form components of an Asia-Pacific response if you're going to have healthy aging. What would a whole of society approach look like? But more importantly, I would like to conclude by kind of saying how can I, how, what can the United Nations do maybe to take this forward? I think we have a, a wonderful group of advocates here. We're amongst friends here. All of us, uh, we believe, we're passionate about older persons. But it's important for us to think how are we going to take this report? How are we not just going to leave this wonderful report on the shelf and see how we can take this forward and use, uh, take the inspiration from it? Just to start, why is this report especially important for the region? And uh, to a certain extent, my job has been made much easier by, by, uh, uh, by Dr. Nakatani as well as uh, Professor Pigott, because they've kind of said some of what I'm going to say. But I'm just going to reinforce that, just very briefly. Sometimes if I sound like a bullet train going through, remember it's mainly to save time for your, for your later uh, panels too. First, population trends in Asia Pacific have shaped global trends. As you can see, the population growth rates have dropped, dropped so drastically in our region since, uh, since 1950 that today the Asia-Pacific growth rate is well below the global average and will be less than half of the global population growth rate in 2050. So no wonder this region is going to be the hub of population aging and will contain the largest number of older persons. Now, as of 2022, we already are home to 60% of the uh, world's population of older persons, and this percentage is going to go up. So if you want action on population aging, I think it's great that you've come to Asia because this is where we, re we require the maximum action. And I think I'm repeating a lot of what has been said, but it's worth repeating so that we remember this. The apt in terms of absolute numbers, I'd just like to stress that the absolute number of older persons has grown sixfold in the last 70 years, as you can see. And you can see the exponential growth. And this has been largely due to very sharp drops in, uh, of course, increase in, uh, uh, there has been, th this is the number. So the proportion, while it has dropped mainly due to a very sharp drop in fertility, we had an increase in absolute number too, sixfold in the last 70 years. And it again doubled from 2020 to 2050. And here, I would like to, uh, to 2100 also, as you can see, as you go further, it will go up to 1600 million. Now, I would like to also 
pick up on something. This is a graph that Professor Nakatani also showed you, but of course his graph was restricted to Wipro. And he, as he rightly said, what's important here is the speed of aging. The speed at, uh, at uh, the rate at which these changes are happening are not something the countries are able to respond to. And as you can see, these are, if you look at the more developed countries in the region, including Australia and New Zealand, there's a lot more time to adjust. And I don't think countries in our region which are going through these changes, a few of them are already taking action, but the pace at which they need to act is far more than they're ready to. And I'm not even sure that they have the right amount of resources, so they have to really start thinking about that. As you can see, I just wanted to have this representation also to see the gentle slope that some of the European countries had to just walk over, like an evening in the park, but compared to the rock climbing, steep wall, uh, rock climbing that some of our Asian countries have to do because it's going to be such a quick change. So, so th this is something that I wanted to illustrate as to the importance of this being taken on board and this agenda being given more importance and highlighted in all, all the different fora that we, uh, we get a chance to do that too. Now, Professor Piggott started his presentation this afternoon when he focused on, on the 80 plus population. Now it's again, when we talk about older persons, we have to acknowledge that there are variations there. The very old, oldest old have distinct needs. Obviously, they'll have higher rates of disability. The health needs will be different. And as you can see, uh, you can see the numbers, and we have numbers from 1950 to 2022 to 2050. As you can see, there are very large numbers of persons above 80, even in countries which are not considered particularly old right now in terms of proportion of older population. Similarly, I but when you go down to a percentage, of course, that changes. Countries like Japan have a much higher proportion as a proportion of the total population, uh, uh, eight, the 80 plus population. So it's important not only to, important to, uh, to look at the older population, to understand the differential needs between the oldest old as well as those who are uh, just between the age of 65 and 80. I would like to also highlight that 86% of all older persons in our region live in just nine countries. But why am I showing you this? Because there are a large number of the, India has 150 older persons, 50 million older persons. And Indonesia has 30 million older persons. These are all considered young countries as was submitted. But I, I wanted to illustrate that just by the sheer number, I think implementing Healthy aging policies is as urgent in these countries as it is in countries which perhaps have much larger proportions and are more seized of the matter. So even I believe that there's a lot of championing that has to be done with these countries to start because there are a very large number of older persons. If you're really going to make a difference in terms of numbers, we also have to look at countries with the largest numbers at the side. So that was the short point that I would like to make, that we really have to focus even on countries which do not have that large a pop, uh, proportion. So it's a, it's a youthful country. But again, it brings into uh, uh, important the fact that there are numbers there. It, it is an issue and there are older persons who deserve a much uh, stronger attention that they are giving now. I would also like to highlight something that's been brought up. It's not only, it's the fact that we also have to understand the inequalities amongst older persons. And it's important that this report, we apply the findings of the report accordingly. And I brought out these differences because the, the state, the status of an older person depends on the country where he or she has been born. The cumulative uh, you know, impact of the factors, including that they have endured through the life course, the socioeconomic status, the incomes, uh, you know, it, it becomes that there are big inequalities between countries and within countries. So I think we need to take the findings of this report and, and really apply it in a, in a context. If you really want uptake by countries, according, determine the different sets of countries having different sets of needs. I think if you really want this to be taken up, then it's important that we also look at the recommendations and shape them accordingly. 
I'd like to focus on a few critical issues that were brought up during our review and also during an analysis, which, are, which would be central to the Asia-Pacific response. What I'm going to highlight are not exhaustive, but to my mind will determine the success of the response. I'm just picking up some broad brush strokes that I'm giving you. First, the issue of population aging in our region has a huge gender dimension. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Soin for highlighting that. Simply because as we grow older into the, into the older cohorts, it's very clear that the number of women outnumber the number of men. Now, the proportion of older women is 51% at the age 60 to 70, uh, uh, 60, and it goes up to 70% at the age of 80. So the fact is, it, uh, as we grow older, uh, as we look at the older uh, uh, age groups, the proportion of women, is, women are far, far higher. And it's not just due, due, due to the fact that they are, they are in larger numbers that they deserve special attention, but they, they, they face a specific set of challenges that require a different, where policies really need to be tailored to their needs. And I think especially in our region, the gender dimension of uh, population aging is very important. And I think that aspect would be strengthened when we go further in elaborating this report and the findings of this report. And it, uh, it's something that I would like to bring to the notice of all. Just to highlight this further, at the age of 60, if you take life expectancy, uh, female and female life expectancy at 60, in 10 countries in our region, you will find that women live a minimum of 27 years after 60. They outlive men biologically on an average by four to five years. And as was highlighted by Dr. Nakatani, often if you look at a uh, female spouse, often married to a man, a single eight year of marriage, there's a gap according to the data that we collect, that the male spouse uh, is five years on an average older than the female. So if you add the general biological, the fact that the female outlives the male by five years, the number of years the female spouse outlives the male is by about 10 years. This is just as a ballpark. These are the years that most of the time, if the, if the male spouse is disabled, the woman is there to take care, to provide the care. But what happens to the woman? Often, she has not participated in the labor market, does not have access to pension. In a number of countries, maybe property not in her name. And often, as you can see, that often lives alone and often without income security. I just wanted to, again, use this slide to highlight why we need to focus on the gender aspects of population aging within all the priority areas that you've identified. We, I also would like to draw about an important issue on uh, um, living arrangements. We still, in our region, uh, the majority, I think, uh, of course, uh, uh, the proportion varies. The majority of older persons live with their families. But this proportion of older persons living alone is increasing. But again, notice it. It is the older women who live more alone, most probably because when they're alive, the spouses are together. Once after the male spouse passes, passes away, it's the woman who lives alone. So again, the proportion of older women living alone is much higher, and this is very important. Again, drawing uh, on something that's been said and highlighted several times before, older persons in our region, and this was again highlighted during the review, and when drawing for the need for synergy between the disability and aging agendas. The older persons in our region live up to 10 years with impairment or disabilities. I, would, I think there is a huge potential to reduce this. We have both by interventions that prevent disabilities, especially in Asia Pacific, there are certain, for example, preventable blindness is perhaps the largest number of cases of preventable blindness exist in Asia Pacific. We, I think there are a few interventions that could really make a very big difference, but the point is that we need to manage disability in the first place to prevent disabilities, but also to manage disability, because despite all your steps, you're going to have older persons who are going to be disabled. But it's so important that we, the often, this is going to be, as you know, most of them stay with their families. It's very essential, the role of the community and the family and older persons themselves is very important in the context of managing this. So therefore, 
training of uh, the community, family, older person themselves in recognizing early signs of disease and ailments, seeking the right treatment. And my friend Eduardo keeps talking about the importance of self-training of older persons for prevention of falls, to pursue other health, promote, you know, health promoting activities that allows them not to then to keep themselves mobile. I think that's going to be very important. But uh, the role of effective rehabilitation cannot be overstressed. In a number of countries, for example, I can talk about India. In a country like India, rehabilitative services, they produce a very large number of rehabilitation pro professionals, mainly in the urban areas, and often a large number of them, significant number migrate. It's very important if you're going to deal, if you want to have active aging, that we have a larger, we, we have a stronger outreach of rehabilitation services to keep older persons, uh, you know, to ensure the access to, to, uh, to services that are going to keep them active for a longer time. Let me come to an issue which is, uh, which we are very, very, uh, we feel very strongly about in ASCAP and has been highlighted by Professor Pigott too. Throughout Asia and the Pacific, we believe one extension of universal healthcare is one of the biggest steps that can really uh, ensure healthy aging, to ensure that older persons have access to healthcare. Of course, it's not the only step. You know, you need to have complement that with ensuring that your primary health care is age friendly. You need to complement that with also strengthening your health workforce. But having said that, we, we, we have to remember that UHC will remain the single largest step which will really allow us to take a big step in that direction. Legal coverage in, does not always translate into actual effective health coverage. I have slightly more updated data uh, compared to Dr. Pigott because I've drawn from the Global Health Observatory of WHO, this is 2022 data, which shows that the uni average UHC service coverage in our region is about 64. Zero indicating no coverage and 100 which indicates universal coverage. But it ranges from 33 in Afghanistan to 86 in Australia, as you can see in the figure. And countries which have uh, values below the regional average are mainly in South Asia and Southeast Asia. And believe me, these numbers are improving. And I think I'm very hopeful that we're going to make progress. But I think there is a big synergy between the UHC agenda and ensuring um, healthy longevity. And I hope that we're going to have a meeting in 2023. We're having a summit in, 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 uh, in the GA. And I think older persons, the interests of older persons must be central when we are discussing UHC there. And of course, one risk we always have is UHC is not just the only answer. Often I've seen, we have seen countries which invest heavily on UHC, but again, we don't see, we see a drop off in the preventive and health promotive expenditure. We, we need to ensure that both of them are maintained at the same levels. So very clearly, out of pocket expenditure needs to uh, d uh, go down, especially in, especially in our region where pension coverage is not there and older persons have no disposable income. And these out-of-pocket expenditures can be catastrophic. We have, I would like to uh, acquaint you with a little research that we, we did in terms of uh, the projected increase in health expenditures by 2060 due to a multitude of factors, growth of population, aging of populations and otherwise. But we also calculated what would be the gains if you implemented healthy aging. The light blue is the increase in healthcare costs if we implement healthy aging. And the dark blue is the premium that countries have to pay, pay additionally if you are going to, not going to implement healthy aging. And these are some of the analysis that I will be very happy to share that we hope to then use in order to influence countries to really invest more in health. And, 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 and this will be one of our contributions towards the Universal Healthcare Summit as one of the analytical contributions that we'll be making in this, this respect. But this, there's nothing, uh, it very clearly shows you even economically that yes, these are costs, extra costs that have to be borne by society. It may not be borne, it's a cost of ill health. Somebody has to pay for it, it's paid for in, the, in terms of ill health, in terms of loss to society, loss of, to, loss of productivity, and also maybe in terms of uh, extra expenditures by the government themselves in dealing with, uh, uh, with disability and other impairments. 
I'd like to highlight another key issue that needs to be addressed, where inequalities again are rampant. We have a very low level of uh, pe contributory pension coverage in our region. And this is, as Professor Pigott exp uh, explained, and I believe that income security is extremely important if we are going to ensure healthy aging in our region, healthy longevity, because there is no way where people cannot make the right choices and you do not have any disposable income, it's going to be very difficult for people to stay healthy, especially if universal health care has not been extended. And as you can see here, even here, you can see the gender difference. Yeah, men obviously have participated in the labor market far more, especially in the formal sector. Women are disproportionately represented in the, in the, in the informal sector. Pension coverage is low, and even here, women are covered far less. But this is obviously, uh, we need to have social pensions, and a number of countries are showing the way in trying to increase social pensions. Countries like Nepal, we are having India, which is jacking up social pensions, Indonesia, and even Thailand is looking to increase. But very clearly, this is an issue which is far larger than the aging agenda only. We have to find a way of covering the informal sector through social protection. And we are doing, there are some good examples. A magic wand is not going to get rid of the informal sector. It's there, but we have to find ways of extending social protection. And it's important that somebody talked about the new trends of gig economy, of people, younger people working more on contract. They are not exactly then appearing within the formal economy. That in itself is a trend where people are going from the formal employment to informal employment. Just to be noted that we know we have to find ways of ensuring that self-employed and people in the informal sector really uh, can uh, contribute to pensions and their income security is protected. This is something where I also wanted to kind of nuance what we heard from, from uh, Professor Pigott today. Considerable number of older persons in the region continue to work. But they work not because they want to work sometimes, because they have no choice. They work because they have no income security. I think the way to go is, I, I would agree with John Beard when he said that, look, we fix a day, uh, you know, you can fix a date when the pension kicks in. But the choice of when to retire should be uh, left to the older person. Fixing a very extended date of retirement, fixing a date of 70 years for retirement, it depends on which sector you're working in. Older persons who are working in, in labor-intensive sectors may not like to continue working there unless they're reskilled to work elsewhere. I think, therefore, we, our, our reaction has to be slightly nuanced here. And I think, ultimately, these are bigger pictures. Maybe the fact that older persons are working in the informal sector, a number of them may be are self-employed. But these are key issues that we need to keep in mind, and social pensions, therefore, play a vital role. And I really highlight the role that HelpAge has done in this region uh, in providing a lot of research, where I remember uh, there's a photograph of, uh, of Eduardo handing over a report to, to the then Prime Minister of Thailand, and they introduced social pension after a month. So if you have champions, you can make a difference. So now, I'd like to also highlight another issue which was brought up during our discussions. The disc throughout, I think both member states as well as older persons associations talked about how, that, or how older persons had suffered, how they could not access services, including vaccination ser services, where people have to go online. Now, health, provision of health services, a lot of banking services, a lot of them are online. And if you're not, uh, digitally literate, you really are going to be excluded. I think addressing the digital divide is very, very important. It's not just about providing broadband. I think that's one part. But you must teach older persons and also get them. And there was a very nice, uh, very small training, you know, um, processes, very small training programs can lead to big differences. I remember uh, we had a dialogue with older persons as part of MEPA, and there was this older person uh, of 75 years from Singapore who talked, who said how just knowing how to uh, use a phone and just learning how to Skype and, or to even uh, 
make WhatsApp phone calls and having video calls, how it improved her life and kind of reduced her isolation. I think closing the digital divide remains a very important priority. So I just wanted to highlight some of these uh, issues called from our discussions during the, uh, during the MEPA review. And I wanted to reflect a little bit about uh, There should be one more pillar. Yes. Now, when I read the report, I was very, very intrigued and very pleasantly surprised because the recommendations that you have very much matched uh, what we had developed as a, as, a, as a template for a model national plan on aging. We had worked initially, worked with HelpAge, and uh, later on we to see how, and it's structured under the various heads. And as you can see, it's very much aligned along the lines of what has been proposed in the report. And I believe that advancing healthy longevity does not mean, that means action does not mean, uh, it does not mean that action needs to, will be restricted only to the health pillar. I think we need really synergistic action across all pillars because all the pillars here are going to contribute to the pillar of healthy longevity. I just wanted to just, even in the area of healthcare access, universal healthcare is just one part, but I think we have all heard about the new, about the need for us to strengthen primary healthcare to meet the needs of older persons. Are we, are, is it really programmed? Is it really, what about the outreach? What about the coordination? What about the coordination between long-term care uh, the uh, social care and all the other factors that need to be implemented as part of, uh, I think universal healthcare is just the first step, but we need to seriously restructure the health system so that we address the risk factors that older persons face throughout the life course. And strengthening uh, primary healthcare to reach out to older persons. Sometimes I think we have uh, primary healthcare structures which wait for the for the older persons to come to them. At times, I think the outreach component is equally important to reach out to older persons. Similarly, I would like to pick up on something on work and labor and where there were very detailed recommendations in your report. And uh, we had, I believe that in um, implementing some of the, uh, all these, uh, you know, what should I say, areas of uh, action uh, is going to be important if you're going to have healthy aging. And I, again, to reiterate, I think if you, if you want to keep older persons in the workforce, we need to have more flexible working arrangements. We need to have training and skilling for new jobs. We, are having, we have a project, a number of countries, starting from Japan, Republic of Korea, very much interested in looking for ways in which older persons can stay in the labor market, but maybe trained and skilled for new jobs. Maybe there's a way in which they can work less. Maybe they can, they can contribute in a different manner. And above all, I think the issue of flexible retire retirement age, as has been uh, discussed in your report, is, is going to be very, very important. I'd also highlight the issue relating to intergenerational solidarity, which is a very important issue in our region, especially where, where countries have very large aging populations, but also have a huge youth population. And I think here, the idea of voluntarism in terms of older persons giving their time, but it can work the other way around too. We, I think we have the example of uh, intergenerational clubs in Vietnam, which I'm sure uh, Eduardo will talk about, where, where there's a real, where younger persons give their time, especially to, to support older persons and also learn from older persons. I think there's an opportunity for this to be institutionalized, both as part of curricula, as part of national policy. I think that is, uh, that in many ways also alleviates uh, the gaps uh, that may be there and bringing in the community really to support us. Similarly, I'm talking about the third pillar. We already talked about having affordable and age-friendly housing options for older persons, huge synergies both for transport and housing, as well as promote the development of age-integrated communities. And uh, we know that the issue of universal design is a very, very big uh, issue within the disability agenda, 
and we are hoping that the benefits of that will also be available for older persons. And then having a, for, uh, accessible transportation, affordable, uh, accessible housing, and above all, uh, communities that allow that intergenerational exchange where it will alleviate the isolation that older persons often feel. So I would like, I would like to leave you with a few key messages. One, my, my plea that whatever we do, we please, we take note of the variations between countries. We take note of the variations of countries in various levels of development. And also within countries, the status of older persons may vary depending on income level, residence, and even culture has a big impl you know, implication. I would like to also stress again, please let us look at the gender dimension in whatever we do. I think it's important that we mainstream gender, look at the specific needs of older women, whatever, whenever we plan any intervention. I believe universal healthcare remains the basic first step while strengthening primary healthcare and integrating access to mental care, social health care, social care, as well as long-term care. I believe that social, finding innovative ways of extending social protection to the informal sector will be critical if you are to cover uh, most older persons uh, with pensions. Otherwise, we'll be extending this token amount of social pensions, but in the long term, if you want to increase the amount of contributory pensions, we have to find a way of involving, finding a way of integrating uh, informal sector. In our region, community, family, and, and intergenerational solidarity is critical. And I think it's because of, of cultural reasons and the fact that traditionally here, family has been a very big, has played a very big role and communities play a very big role. And MIPA itself calls for a bottom-up strategy. And I think we have to find uh, the uh, a real meaningful role for community in our interventions. As far as this report is concerned, I think what's coming out of MIPA, one of the biggest, uh, I think, benefits from MIPA is uh, we had this wonderful uh, coming together of CSOs and older persons associations. There is a new will to really come together at the Asia Pacific level to build a coalition to support governments, to know that, okay, they're different, that we have to work with champions. Change is not happening even though the evidence is being shown. I think we need to change strategies. We need to understand how to, who to tap and how, how change can be worked out in our region. I think this sometimes in Asia Pacific, to tell you very frankly, even if the evidence is there, it doesn't need, lead necessarily to policy. There has to be something worked in between. And I, I, I would look forward as UNSCAP for taking forward this report and use uh, our future meetings in some way, draw upon if availability of some of your commissioners to really come and present some of the key features in all meetings related to aging. I know John is a very big champion who's very familiar, who's worked with a number of countries. I would perhaps, we are getting requests for support uh, on, on developing aging policies from a few countries. Maybe this is a good place to start if we have a template to support them. So there are many areas that we could work on, but thank you very much for, for involving us in this and thank you very much, Marianne, for, for really um, allowing us to make our contribution on this. So that's all for now. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Tata. Before we commence our next uh, panel discussion, let us take a short break. We will commence um, the next panel discussion promptly at 3.55. Thank you. We will now continue with the panel discussion on social infrastructure and physical environment. Moderating the discussion, we have Dr. Marianne Zhao, Chairman and Founding Director of the South Foundation Singapore. And on the panel, we have Dr. Eduardo Klein, the Regional Director, East Asia and Pacific at Health Age International, 
Mr. Tang Mingdui. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Singapore's Housing and Development Board. Dr. Wendy Walker, the Chief of Social Development Thematic Group of the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department at the Asian Development Bank. And joining us online is Professor Zhao Yaohui from the China Center for Economic Research of Peking University. May I now invite the panelists and our moderator, Dr. Marian Zhao, please. Thank you for that. I'm so used to wearing a mask, we can permanent picture of my face. <laughs> anyway, so I uh, hope everyone had got a little refreshed uh, after a long day because it's been such a, so much information, such rich discussion. So this afternoon is going to be also very packed and very diverse. We're looking at three of the four buckets was defined by the report, looking at the work, physical environment, as well as social infrastructure. And just as a previous uh, sec uh, session with health, this is a very um, illustrious panel of representing the widespread of the issues that we'll be talking about. So um, we'll just carry on. Okay. Um, firstly, I'm going to use a dreaded word, silver tsunami. Okay. But I think we're using the word not in itself because previously, you know, we get very upset about that in aging because they define silver tsunami as a wave that will come necessarily because they see things as being fixed. The things cannot change. The health situation or economic situation with the population today is the same 10, 20, 30 years ago. But the key thing with this report is that is to have to use it with other words, which is that the evidence show the future is optimistic. It is what it is now, but if we invest in it appropriately, the future is bright. We can change the future. Okay, so I think this is where I'm starting with, is that silver tsunami can be used only if it comes with the other side, that we invest and act appropriately, the future is optimistic. So from that, we'll go on from there. So first, I would like to actually ask um, uh, the first question to Professor Zhao, because following the silver tsunami usually is about economics, the economics of aging, the health situation. Therefore, it is definitely a devastating uh, tsunami. So I want to pose a question to you. You've been studying uh, economics of aging for a long time, particularly in the context of health. So please share what your views are about the uh, uh, impact of um, aging on, on economic um, <laughs> economics of aging. Professor Sao, please. Thank you. Uh, it's such an honor to, uh, to be at this conference. And I just wish I, I had the opportunity to be there in person. Um, I prepared a few slides. Uh, I'll start sharing now. So, um, So aging has widely been viewed as a negative factor. Uh, in a recent um, interview, um, uh, Larry Summers um, uh, said that China's uh, anticipated overtaking of the United States in the, in the size of the economy may be not so certain. And one of the four factors he cited was uh, aging, was population aging in China. And uh, why would um, aging affect the economy? The most widely cited factors are one, reduced size of the workforce. Um, and second is the fiscal burden um, uh, from social security and healthcare because um, with aging, there will, there will be more people receiving pensions and less and fewer people paying into it. Um, in many countries, the fiscal deficits have um, affected the economy and may, may have led to economic crisis, financial crisis, and then economic crisis due precisely to population aging. 
and also uh, older people consuming uh, more resources uh, than the younger population. However, as Mary Ann just alluded to, uh, aging does not need to be harmful if certain conditions hold. The most important one is uh, having older people remain productively involved in the workforce. Um, and, and that is, uh, th th this requires healthy aging. Uh, healthy aging enables older people to remain in the workforce by giving them capacity uh, to work. Uh, healthy aging also reduces the unhealthy lifespan, can also reduce resources that are uh, required in supporting uh, older population. But healthy aging does not automatically generate longer working lives. Um, in most countries, the existing policies and institutions actually induce and force workers to leave labor force early. Um, so we need policy innovations uh, so that uh, the, the, this uh, longevity dividend can be reaped. And these uh, innovations include the abolishing the mandatory retirement aid policies, um, uh, providing incentives for workers, for people to stay on, and the curb age discrimination in the workplace, um, provide social support for child and elderly care so that people can um, can be free uh, from these family responsibilities and stay in the workforce. And also to enable pe older people to stay productive in the workforce, um, we need to offer a, long, long, a lifelong education training uh, so that their skills can be upgraded. And, and healthy aging does not come naturally either. Um, healthy aging, um, uh, most, almost 80% of the health disparities have been shown to come from social determinants of health. So health is not the sole product of the healthcare sector. So in this sense, um, the social infrastructures are important. And these in infrastructures include um, a lifelong um, approach um, to, to, um, to raise health at the older age. We need to start from in uterus and early childhood nutrition. nutrition. Uh, programs, government programs in these stages of life uh, targeting the poor population can pay off at old age. Uh, and ed education um, independently promotes health but also affects health by raising social economic positions and uh, financial security, which we know can enhance health at old age. And then we also need public health interventions uh, in health behaviors, uh, including smoking, physical activities, health literacy, and the physical environment, including uh, pollution and the climate change, et cetera. So, um, and, and in the health care sector, we also need to, to move from disease-centered disease approach to person-centered um, uh, primary uh, care. So we need to emphasize prevention and control of chronic diseases. And we need to emphasize the maintenance of daily functions um, despite diseases. So people can have a lot of diseases, but, um, but we, we, if we can maintain their daily functions, then they're not a burden. They can live healthy life uh, with the diseases. Um, and, and we need to have integrated healthcare considering the existence of many of multimorbidity in, in older people. Um, and this, uh, if we have the integrated healthcare, then, then we may actually reduce uh, total healthcare costs and, and out-of-pocket out of costs to individuals. And then the last, finally, uh, to integrate healthcare and aged care sectors. We can also um, reduce uh, the overall costs of supporting the aged population. Um, we know that the Asia 
um, tradi the tradition in Asian countries has been family taking care of the older people, uh, but with reduced fertility and migration, uh, out migration of adult children, uh, aged care um, can be a, a major challenge. Uh, so, uh, so, so the social service in aged care sectors will be very important. Um, so how we in integrate health care and social care and aged care uh, will be very important uh, for, the, for the Asian countries. I'll stop here. Thank you, uh, Professor. So can you just uh, maybe spend three minutes to say, comment on how, how China is doing with all this? China is a very large, complex country to implement, but they also have a way of implementing things that's like other countries can't do. So are they adopting any of these? Maybe just a quick, like, three-minute reply. Um, yes, um, China has um, em emphasized, um, uh, uh, has, has re is revamping the healthcare sector and also the aged care sector. Uh, China has a new uh, department uh, within the Ministry of Health dealing with a population aging, uh, dealing with healthy aging. So there have been a lot of policy initiati initiatives in promoting healthy aging and also uh, in promoting the social uh, provision of aged care. There are a lot of problems, but we have made a lot of progress in recent years. So would you say that China is more or less pursuing some of these policy directions, yeah. implementation challenges aside? Yes, including the retirement policy. Um, uh, China is actively, uh, it has been difficult as in, as in most other countries to postpone retirement age, but this policy has been putting, has been put forward many, many times and is receiving a lot of emphasis lately. Right. I think triggering policy response implementation is such a big issue. And of course, for, as uh, seen as the Professor Dr. Tata's previous slides, in, in, in our part of the world, a lot of countries are very much less developed, are aging very, very quickly, and they're very short runway to implement. And of course, it will cost resources that many of them may not have. So I'm gonna pass this question now to Wendy from Asian Development Bank. Uh, we've been working on this on long-term care, but what is the bank's role in terms of promoting and enabling countries to implement social policies around aging? Thank you, Marianne. Well, I think that uh, that's still something that we're trying to really figure out where, to, where is our uh, value added and what should be the right entry points for us. But um, I think what's, what's very clear, and you can see it in this report and elsewhere, is the, is the need. To, for, for, for many different actors to be, to be engaged, and Asian Development Bank being one of them, and working very closely with governments in helping to exchange on global good practice, on building capacity, and in actually supporting investment in this area. So I don't know where the... Um, I, just, a, just a few quick slides. Um, we've talked a lot, Dr. Piggott gave a very good um, overview of social protection options this morning, and also uh, Dr. Tata just gave a, a good set of uh, data from, from the region. But one of the things I wanted to raise is that um, many of the social protection systems in the region are nascent, and they do provide inadequate social protection. Um, the expenditure in Asia is increasing, slowly but surely, um, per capita over over the years, but this is driven mainly by the expansion of social insurance, pensions, and and uh, and health insurance. And those pensions are focused on people in the formal sector. And the average spending insurance in social insurance in increased from 2.5 to 3.1 percent, while social assistance, which is really where the social pensions and other types of cash assistance are, remained at 0.9 percent of GDP. And spending on active labor market programs was also uh, negligible, and this is really an area to build up. And when we think about all of the ideas that people have been putting together about uh, um, how to get people back into the workforce and how to maintain older people in the workforce for a longer time, that is the area of social protection we'd be looking at. But the lack of uh, social protection and inadequate um, and an, an inadequacy of the benefits are some of the major drivers of inequality in the region. And Srinivas gave a very good uh, overview about how important the gender dimension of this is, and that cannot be uh, overstated. Um, so if that's uh, just the, the context I wanted to provide, but also that we're at a particular inflection moment where we've just had COVID and we're still 
going through it and uh, and, uh, and and recovery in the region. So it affected uh, some much more than others and has raised the importance of both health and social protection systems as critical infrastructure in the region. It's very clear that countries that had better social protection systems did better and were able to protect uh, um, were able to protect their populations better. But you can see that uh, um, it it really hit every stage of the life cycle and every different uh, vulnerable uh, group. Um, one of the important things um, to also underline is that um, this is helping to really raise the profile of social protection in the region, to raise um, the idea about increased investment in this area, but it's also coming up against a lot of other priorities. And one of the biggest ones is also um, UHC, but all of the recovery agenda from, from COVID. So keeping the eye on this ball is, is, uh, is, is difficult. The other uh, part is that uh, um, there's been major impacts on youth in the region and particularly on youth employment. And this is gonna have very big impacts on their future learning, on their earning capaci capacity and on their pathways to healthy longevity. So as much as we have talked about the older population and the rapid aging in the region, we also, uh, is it's the region with the largest uh, global youth population as well. And it's the balance of these two dem demographics that uh, policymakers are often um, trying to make a decision about either or, and we're probably past the point of either or and really need to see it as the continuum for all the reasons that have been articulated here today and the importance of, uh, of, of uh, not putting those as adversaries with each other, but bringing them, bringing them more together in the, in the discussion. Um, so ADB's uh, specific support has tried to integrate uh, on, on, I mean, our, our, our corporate strategy sees the trend on, on aging and um, we're really trying to take it on and mainstream it across our institution. And uh, some of the priorities um, that we have been focusing on are supporting the development of data for evidence and decision support and also building uh, capacity within national um, statistics agencies, but more broadly across uh, different stakeholders in, in government. Um, we've placed a big importance on uh, developing, on, on building um, the knowledge base and then capacity building for developing long-term care systems. This came out of um, the demand from our China portfolio, and then we've tried to expand that to the rest of the region and help to prepare through um, a process of capacity building, through strategic planning, through piloting and, um, and, and sharing of uh, global experience, and especially learning from regional um, greats in the region like Singapore, like Japan, Korea, and elsewhere in Australia. And then um, we have a new set of portfolio coming on board now on health and age-friendly city development. And a lot of this is, um, well, it's, it's, it's nascent. It's coming slowly but surely, um, first in the China portfolio, but also trying to build that out in, in other parts. ADB does a lot of investment in, in uh, urban development. And um, it's very interesting because it, it, it forces the multi-sectoral response, and it's based on the strategic planning at the, at the, at the municipal level. And the final area that we find very important is really on the workforce development. And seeing this as both a critical need, but also as a great opportunity for job creation in the region, for um, a wide range of people, young people and older people to really uh, get activated and included in the, in the workforce across a wide range of areas, including um, affiliated services. So this is a quick overview on some of the technical assistance that we have ongoing in the region. One very important part is this um, pilots of community-based um, long-term care, which is taking place in four countries that were included in our original work. And uh, um, we're working closely with South Foundation and others on that. Um, and, um, and then uh, trying to put out in, in publications and other ways, um, what some of the building blocks of long-term care systems are, and to and to bring together as many as many national level stakeholders as possible. 
One comment I wanted to make um, about uh, something that was said earlier today. There's a number of uh, stakeholders who haven't been at the table yet. One of the most important ones is really ministries of education. This is a critical area for them to be in for all the reasons we've talked about in terms of workforce development, but also um, um, lifelong learning, et cetera. And not having them uh, there is, is making a big barrier to going forward. Um, some of the projects that we have are um, ongoing right now are this one in Tonga, for example, an integrated um, aged care project, which is building off of um, systems of community support, which um, are already operating there, outsourcing of service delivery to CSOs, and also um, um, skilling and reskilling for new job creation. And um, the Wuzhou, um, Guangxi Wuzhou, is one of the first healthy and age friendly city um, development projects that we have, which is focusing on healthy city um, with many of the attributes that people talked about earlier in terms of parks and walking and livable streets and, 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 and making the city come alive for everybody. But I was also um, working a lot on the capacity development for strategic planning. Of, um, of the municipal government developing um, uh, care services um, and, and has a very strong component on um, digital technology and, um, t and digital literacy, but also improving digital access for older persons. Um, so we've been trying to put out a lot of this uh, um, in, in recent publications. Um, here you can see our website, but uh, we are at actively um, trying to build up and strengthen our own staff across the different sectors where we're working to be able to engage more strongly and see this as a, as a very uh, important place to engage going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Actually, um, the Child Foundation, the privilege of being a center of excellence with ADB, and I've been a knowledge partner over the last few years around a project that um, when it mentioned about helping some of the countries be more aware in building policies around community long-term long -term, long -term care, community long-term primarily, and the impact it made. So we just recently um, held a workshop for Indonesia, so whereby about 15 government officials came with 15 practitioners doing the pilot project, and was very powerful for our government um, um, officers who very generously shared how they bloodied the nose and the path of thinking about aging, not as aging, but actually something to do with everything. So therefore, the idea is not to choose to invest in youth, to invest in education, or if we invest in aging, because it's all connected. And I remember one of the senior um, Indonesian officer was with me, he says, I just open because it never thought about it that way. So I think this is also stories being told by this report. It says not one or the other, it's all connected. What's good for older people, it's good for everybody else. Older people get jobs, younger people get jobs. So I think that's a narrative we have to change. It's not, you don't choose A or B, old people or children, that you can think about as a whole society way. And I'd like to put a plug for a whole regional approach because we find that this cross sharing is very powerful. From one government officer of officers talking to other government officers, there's a lot of credibility there. And of course, uh, even for Singapore initial, they say, well, this is Singapore, everything you, uh, you know, everything's fancy, and it doesn't really always apply to Indonesia. But in fact, when they came and visited the homes, understand the human condition and the stress of caregivers are not different for anywhere else, whether the rural village in Indonesia or uh, in Singapore is not so different. So a lot of services, principles could be interpreted and applied in, the, in this situation. So I think that really, I think the in, sort of within the region regional support for each other will be very, very effective as well. So I just actually want to thank um, Asian Development Bank and Wendy, because I think that even though it seems like a, you know, maybe from a bank's point of view, not a huge project, but I think the impact is actually quite big. Because if Indonesia is successful, they're already talking about replicating across Indonesia, which is pretty amazing. Anyway, so on that note, I want to turn over to um, uh, Mr. Tan, because the physical environment of urban settings is actually really important. So, you know, like in, in the region, there are rural areas and there are urban areas, so different kind of issue. In, in, in urban areas, when I first came to Singapore 30 years ago, we started with home care. Why? Because in HB flats, to lift old buildings, an elevator only stop on every fourth floor. So if you have a little bit of arthritis, a bit of cataract and all that, immediately it's very hard for the old person to get out. And crossing the street, you have to go down half a, half a kilometer up some stairs across. You know, it's actually the physical environment made it very difficult. I'm very happy to say that 
is no longer the case. So I think that really is something I'm very proud of. So I would like to invite Mr. Tom to comment on how the you know, Singapore's HDB policies arrive at a point whereby you're very aggressive and proactive in creating the kind of environment that's good for everyone, but certainly good for older people. Mr. Tan, please. Thanks, Marianne. Um, we have almost solved the problem. We, 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 when we started a program to provide leaf access to every floor, which is what you're talking about, we had 5,000 blocks. We went down, down to about 200 over. We're still working at it. Uh, there are some technical issues in those 200 blocks, but we, we are working at, on it. Okay, I, I just have four slides, and I, I think uh, I'll just breeze through them quite quickly. Uh, I am acutely aware that this is an international audience, so I should start by maybe uh, telling you what public housing in Singapore is like. Uh, we, are the public and, uh, we are the Housing and Development Board, HDB for short. Um, and our role, obviously, is to provide um, quality, affordable, inclusive housing. That's what we do in, in Singapore. Um, and we're quite conscious of the fact that uh, we don't look at the four walls of the flat. That's what we call our public housing flat, because they're all high-rise. Uh, the living environment is also important. So the precinct, facility, the, the greenery, the facilities, the amenities, the connectivity. So that's what the, a great living environment is about. And lastly, quite apart from the hard infrastructure, it's also about the people, the community. So we aim to um, promote thriving communities. And we have structures, we have programs to encourage people to come together. Uh, some, quite very, some very hard policies to ensure inclusive housing as well. Can we, talk, we can talk about that in the course of today's discussion. Uh, we have about 1 million flats uh, in total. Uh, right now, housing about 3 million people just, just over, and that's about 80% of our resident population. Um, all in, uh, some of you may be aware, we have one of the highest housing ownership uh, rates in the world. It's about 90% total, but if you look at public housing alone, it's even higher. It's about 94% of people who live in public housing own their homes. So that's the outcome of uh, 60 years of, uh, 62 years of uh, HDB's history. Uh, the data on elderly population, I think this is this uh, audience will know it quite well. I don't have to belabor that. We are one in six today in terms of uh, seniors, those above 65. Uh, in less, in about eight years' time, we will be one to four. So that's the extent of the issue. And uh, the Housing Board is acutely aware of this super aging society, and we are totally sold on providing a living environment that will be conducive for the seniors. I'll just cover in the next three slides some, some efforts we've taken uh, over the years. Uh, we are a town planner, and we do it comprehensively, which means to say when we provide infrastructure, we uh, look after not just the living needs, but also the live, work, play, and learn needs of our residents. Uh, what that means is that there will be um, commercial facilities, there will be uh, places where people work within the towns, there will be educational institutions, and there'll be recreational facilities. So the residents don't have to go far, actually, to, to sort of uh, meet all its needs. And that self-sufficiency was a great thing, right, during COVID, when we, when we were locked down, uh, when you try to avoid public transport. So many of our residents don't have to go beyond. If you can work from home, actually, for your lunch, for your dinner, for your other needs, you, you don't have to take any public transport. You just walk to where you need to go. So that, that turned out to be a great thing, and that's our planning philosophy, to make sure that every town is comprehensively planned and they're self-sufficient. As part of the amenities in these towns, uh, we have uh, also different levels of uh, social amenities that cater for the seniors. So in this slide is Elder Care Centre. That's the latest um, version of uh, facilities. We started with um, senior Activity Centre, we moved to Senior Care Centre, then at one time we have um, Active Ageing Hub, the latest um, invention or the latest terminology when we try to bring all of this together, which is both care as well as Active Ageing Needs, is uh, what we call the LD Care Centres. And these are located for many of you, if you have been to a housing estate, in what we call the Void Deck. It is basically the ground floor of the HDB blocks, which we void out so that we can put these um, facilities there. The living units, most of our blocks start on the second floor, second story onwards. And the ground floor are social and amenities, and many of them have elderly centres that are located there. 
In terms of the flat itself, we, we started uh, to provide for what we call senior flats uh, more than two decades ago. Uh, we, the first version was what we call studio apartments. It is essentially a one-bedroom apartment. Um, and then we sell them because we, we are big on home ownership, we sell them. It's, it's not rental, it's, it's, it's sold, and the, the seniors own the uh, studio apartment for 30 year lease. We then uh, decided to morph it to what we call two room flexi uh, flats, which is still in existence today. We sell them every quarterly or so. The only difference is that instead of having 30 year lease fixed, we sell them with flexible tenure, which means that uh, because the senior comes in, at different ages, they they buy these flats, it could be 65, it could be 75. We ensure that you, you have enough lease in these two-room flexi flats to last the senior to age 95. So we call it a flat for life, and that's what the, uh, the flexible lease is about. And then the, our latest uh, invention, as you see, the, the pace of progress of our seniors' housing is accelerating. 1998, 2015, just six years after that, we decided to launch what we call community care apartments. And these are essentially the same type of flats, one bedroom, uh, but we also provide a communal area on the same story. So instead of going down to the block, to the facility at the void deck, they can actually access facilities at the same story. It could be like 12 units, 14 units, and then there's a common area within the same story where they can uh, engage with their neighbours. There will be some uh, basic home fixes as provided by the, by the, by the operator. Uh, there will be some basic health care that is provided too. And there's a scale of services as uh, frailty sets in uh, that you can pay for service and that we hope will enable the seniors to age in place in this uh, CCA. In terms of the physical environment outside the flats, we have we, our... Um, Towns are obviously uh, barrier-free, BFA, barrier-free access, and then we move from barrier-free access to UD, universal design, uh, which caters for not just the seniors, but universal uh, population. And that's uh, those, the years are there, and that's how we have designed our, our towns. Moving on very quickly. Um, and we are conscious that um, it's not just the four walls. Uh, we... Mary Ann mentioned also um, the, the mobility uh, that the seniors uh, will need. And because we, the older flats are built with leaf access, not on every floor, so we went back with this program called Leaf Upgrading Program to ensure that every housing unit has direct leaf access. That entails us putting up leaf shafts and then connecting it to the blocks. And that's what, that's what we have done. We are, we are left with about 200 blocks uh, to do. Uh, and by the way, because we can't overcome the technical issues of these 200 blocks, we actually give them a grant, the residents a grant. We say that, you know, it, it, it's not possible for us to punch this lift shaft because there are services underneath. Why don't we give you a grant and then you, 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 you use the grant to buy a flat, which has universal access, with, with the lift access. So the take-up is there but not great because, as I'll cover later on, many seniors do want to age in place. So that's one of the challenges that we have. We also have a program um, because the studio apartments we started in 1998, which means that uh, it's only over the last two decades, we have four decades worth of flats that we have built that doesn't have these senior facilities in the home. So we have a program called Ease where we go back to the units and we provide grab bars, we provide ramps, we provide non-slip towels uh, at highly subsidized rate for uh, the seniors to be able to age in place. It is an impactful program because you go to where the seniors are living and they want to age in place, they are quite reluctant to move out, and you provide these facilities to uh, enable them to live a more uh, dignified and graceful life every day. And beyond the blocks, we have the precinct I mentioned earlier on, uh, and many of our new towns uh, come with three gen playgrounds. We site the childcare centre and the elder care centre side by side so that they can, in their breaks, and then some, in some uh, locations, they have uh, program activities where the children come out and interact with the elderly. We have therapeutic gardens for, in some of our newer developments, as well as allotted community gardens. Gardening is quite big, getting bigger in Singapore. And we locate some of these uh, amenities uh, because we're land scarce on top of a multi-story car park on the rooftop because you need to do landscape replacement. So we green the place. At the same time, we provide for these community plots for the seniors to come together to, to do gardening. 
And that's about the, the planning and design that goes on to uh, try to provide for uh, residents of different ages, including the seniors. And last but not least, it's just not just the uh, hardware, but also programs. We have uh, volunteers and we do mobilize them. And we organize activities once in a while. We activate places. We get neighbors to come down, design a new playground or activate a certain void deck space so they get involved in enhancing the living environment outside of their homes. And that also keeps them occupied. So that's the community programs part. And that's supported uh, by a large core of volunteers. We can't do it ourselves. And this is my last slide. Um, in a way, sort of bringing all this together, I, I, I should mention this initiative. My partner in crime is uh, John Wong. I, I hear his name mentioned several times today. So I, I should say this is a HDB NUHS, uh, NUS. Uh, in Chai is here too. And, and um, it's a novel, um, one of its kind, I think, um, uh, initiative. I think driven by the idea, at least for HDB's point of view, that we can't do everything. We need to uh, involve other agencies in particular, whether it's Sport Singapore to design the sporting facility, whether it's Ministry of Social and uh, Family Development for, uh, for the social facilities to be provided, or even MTI, Trade and Industry Ministry, to provide micro jobs so that seniors can uh, engage themselves as they, as they, even as they grow older. Um, and I think from, uh, I don't know about John, but from NUHS perspective, it must be the recognition that the built environment does have a big, <laughs> big part to play uh, in terms of the social determinants of health. So we are in it together. We have started this program for about two years. Uh, we have drawn out the boundary of Queenstown. It's one of the 27 towns, in, 20, one of the 24 towns, uh, housing uh, HDB towns in Singapore. Uh, we chose Queenstown. Uh, because the demographic of Queenstown, it's quite close to what Singapore will be in 2030. One in four, above 65. And it just so happened that the NUS, NUHS is uh, located in Queenstown. So we are here, we consider Queenstown a living lab, and we will be focusing a lot of the interventions uh, that we will be coming out with um, in Queenstown. I will cover some of them, I think, later on as we have the discussion. And the four focus areas are just uh, there, uh, shown below, covering from preventive care to purposeful longevity to planning and design, which is the housing and HDB area, as well as technology, to, as we bring some of this uh, care closer to where people live. So that's, in a nutshell, uh, what we have planned for future. I should add that although we are, we are using Queenstown as a living lab, we do see uh, ourselves intensifying, focusing, trying out the efforts in Queenstown, but we are a national housing authority and we intend to scale this to other parts of, of Singapore. Uh, and because we, we do upgrading in our estates and towns, it's quite easy for us to do. So I think there's a lot of synergy in this project that we're having in Queenstown. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm always amazed when I hear about the planning in Singapore because it's so comprehensive. And I've been here for 30 years, so I've sort of seen the development over the years, not just thinking about aging, but being inclusive for all generations, how it can promote the software between them, the intergenerational relationship and accessibility and, and affordability and how seniors can maybe monetize, you know, their home ownership for a living. So it's really quite remarkable. I think it's probably an extreme example of how policy planning ministerially can work very well. And I think when Queenstown comes to real reality, it'll be basically implementing the uh, global roadmap. <laughs> Because be, everything will be in there. Um, I think some of you will be visiting. So as a matter of fact, uh, the, uh, the, uh, some of the, the Queenstown project will be highlighting um, sort of integration of services with uh, services with, with, with um, built environment. Uh, so I will be able to see some of the HDB flats. I think our overseas visitors are going to visiting and see what HDBs look like, and particularly around Queenstown walkabout. And uh, one of the services that um, I mean, mentioned, which is the um, Active Aging Centers, Active Aging Hubs, so integrating the services into the housing. You'll be able to visit some of those at Queenstown and subsequent at Wampo, whereby the foundation is also hosting a visit at a community level. So thank you for that. That was really, really exciting. Um, so back to, however, the rest of the world in Asia doesn't get to live that way in terms of the built environment, right? So, so I think this moment, I kind of want to ask Eduardo, who's been working for the last 14, 15 years in the region with our, or with many of the, our, our countries who uh, 
don't have that kind of access to resources and thinking, um, basically what are the critical um, issues, you think, around physical structure as well as social infrastructure that are, that are, are the current uh, concerns at this moment? Eduardo. Thank you. Can I have the... Uh, you, you started saying that we have to be optimistic in the future. But uh, I'm going to start with a concern for the future and then a note of optimism for the future. And the concern is obviously the uh, elephant in the room of healthy aging and of everything we do, which is climate change and extreme weather events that uh, are, are, are happening now. And then I'll talk a bit about the positive part, which is the role of communities and the experience that we have had in Asia in the last uh, year. Um, uh, you know, the UN Secretary General is running out of impactful phrases to say that we are at the verge of collapse for humanity. He's saying humanity is digging its own grave. No? And I think uh, he, he's about to say we're right in the tombstone already. No? Uh, uh, but, but then he highlights that uh, uh, climate change is no longer no, no longer something far off, it is happening now, it is happening today. And now we want to see, well, what has that got to do with older people, with population aging? And we've been trying to, to, to analyze this, uh, this a bit, no? Um, and, uh, okay. Um, first, the, the global emissions is a highly unequal situation, about 50% uh, of the global emissions are produced by 10% of the population and 50% of the poorest population in the world are producing less than 10% of the global em emissions. However, the impact is, is felt even more in poor countries, less prepared countries than in, uh, in, in, in the wealthier countries, the most uh, uh, responsible for global warming. But the, uh, I'm not talking about climate change in this uh, in this, in this event, no? So what I want to talk is about, is there an intersection between population aging and climate change? Where do they, do they connect? And I made this graph, and if it works well, they will merge together. And you will see uh, both are happening simultaneously. And in this, this decade, uh, I think population aging in, in Asia, at least in, in 2020s, 2030s, is the, the, the the highest uh, uh, speed of aging. Uh, both are predictable, we know it. We, science is telling us that, that it is happening. They have profound transformational effects and they require urgent action, which is in many cases, as has been highlighted in, in the case of population aging and older people, is not necessarily happening. Uh, the, the, National Academy of Science of the U.S. yesterday, or day before yesterday, published a report uh, from Cambridge University and, and other un uh, universities saying, listen, we are studying the very deleterious impact of, uh, of climate change on, on general populations if the, uh, temp uh, the global temperature goes to 1.5 or 2, 2 degrees. But nobody is studying, or very few people are studying, the impact of 3 or 3.5 degrees. And we are on course to reaching 3.5 degrees. If, uh, and they say the National Academy of Science endorses this finding that says that a 3.5 degrees uh, global warming would threaten the very existence of humanity. And we are in the middle of it. Yeah? And, of course, we are talking about and we have to talk about healthy aging, income security, and old age, and all that. But if this overarching problem is not dealt with, there will be nobody to <laughs> age healthy. <Right. laughs> um, so I, and I think we have to see from the point of view of older people and population aging, when we talk about climate change, we tend to see older people as vulnerable and older people as, as, as victims. And that is correct, because if we see different type of, of, uh, of uh, disasters, no? uh, Katrina in 2004, I think it was, 75% uh, of the people who died in Katrina were 
people over the age of 60. But the, at that time, there were only, I cannot read, 10% of, of people over the age of 60. And the, if you see uh, the Great Eastern Earthquake and Tsunami of 2011 in Japan, um, we, we, were, we happened to work there with, uh, with, uh, in, uh, and we sent a group to the Miyagi Prefecture and there were 56% of older people who died in the tsunami in particular were over the age of 60 and the total uh, the people over the age of 60 at that time were 20, 23, 25%. You can see the figures there, I cannot read them well here. Uh, uh, likewise in, in uh, uh, in, in, in tsunamis, in earthquakes, in Nepal, 29% died, but there were only 7% of uh, people who were old. So there is a disproportionality. And why? Because older people have, you know, the older old in particular, have, tend to have less mobility, uh, less aware, less prepared, and less education. Uh, so less education means that in many cases, in many, many of those contexts, let's say in Nepal, they were illiterate, they didn't have any, any knowledge of what to do, they didn't have any education of how to respond to, to emergencies. So, uh, but, but we, we have to see the other side of the coin. Older people are a resource to societies. How can this resource be put into action in terms, in climate action? Uh, as it was mentioned here by, by different speakers in Sirinivas last one, there are 600 million people over the age of 60 now, today, a bit more in, in Asia. And there will be 1.3 billion, 1.3 billion in 2050, in 28 years time, um, in another phantom of the opera, somebody mentioned, no? <laughs> so you cannot, no society can afford to consider 1.3 billion as vulnerable or needing of assistance or passive uh, elements of, of a society. They, they, are, they are active, especially if you consider that older people are now reaching old age, better health, better prepared, better educated than all generations in the past. So how, how, to, how, to, how to overcome this generational divide that sees older people as in some cases has been the cause or the, 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 the ones that created the global warming. I heard that in, in some Western societies. It's very common, that, that perception. Or uh, uh, saying that older people are indifferent to climate action. Uh, or older people tend to vote conservatives which are reluctant or indifferent to, to climate action. And then some studies have been made about the attitudes of older people towards cl climate change. And they differ significantly between, between the older old and the not so old. And why? It's because the levels of education, the, there is a direct correlation between the level of education and the attitude or the understanding uh, of, uh, of climate change and the need for climate action. So the older old did not have access to education. Many countries were illiterate or hardly could uh, get any access to information. And they respond very, you know, in a primary selfish uh, uh, mood to, to an issue that is goes beyond the borders, that is global, and they fail to understand. But older people in general are not, uh, um, are not indifferent because we, we, we see that they are active in in, in climate movements from, uh, uh, from, uh, from, from the green movements. Who initiated the green movements? Uh, those who are old and very old now, who, who are in the Extinction Rebellion, where you see people chaining their, you know, chaining to, to, to some walls or some buses or, uh, in many cases, older people. But so we have to, to change this paradigm or this, this ageist idea that older people are, there is a generational divide in terms of climate action. Of course, younger generations are, are, have trust, have push, have the Greta's, uh, Greta Thunberg, but older people also have, have to push that, and they have been a bit opaque in the public domain. Uh, but in climate action, there are two, and I'll, I'll be short, Marianne, please. Uh, there are two, two sets of action that are, have been defined in the Paris Agreement and in, in previous agreements. 
adaptation and mitigation. Adaptation is prepared to, 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 to the uh, negative impact of, uh, of weather events, prepared for floods, droughts, uh, uh, rising sea levels, uh, heat waves, etc. No? And mitigation is what can you do to reduce the CO2 emissions uh, the commitment is by half, by 2030, which is not going to be reached at the, unless something dramatic happens, um, and to reach net zero by 2050. So to reach those goals, which are crucial for the well-being of humanity, for healthy aging, for everything, then you have to act. So how do we untap the potential of older people? And I. I just highlighted you know, some, some points. First, older people are powering numbers, and powering numbers in votes, in, uh, uh, in, in general. I mean, if you have 20% uh, or 25% of people who are over the age of 60 or older, and they are voters, they represent at least 30% of the voters in the country because children don't vote. So if, if aging older people can uh, can be rallied towards climate action, they can represent a power, a power. Leadership. Most leaders in the world are older people. We made a, an estimate of the average age of the ASEAN uh, prime ministers of countries is 68 years old, I think, 60, approaching 69 years old. Uh, uh, patterns of consumption. So how, how do uh, is there a generational difference between younger and older people in how they consume? Uh, and, and there is. Uh, older generations are much more careful in consuming um, energy and in, in, in uh, emission of CO2 per capita, for example. And uh, uh, there were some studies done with, it, with, uh, with Oxford on that. And still, that's an area that needs to be further explored, but uh, disposable income, somebody was mentioning, I think this morning, something similar. If you see people over 50, they have 70% of, around 70% of the total disposable income in the world. How they, they direct their consumption, how they direct their, their investment is, can be crucial because one important thing that everybody's saying but uh, uh, is being difficult to, to achieve is disinvest in fossil fuel industries because the fossil fuel industries are the ones that are the main block stone in, in terms of, of reducing uh, global emissions. So if they disinvest, but then we all have, most of us have pensions and our pension schemes move billions of dollars. And those billions of dollars in many cases are used to invest in, 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 in fossil fuel industry. But pensioners can become a force in disinvesting in, in that. Uh, another is, in what I was saying, engagement in climate action movements. You know? Older people, you know, they don't stay at home watching TV anymore. Older people are active, are engaged. So the global, global movement need the visible presence of older people. And the, the, the next point is in community levels. Uh, so how, wh how, what difference can an older person in a community in, in, in Cambodia, you know, poor uh, rural person do in terms of, of, of climate change? Can he just well, not throw plastic, not use plastic and that type of thing? That's, that's of course positive. But there is one idea that is being brewed in this region in Asia, which is the, the, the use the work with the associations of older people in the production of biochar, which sequesters CO2 and put it underground. And if that is done, if that is that pilot project is currently on course and it seems positive, if that can be scaled up, can make a huge difference for the income of communities and at the same time for the sequestration of CO2. Sounds like science fiction, but it's perfectly do it, doable by older people who are idle in their communities. And finally, think of intergenerationally. Don't think older people only, think intergenerationally. That's what we can do. So that was the issue of concern, but the, to finalize the positive point, it, what we have learned in Asia, and I think Srinivas mentioned it a bit, is 
the social innovation that is happening in, in, in the region. And that is the, the communities, the demonstration that the communities are at the core of healthy aging or, and of aging societies. During the pandemic, you know, when the first lockdown, we had a connection with, a, with, a, with a, uh, Bangladesh, with uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, different countries in the region, and China. And in every single one, every single one, the older people associations, where they were, older people associations have been active, not only in, in, in supporting the, 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 the lockdown and caring for the vulnerable and seeing who needed what, disseminating information. In Vietnam, they were even doing masks when there were no, no, no masks. They were uh, sewing masks, you know, and they're making special soaps with uh, mixing things. So and distributing them amongst the communities. So communities are at the core, are showing that they are at the core of, of the changed uh, demographic configuration in, in Asia. Uh, now there is a robust mov movement, but it is insufficient. There is not enough trust yet. There is still lack of political will, with the exception of a couple of countries. No? Um, but the, when we talk about community-based organizations, we we see that they are evolving in their design. So it's like the iPhone that we had, iPhone 1, then the same iPhone became 2, 3, and now they are in 14, 13, yeah? iPhone 14, 13, 14. So like the, the OPAs, the, the associations of older people have evolved through the years. And the, uh, the, the most upgraded, let's say, upgraded design, the iPhone 13, is organizations that are multifunctional, that are participative, that are replicable and scalable, and that are sustainable. And they are seen from the perspective of the older person in the community. It's not that some external force tells them your priority is um, water and sanitation, or your priority is uh, women, or your priority is income. It's them that they suggest, define their priorities, and then they establish a, a multifunctional organization that in most, if not all, have health as a component, health and healthy aging. So they do exercise, they do carry out activities, they are trained, they train themselves in, uh, with, the, with the health system, uh, like in Vietnam, to measure the monthly blood pressure for older members, and they have these big books when you go visit and you see the blood pressure of all of them, uh, and, and they, they ensure that the uh, health system makes a six monthly checkup of everyone. So it's, it's a great addition, connection with the health, health system. Yeah, and these are some examples. In Thailand, in Philippines, in Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Malaysia, uh, Myanmar, before the coup, Bangladesh. So we, Indonesia, we see that these are the type of activities that older people do. You know, they do exercises uh, daily, regularly, um, and uh, uh, they have won many awards, recognitions from UNDESA, from uh, WHO, from uh, Japan, and this, currently, these pilots are happening in, in these six countries. Uh, okay, that's it. I need to hold for a second. Yeah. Maybe before go on, uh, with a round of applause for a lot of information packed in there. Um, just want to check with the organizers, how much time do we have left? I can't see the clock. How much? 20, 20 more minutes? Okay, all right. So I think maybe we'll just have to make one lightning round and then wrap up so they can take some questions. Um, firstly, I just want to echo the power of the community. Uh, many things can be done can rally the power of the community. Being someone who has been working with the community is a very valuable resource. So older people identify an issue, older people providing solution. If there's something that's very untapped, I think then demonstrated in lots of the region, uh, countries in the region, but certainly also in Singapore. So I think it's something that we can cross-learn across the countries. Okay, I'm just going to, 
you know, back to reality. I think generally speaking, just this a one minute, <laughs> one minute reply, because, because it's really what's the priority. But I work on something now from housing perspective or from a bank perspective on social infrastructure or from um, Professor Zhao's point of view, you know, but it's not everything's rosy, certainly, right? Because we have to invest to get better. So working from future backwards, I think was a t t term future backwards, right? That what are the one priority area for the region we need to work on? Maybe two minutes, <laughs> two minutes, Professor Zhao. Uh, you have, are you on mute? Sorry. <laughs> As you know, um, the, the commission identified a lot of areas that need uh, policy actions. Um, but if, we're, if I am to rank all of them, I think the first one, the top one would be income security or financial security for old age. Um, not only because I'm an economist, <laughs> but also uh, economic security is really uh, key in promoting health. Um, it, it guarantees people having uh, resources um, to support their aging and support their care, etc. Uh, so, so, so I will use uh, just one minute. Thank you, thank you. Yes, yesterday I was talking to some of our colleagues from Cambodia, from Philippines and elsewhere, and I asked them the same question. They almost all say income security. Um, there's something action from the government in terms of social pension, um, access to paid work, um, and things like that. So I think this is unfortunate for our uh, region, still something that uh, takes full nation, you know, the whole nation approach to creating kind of income security for older people. Um, Wendy. How would you like to respond to that from Bank's point of view? I come at it maybe a little bit differently. I think that maybe one of the greatest weaknesses right now is, um, and it's something that's called for in the report, but I don't know uh, that there's no clear answer there about uh, um, the need to, for coordination institutionally across sectors and across stakeholders. And that is something that is really lacking and it is, uh, it's a big barrier and challenge um, right now for taking, nobody is specifically responsible for the issue of older persons. And, it, and in the case of long-term care, for example, it really is in the remit of ministries of social protection right now who are not well prepared to be able to uh, do it well or to be able to scale it up. And the lack of coordination with health ministries is one of the biggest uh, issues. It's also one of the biggest um, areas of demand right now because it's so clear that it's needed. Families feel it, uh, governments feel it, every, everybody. Um, so that's why it's a little bit of a, of a burning issue. And solving that um, would be very helpful. Japan has the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Social uh, Welfare, and they're able to then think very comprehensively. Not a lot of the, not a lot of other countries have have uh, institutional systems like that right now, and that's a that's a major barrier, I think, for being able to comprehensively um, move forward. And just one last thing, I think um, one of the biggest things that's happening right now in many countries in the region is developing um, country level national digital policies and being able to get the issues of inclusion, access, affordability and literacy into those digital policies is incredibly important and it's, it's, it's amazing how much those issues are, are missed in many of these digital policies. But it has implications across all of systems development and everything in terms of access and ability to um, actually utilize and take, and take advantage of. So those are two areas I see changing quickly and needing, needing change. Thank you for bringing that up, Wendy, because during COVID, it was very obvious that the digital divide between generations was really real and caused a great deal of issues. Um, uh, we all knew it, working on the aging sector, it's just that there was no impetus to push for it, but COVID really blew the lid off of it. So it's so important to remove the digital divide. And some of it is actually not just older people having access to, to, to equipment while on learning how to use it, but it's really a policy to make a Wi-Fi and all that sort of thing really um, accessible. So I think this comes to the final question that I want to pose to both and, um, and Eduardo, because that's our question, right? Because in the end of the day, in the end of the day, you know, what triggers policymakers to invest? So this is housing, but same question to you, Ming Doi, from 20, 30 years ago when the physical environment was really quite horrible <laughs> to now, which is so amazing. What triggered the policymakers to want to invest in that? 
Uh, maybe a tricky, hard question, because I know that our, our planning uh, for, for housing is always very advanced. But we can share our thoughts on that. Well, I, I think um, if you just look at the the data, which I think we, we all inundated with data, quite a bit of it uh, in the course of the day, um, you do need to worry about providing for housing in a way that suits the needs of your population. And that needs will evolve because of demographic changes. So if I, if I link back to sort of the, the, the biggest challenges you, you mentioned earlier on, I mean, speaking from public housing perspective, I can think of three. I'm not going to go to all of them. <laughs> uh, one, which is mainstream housing, which is just providing affordable housing and Singapore being so small, enough land for us, whether it's by recycling land, to meet the demands of our population. So that's mainstream housing, right? Not so much to do with an aging population. Number two is what Eduardo has mentioned quite extensively, which is climate change. Uh, it's the elephant in the room in, for many sectors of uh, uh, government, but also for housing. As we, as we build going forward, um, how do you be, build sustainably? It's not only the embodied carbon, but operational carbon. So, so when, in the life cycle of a building, uh, and for those of us in Singapore, you know that we can't avoid going to some green areas. We try to go to brownfield sites, but the nature of land in Singapore, we do need to go into some greener areas, not the core greener areas. And how do you sort of do um, nature conservation as well, even as you develop? So sustainable development. So that's the second one. And the third one, it's the theme for today, which is how to cater for an aging population. Uh, so I think that's a, one of the three of the biggest challenge for the housing board. Um, I think we've done work in all three areas. Uh, we've started the uh, Queenstown Health District for the third area of uh, aging population. And in the one or two minutes I have, I, I just want to call up the slides to just give a texture of uh, providing for uh, seniors aging what's a priority for us going forward. Okay, I just have two slides. Um, the focus for us in the housing board uh, in trying to cater for the aging population, uh, I mentioned earlier on in my earlier presentation, um, is this idea of aging in place. Uh, it is critical for us because there are four decades of housing that's built that wasn't, wasn't purposely, purpose built for, for seniors or the seniors didn't have a choice and they are aging now where they stay. Uh, so we have several programs, and the left one I've covered it is community care apartments. I just want to draw attention to the right one. We have a program that goes into existing housing to try to retrofit staff to enable the seniors to live more comfortably. We are in the process of thinking about new ideas of how to, what else, how to enhance this program, even as we try to scale up and expand it and moving a bit quicker uh, on this program. So some of the provisions you see there, Grab bars is fine, but how about more flexible grab bars because that enables the senior to manoeuvre better in the toilet, for example, because our toilets are not big. And also, shower seats, for example, you know, it's just convenient. And for a population that's ageing, those are small comforts, I think, which is useful. We could even, perhaps, this is a new idea I just came up with, maybe we should have some seats in a, in a lift, you know. <laughs> well, things like that, you know. So you need to go back to housing estates uh, to retrofit to, to assist our, our aging population uh, live better. And just my last slide, um, these are examples that we have come up with. Uh, there are things that we are trying to do in the health district I talked about earlier on. Uh, one of them uh, is about the precinct facility. We are working with our National Sports Authority, Sports SG, to design an active health fitness trail. Uh, it and involves us putting out fitness stations, designing a trail, first of all, doing an audit of the place to look at the gradient of the pathway, designing stations along this trail, uh, which will enable or help the, the seniors exercise, you know, sort of specially customised for the seniors, whether it is strength, whether it is flexibility, whether it's balance. A science-based trail that will help him maintain his uh, physical well-being. And there will be obviously um, a language, we, we are a multiracial society in four languages to uh, guide the seniors along, and then they'll be programming as well. That's something we hope to launch next year in a small precinct called Mailing within Queenstown. And this is by way of trying to promote 
uh, physical health. So there's physical, there's social, there's mental, but it's a physical part of it. And for the right side, it is about housing board uh, leaning forward to provide space. That's something that we do well. <laughs> uh, so this is the existing uh, housing estate. Uh, there could be some flats which are vacant. There could be some void deck facilities that could be available. Providing spaces for service providers to come in to bring care closer to where residents live. This could be teleconsultation. It could even be a transitional ward for someone that's discharged from the hospital, depending on the care needs required. And these are things that we're trying to do and working with our partners, Marianne, Sound Foundation being one of them, and all the other agencies to try to uh, make this happen in the, in the health district. So these are things that we're trying to do to tackle the challenges that we have going forward. Thank, Thank you. you. I think you're already so convinced that aging is something you need to work with. So I think uh, you just already full flash ahead. Then I'm going to give um, Eduardo the, the last word in terms of what it takes. Fine. Yeah, but really two minutes. I'll be short. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my apology. The, the question is how to build political will. We have a plethora of policies that are not implemented it, good intentions that are not uh, uh, trickling down to the to the to the ground. So, uh, in our experience in Asia, uh, evidence that you get technical evidence informs decisions, but it's not sufficient to trigger decisions. Um, uh, you mentioned the speed of population aging, and I think that's a major factor for 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 for. Um, triggering political will, but it's always lagging behind. The one country that has really acted upon uh, evidence, but practical evidence, not, not, uh, not uh, academic evidence, is Vietnam with the, with the uh, community-based organization that I was describing. The government has assumed that by 2030, the whole country will be uh, covered, all communities will have uh, this type of, of, of organization. But other countries are dragging their feet in terms of policies that are not implemented, care, uh, good, good intentions that are not done. So we have the different factors. One is ideology. Nepal established in 98 the universal social pensions because there had been a communist party in government and without any pilot, without anything, they established a social pension, small pension, but it exists uh, 40 years or 30 years down the line. So ideology is, is one factor. Uh, other factor is op opportunity. Uh, when there is, a, there is some, some, some change, there is some mm -hmm. um, situation that allows a decision to push for a decision, uh, policymakers and they have the right environment for doing it, they will take it. And there were some examples, for example, universal social pensions or universal health care in, in Thailand. Uh, there was this need of a government to seek legitimacy urgently, and they established a 10 baht uh, uh, health care, universal care, but paying 10 baht. The following government uh, wanted to build more legitimacy, they did away with the 10 baht and they just kept the, the universal uh, policy. So opportunity is another thing. Um, but we still don't have clarity on the mysteries of how political will is achieved. And one last thing is this very contextual, this very country driven. There are conditions in each country that allow that to, to happen. And I think if there is one country where we have to learn how those political decisions are made, political will is built, is Singapore, no? Really. Thank you. Thank, thank you for ending on that note, because I think that, of course, Singapore has done really well, I must say, in being aligned the, the policy uh, philosophy around looking at longevity and longevity as opportunity. We're going to the next step, going to embrace longevity. That's the like top foundation's new tagline. But really, we talk about a lot of things from climate change to policy, um, um, uh, policy uh, requirements in terms of social pensions, living, uh, or providing um, incomes, uh, income floor, and all that. But, but I think ultimately, we need to be able to figure out how to trigger the change both bottom up from the community and top down from the policymakers. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to have to stop because we were running a little bit late and we don't want to run later. So we're going to have to basically wrap up the session and give up q and I'm so sorry to say, but I'd like to have, invite a, a round of applause for our speakers. <laughs> Thank you.
and the panelists. Next, we are very fortunate to have Professor Chan Heng Chi with us here today, who will deliver the second keynote lecture. Professor Chang Heng Chi is the ambassador at large and professor at the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities in the Singapore University of Technology and Design. To introduce her, may we invite Professor John Wong, please. Professor Wong is the Isabel Chan Professor in Medical Sciences and Senior Vice President for Health Innovation and Translation at the National University of Singapore and Senior Advisor at the National University Health System. Professor Wong, please. Thank you, Usha. And uh, for all of you who have uh, labored to uh, hear the last keynote lecture, I think we're in for a treat. I think um, we've certainly heard an incredible number of great talks throughout the day. Um, but uh, our last uh, speaker, um, Professor Chan Heng Chi, is a, a legend in her own right. Um, as uh, introduced by uh, Usha, she's ambassador at large with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and professor at the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Studies at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Uh, she's had several careers. Previously, she was Singapore's ambassador to the United States and Singapore's permanent representative, representative to the United Nations. Uh, she is currently a member of the Presidential Council for Minority Rights, chairman of the Board of Trustees of ISEAS, the Yusof Ishak Institute, which is uh, arguably the premier multidisciplinary research institute on Southeast Asia. She is deputy chairman of the Social Science Research Council and a member of the Science of Cities Committee of the National Research Foundation. She's also a board member of the National University of Singapore, as well as the Yale NUS. Internationally, she is the global co-chair of the Asia Society and sits on the governing board of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Uh, Professor Chan is going to be speaking on Singapore's action plan for tackling issues presented by an aging population, both the actors and the actions. Professor Chan, please. Thank you very much, John. Um, John gave me a title for a speech. Um, you know, we're academics, we don't always stick to the title. Dis <laughs> Distinguished participants, a few months ago, I met an American filmmaker who was doing a documentary on aging. He interviewed me about Singapore policies. He came to know how old I was and proceeded to ask me about my lifestyle seriously. I answered him. Suddenly, I stopped and said, you're not going to use this in your film, are you? He replied, why not? I said, because for me, it is career ending, not career promoting. He looked at me with surprise and said, it is good that at your age, you are thinking of career promotion. This speaks to our topic on healthy longevity. It is about mindsets. Now, coming at the end of the day, I've heard so many speakers and they've all touched on the issues that I want to touch on, which really shows that we're all focusing on what is really crucial. I will highlight the approach and policies of Singapore in preparing for the growing aging population, but give you an assessment of how I think we are doing. We've been patting ourselves a lot on the back. Now, experts and analysts have admired Singapore for getting things right and achieving good results in governance, be it education, public health, city management, housing, or digital transformation. This is because we place importance on strategic thinking and long-term planning in the city-state. Singapore implements what I would call, what I would describe as policies of anticipation, and the government has to manage the politics of anticipation. 
because it is not easy to sell future policies, especially if it involves some pain for some quarters and if the policies are seen to be political. Now, let me begin with a quote from Lee Kuan Yew, the founding father of Singapore, and whose thinking has become our DNA. Lee Kuan Yew said, success means we are not in the kind of problems which we otherwise would have been. The fact that we are not in such serious trouble now is not by accident. That required effort and thinking ahead. How do we do this anticipatory strategic thinking and planning? And what are the effects? Now, in 1982, the Minister of Health, Hao Yun Chong, produced a report, 1982, entitled Committee on the Problems of the Aged to address the issues of a graying population and what to do about the problem. This became controversial because it re recommended raising the age for the withdrawal of CPF savings, our social security, from 55 to 60 years, so people will have the savings to live on as they grew older. The protest was so vehement that the policy and report was withdrawn, a demonstration that it is hard to sell policies dealing with the future. Ahead of its time, the report was already advocating raising the retirement age from 55 to 60, then 65. Now, what we learn from that episode is that the withdrawal of CPF retirement savings must be delinked from the extension of the retirement age. We learned that. In 1988, legislation was passed to introduce a group representation constituency, GRC. The idea was to introduce larger constituencies comprising a slate of candidates rather than have only single member districts, which was viewed by Singaporeans as a political move to disadvantage the opposition. The, in each GRC, the largest slate must include a minority candidate. Lee Kuan Yew argued that in the policies of politics of the future, it may be harder for the minority candidate to be elected in a single-member district plurality voting system given the dominance of the majority ethnic Chinese population. He argued this long before identity politics emerged as a political cleavage in the US and globally. So the GRC did get passed, but there was huge debate. Finally, my last example, in discussing the larger problems of the world and climate change, Lee Kuan Yew was asked by IHT in 2007, what were the risks to Singapore given climate change? Answer, oh, we are already in consultations with Delft in Holland to learn how to build dikes. Question, is that right? Yes, let's start thinking about it now. And in 2019, PM Lee spoke of this knew uh, his son, spoke of Singapore's plans to start poldering, building dikes and drains and a network of water pumps and canals to strengthen our coastlines and investing $100 billion over the next 50 to 100 years to ensure that Singapore will not be inundated by rising sea levels. The state of mind to anticipate problems has been instilled in each generation of leadership. And Prime Minister Lee Sen Lung said, you know, this is how we do things, always daring to dream, setting our sights on the next frontier and something, searching for better solutions and fresh possibilities. We look and plan ahead, not just for the next five or 10 years, but for next 30 to 50 years. And the thing about Singapore is that we actually do. Now, Singapore is considered one of the most rapidly aging societies in the world, third in Asia after Japan and Korea, and you see the figures there. And this has been repeated. Now, Singaporeans are also living longer and staying healthier. 
in this population, those with higher levels of education tend to live longer. In an answer to Parliament in 2021, the Ministry of Health provided the data that Singapore residents aged 25 years and older with educational attainment below secondary level have a life expectancy of 81 years of age, while those with the post-secondary education and more can expect to live up to 86.8 years, a difference of some six years. This difference is comparable to that observed in OECD countries. Now, the point I wish to highlight is that when discussing the aging in Singapore, we are not looking at a monolith. Those 65 and older are certainly different from those who are 55 to 64. But the population above 65 are generally less well-educated, grew up largely in a developing poorer Singapore, and were caught up in so many rapid changes in society. Those younger than 65 are better educated, grew up when Singapore was beginning to see a different future and on a path of growth. This group of 65 plus is what I would call a transition tran generation, which will need greater assistance to achieve active longevity. We don't speak of this, but that's what it is. Aging was foregrounded globally by the UN um, Madrid uh, International Plan of Action referred to. And in Singapore, we embrace the Madrid International Plan and its priorities. This is after Hao Yun Chong's plan was jettisoned. Through the, 20, uh, the year 2000s, um, the government was increasingly increasingly aware of the overhang of an aging population and the implications for crafting policy. And in 2007, we created a multi-ministerial committee uh, comprising the ministries of health, finance, education, national development, communications and information, community youth, uh, development youth and sports and transport. And this enabled us to apply a whole of government approach to this complex issue. Whole of government, that's the secret sauce for Singapore's success. Now the action plan for successful aging was launched in 2016. It was a major document to chart the, ways, the way for Singaporeans to age confidently and gracefully. And this document is a reference point for our discussions on aging. You see what's listed there, the usual areas. But I would like to highlight the one on protection for vulnerable seniors, which made us realize we have to bring in legislation. And also, I would highlight research on aging, which I think is very forward-looking to include that in the plan. There's lots of money for aging research come to Singapore. Now, each area is thought through and connected to other areas, reflecting the understanding that providing for an aging population is a systems approach, such as ensuring the necessary policies and regulations, also redesigning systems, health, education, the workplace, and the physical and built environment. Now, I won't go through all these um, areas. I want to focus on four key areas, and they are the same areas that have been highlighted by many in the discussions today. Aging and healthcare, aging employment and financial security, aging and the digital divide, and the feminization of aging in Singapore, okay? Aging and healthcare. Now, Singapore offers universal healthcare coverage to citizens with the financing system which is anchored on the twin philosophies of individual responsibility and affordable health care for all. With the mixed financing and multiple layers of protection, no Singaporean is denied access to health care because of affordability issues. And the first layer of protection is provided by the government, which extends subsidies of up to 80% of the total bill across the public healthcare settings. So it's a good healthcare system. 
It is means-tested, and those who require more will receive more financial support. Then we have something called Medishi Life, health, cash, uh, health insurance scheme, Medisave, a national health care saving system, and Medifund, an endowment fund for Singaporeans facing difficulties after you've activated everything else and you're still in trouble, you have Medisave fund. No Singaporean will be denied appropriate health care due to inability to pay. That's the principle. Now, Singaporeans, including the elderly, can access subsidized health care in the primary health care setting. Those 65 and above enjoy subsidies of up to 75% of services and drugs at the government polyclinics, and the rest of the population enjoy 50%. There are other subsidy programs, you know, but perhaps the most appreciated and valued programs on health in Singapore are the Pioneer Generation Package and the Medeca Generation Package, introduced in 2015 and 2020. They provide elderly Singaporeans with additional health care subsidies. One, the first, Pioneer covering 450,000 elderly and Medeca covering 500,000 elderly is by generations. And the packages are universal for everyone. It's not income-based, and it's, it's not tied to your income levels. And really, it helps the children, because you don't have to worry about papa and mama's health. But there is more to aging healthcare, of course, beyond subsidies. And this means fostering well-being and wellness, social and community ties, and a sense of self-esteem. And there is now an awareness globally that loneliness and isolation is a problem with some segments of the aging population uh, you know, who then feel they fall into depression and that hastens dementia. A study from the Duke NUS Medical School conducted uh, on, on Singaporeans aged 60 and above in the last 10 years showed that there was a major decline uh, between 2009 and 2016 and 17, in the proportion of older Singaporeans who reported being lonely. In 2009, one in two older Singaporeans, over 60, reported being sometimes lonely or mostly lonely. And in 16 and 17, the proportion was one in three experiencing loneliness. The decline in loneliness was evident in all the age groups, 60 to 69, 70 to 79, and 89 years and older, and was true of male and female. We have the uh, tables, but I think we won't show them in the interest of time. This is interesting because the data from this same study indicated that the same population reported they said they weren't lonely, but the social networks outside the family had weakened, and the participation in attending committees, um, committee meetings, community clubs, and neighborhood events, or attendance in the place of worship had declined in these 10 years. How then to explain the decline in loneliness from a social scientist's viewpoint? The study also indicated, I would say, that a larger proportion of the population was working part-time and full-time in 2016 and 2017. And they are also better educated than the, when you did the 2009 study, and more were living with their family, which could be the explanatory factors. But they may be working because they need to work for the money. Overall, Singapore's health care provisions and policies for the aging population are thought through and considered good to very good. But these policies must be more widely and better communicated to the beneficiaries. Furthermore, it would appear seniors are losing the networks where they may, may be assessing the necessary information. Now, let me talk about aging employment and financial security. To enable the employability of older workers, 
who wish to work, the government introduced two measures. Firstly, the Retirement and Reemployment Act. And in January 2022, this act set the statutory retirement age at 63 and re-employment up to 68. You can be re-employed, you know. It's not just that you are shunted off at a certain age. This was a discussion earlier this morning. Uh, and by 2030, the retirement age would be progressively raised to 65, re-employment age to 70. Secondly, there is something called the Special Employment Credit introduced in 2011. It's innovative and incentivizing. The government offers wage offsets to employers for hiring older workers, earning up to $4,000 a month. And in the pandemic budget of 2020, the special employment credit in the senior work support package was very generous. Uh, now you can see the wage offset table, you know, for employers hiring older workers. If you're an employer hiring those 67 and above, you could be getting 8% offset for their wages. That was 2021 and 2022. So we do offer additionals such as this. There are critics who argue that the retirement age is raised too slowly for those who wish to remain in the workforce and that Singapore should have no retirement age at all. Now that is the debate. But no one has disputed the value of the a special employment credit. Now, how have older, our older population fared in terms of employment? In June 2021, the total work, in the total workforce of 2.28 million, 17% of the workforce were 60 years and older, and 8% were 65 and older. And this is, in fact, an increase if you compare it to 2011. Now, what do they do? And you can see the, uh, the kind of you know, occupations they work on. If you look at the figures of all those who are 60 to 70 and over, the three bands of the older, uh, worker, uh, older population, 75% of them are spread over many occupations, starting from managers, administration, professionals, etc., craftsmen, and, uh, you know, they work, uh, they are machine operators, etc. 25% would be in the last category of cleaners and laborers. So 75 above in a lot of professions, but 25 are cleaners and laborers. So they are not as educated. You know, and you find the older ones land in that category. But Singapore recognizes that neither legislation on employability, this is male and female, but uh, maybe we should pass that. Huh? On employ we recognize that legislation on employability and wage offsets are not silver bullets for employers. The employability of older workers depends on the retraining and skills acquisition of the workers as they near retirement. That's what we need. And in fact, reskilling and retraining is for all workers in Singapore as we face Industry 4.0. There is emphasis here on lifelong learning and continuous education training and for older workers. Now, how does the aging population fare in terms of financial security? This was raised by many people. In Singapore, the CPF, the Social Security Account for Working Singaporeans, is meant to be the main retirement source of income, which can be withdrawn when one reaches the age of 55. You can also postpone it, you know. In fact, you can say from 65 to 70. I will draw it. It's not that you have to withdraw at 65. That change has been made. Yeah, but, but beyond that, I think individuals rely on personal savings and investments if you happen to have them. The concern is always with the 30 percentile and below, whether they have adequate resources to support their aging years. And to provide this 
additional retirement, Mr. Tan from HDB will tell you, they propose an ingenious scheme, which is called the Lease Buyback Scheme, which allows older homeowners to monetize their flat by selling back what is left in a lease to HDB. Money is given, is put back in the uh, uh, social security account to be withdrawn monthly. And there is also the silver housing bonus, which allows an HDB flat dweller to downgrade and move to a smaller flat in exchange for cash. If you were in a four room flat, your kids have moved out, they've grown up, you go to a smaller flat, the two room flexi, you get money, you know, so. Now, a study of 2,000 individuals or so by Duke and U.S. Medical School on income adequacy for meeting monthly expenses showed that in 2019, 2016, a substantially higher proportion of older Singaporeans said they had enough money with some left over compared to the situation in 2009. But those who reported that they had some difficulty in meeting monthly expenses became higher from when you compare 2009 and 2016 and 70. So those who did well did better, and those who didn't do so well found it tougher. And I'm sure the pandemic has made things worse. Uh, the index and uh, Yes, that's the side. Now, can we move on to the next? It is notable that nearly 50% of those 55 and older said they would request money from their children or spouse if they had a shortfall. And this is not surprising because it's the cultural reflex of the Asian family. The state too encourages this for family bonding and the acknowledgement of responsibility. But it could become an issue for the sandwiched families who are pressured to look after their parents' needs and their children's needs. And you have two sets of parents, his and hers. And, you know, Asian families feel obliged to do that. And some can't do it and they just um, give up the responsibility. Now, again, one area that can be further strengthened is more effective communication of the range of social support schemes between social service agencies and the seniors. Many are simply not aware what they are eligible for and the steps that must be taken if they were to avail themselves of the help. We have all the policies there, is how to get to those who need the help, especially if they are old, they're in the flats by themselves, and if they don't come up very much. Let me deal with the third issue, which is aging and the digital divide. The growth of the digital economy and digital society is a fact. The COVID pandemic simply accelerated digitalization. In 2014, Singapore launched its Smart Nation initiative, though Singapore was long wired up and well connected. The Smart Nation at its core is inclusive with the goal of bringing every citizen on this digital journey. The government is fully cognizant of the difficulties the two groups must face, and the two groups are the low-income families and the aging population who may not be able to cope with the changes and use the technology. And to assist seniors, the Smart Nation office set up a Citizen Connects Centre with staff to help citizens access government service. There's a silver infocom junction located everywhere in the island which provides affordable and customised training for seniors to acquire basic digital skills as well as courses at a higher level. And in addition to that, the Seniors Go Digital, where one-on-one uh, -on -one service is provided. You come in, they'll teach you how to use your tablet and how to make e-payments. So is there a digital divide and how bad is it? Let's just look at the two charts and a table to get the picture. And this, these charts come from IMDA, which is our um, IT authority. 
the lowest column is those 60 years and above. But what is interesting is that those 50 to 59 are almost as good as every other young group that you see on the chart. The purple line is 2019, 2018, and it is heartening to know that the seniors too, the proportion becoming more using internet has increased. Next. Now, we'll look at the portable equipment that they use. The light blue line, 16% of seniors, 60 and above use the notebook, 19% uh, use the tablet, and uh, the smartphone, 76%. And if you look at uh, none of the above, it's 13%, 60 and above, use none of the above. So that is your digital divide. And what do they use these um, uh, devices for? Well, first, instant messaging is a big deal, the yellow column, yeah? Then uh, is social networks, getting information of the web, and they do watch movies and um, short films, you know? So that's, the data clearly shows there is a divide. And there is definitely a generation of seniors who are in the transition. They need special assistance to keep up with the technology. Now, anecdotal evidence suggests that every older parent staying with, with or visited by their grown kids, including John, rely on them for IT support. <laughs> Weekend visits may certainly include a demonstration or assistance. And the data shows that those between 15, 50 to 59 are savvy. But my techie friends tell me that there may always be a transition digital generation. Because when the 50 to 59 savvy people reach 70 to 75, they may find themselves falling behind new technologies and needing assistance to keep up with the changes. But I would say that there are reports that some seniors are finding the impetus in Singapore to go digital being pushed too fast and too hard, leaving them feeling inadequate when navigating e-payments and e-banking and some essential government services. This could result in a loss of confidence, a sense of competence, and possibly affect their mental health. This may not be a small group. The, small nation, the smart nation should accept the reality and make sufficient arrangements to accommodate this transition generation. Let me go to my last issue, which is on the feminization of aging. And I'm glad Kani Son brought this up. The world is aging, but the trend, especially in the Asia Pacific, which uh, Mr. Tata showed, uh, is that women outlive men. The trend described as feminization of aging draws attention to the phenomenon that women tend to live on average one to seven years longer than men. Now in Singapore, female life expectancy is expected to increase to 86.1 years. But you know, about 10 of those years are spent in not so good health. Many of these women may not have worked at all or stopped working early in their careers to become homemakers and caregivers. This has implications on how they manage active and healthy living as they grow older. Those with lower income are generally in poor health, with fewer social connections and are less resourced than men, more reliant on their spouse or children to look after them. And many use their children's MediSafe for their needs, especially many in the transition generation. WINGS, a civil society organization in Singapore, was specially formed to help the silver generation of women age better and prepare themselves for living longer lives, formed by Dr. Kanwaljit Seon. It remains the only gender-based social group for aging women. Singapore government social program support is gender neutral and inclusive in its overall approach. Singapore has planned well and comprehensively in the action plans for successful aging, but it may be necessary 
and timely for the government to focus some programs on the special needs of aging women. Now, let me highlight the related issue of caregivers. In Singapore, as in all societies, caregivers tend to be women. There are men who invest long hours and emotion as caregivers, though women easily outnumber men. Caregivers have come to our attention as the aging population grows. They suffer from time poverty and loss of freedom of movement, being tied to the family member they care for. The recent white paper on women's development gave recognition and support to caregivers. Action plans were announced ranging from helping to ease the caretaker's load to financial relief and enhanced support for caregivers of persons with disabilities and children with special needs and of wanting to create peer group networks for caregivers in the community. These are very welcome moves. There was a poignant story recently, and some of you in the room may remember that, of a 70-year-old daughter looking after her 99-year-old father who suffers from dementia. She is feeling the toll as she ages. A recently released National Council of Social Services survey to understand the quality of life of caregivers indicated that those with caring help reported a better quality of life. You're a caregiver with help, you have a better quality of life. Two in five handled caregiving alone. Less than 30% used caregiver services because of cost. Now, Singapore is now stepping up to assist caregivers gender neutral, which is still fine as, Singapore, as women will be the main beneficiaries. But this will cover men who are caregivers too, and they need the help. These are important steps, but they will need the appropriate allocation of resources. In the Singapore Social Compact, the family is thrust into the first line of defence to enhance the growth of society and its well-being. Informal caregivers contribute some degree of unpaid care work. I think a case can be made for caregiver support to be continually enhanced to ensure the sustainability of our health care and social service system. Let me now conclude. In this brief uh, half hour, I have tried to convey the Singaporean approach of working ahead with the oncoming needs of the older population. It is anticipating the issues and thinking a systems approach when designing our roadmap for healthy longevity. We have numerous programs and support schemes to meet different needs, which are reviewed and upgraded and we have done very well so far. But reviews are better sooner than later because changes are so rapid today. At every step of the way, communication, explanation, and outreach to the target population is of paramount importance. Our action plan for aging is a work in progress where we are constantly upgrading and updating the plan through consultations between the state, individuals, and their families and community. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chan. We have now come to the end of today's summit, and we certainly hope you have enjoyed the fruitful discussions throughout the day. Um, now, may I invite Dr. Victor Zhao, President of the US National Academy of Medicine, to deliver the closing speech. Dr. Zhao, please. Thank you, and I promise you it's not going to be a closing speech. Um, Professor Chang, that was an extremely thoughtful and uh, insightful lecture that you gave. I think I've learned a lot, and particularly I do quite agree, the idea of anticipatory strategy. Uh, 
I said earlier in my remarks, why Singapore? I think you have just proven the reason. I said it was pre-planned and pre-ordained because I know so much about Singapore, not as much as many of you, but enough to know this is the place that we're to launch this report. We're likely to see support, traction, and action. And it's a launch pad, if you will, for this report to have implementation elsewhere. So I open today's remarks with saying, what do we do at National Academies? And you saw that we first identify, and this was our grand challenge. We analyze, we get together the best minds, and then we produce a product, a report with recommendations. This is the phase now in which we disseminate our information to get buy-in, to get input, to get support, to say, let's move forward. So our next part of our journey clearly is going from dissemination to implementation, hoping to make an impact. So as I reflect on today's meeting, and I thought so much great, so many great ideas, so much was discussed, the question is, what do we do next? So I've had many conversations of you with Marion Zhao, of course with Linda, with John, with my team, and many others. And it's very clear that we need to continue, <clears throat> take this set of important recommendations from the report forward. Now, I thought the last panel that Marion um, moderated was a perfect way to say, how do you move forward? Because that discussion included a discussion with Wendy saying the need for coordination. Eduardo, the need for actually movement forward, right? And of course, I heard so much from others about uh, so many different aspects. So let me just try to put that into perspective. I think it's very clear that anything that's going to have impact going forward requires both community, but also leadership support. And I believe that Eduardo might have used the word political will. But also, Wendy says you need coordination. So as I reflect on my own experience and what's happened in the world, and how things matter and happen, I think Professor Chen talked about all of government approach. There's no question this issue of health longevity is an all-government approach. And I learned so much from COVID, where it was so clear from the health point of view, vaccination, investment, let's put more money into health. But it actually took an economic crisis to realize it's more than health. It's in fact all of society, in fact community, in fact humanity, in fact economy. And actually what really happened at the end of the day when things do happen, I think someone did mention this morning about the fifth. I did, but I think that uh, somebody else did. That is whole idea of financing to prevent, prepare, to, to be prepared for future pandemics required Ministry of Economy and Finance to say, yes, we support you, because we need to, we realize what this is now doing. Eduardo, same for climate, climate. Really, all these, what I call existential threats, are affecting all our society. And it takes all of government, not just speaking to the Ministry of Health, but speak to everyone, as Mary and I talked about. So when you talk about in Japan, they have health, labor, and welfare. I was saying this topic will require all of the above and more of all the pieces together for people to realize how important this is. But as we pointed out, these decisions have been made on evidence, not just politics. And I think, John, you have a perfect opportunity to gather evidence. My own feeling is the Queenstown project converges almost everything that Singapore is thinking about. Population health, the older population, and how to actually do good for the citizen of Singapore. So my feeling is you must collect evidence. You have, in fact, a perfect experiment 
model. So now I think it's time to look at how, since you're bringing all of government together, to collect that information, to show the data. And in thinking about the entire Healthier SG project, where there's a very bold project going forward, I think the starting point is demonstrating that when different services, different sectors come together for a common good, such as in this case, health, but health and longevity aging, you'll be able to demonstrate how integration, coordination, sharing resources, and perhaps even a common budget in decision making would impact the population that you serve. 100,000 in Queenstown, 23,000 uh, older population, and show them the data. And that would really help compel the population health, the Healthy Singapore project forward, in my opinion. So the last word, Eduardo, you may not know that the second grand challenge of national care medicine is climate and health. And in fact, it's even a bigger project than this one here. We've already launched it. We are in the middle of doing many things, including what we call transformation. That is bringing multiple sectors together, including food and agriculture, water and others. But in this case, focus on health and equity. And I think it's actually very compelling when you think about this. Because as you said, if you have to argue that with 3.5 centigrade increase, we have no more humanity. People are just going to say, yeah, you know, maybe it'll happen, it's in the future. But the data shows that 20 million deaths a year globally are happening because of climate-related issues. Extreme weather events, vector-borne disease, famine, malnutrition. So our message in the NAM is we have to act now because it's affecting your health, it's affecting your well-being. And it's happening right now. It's not the future of 3.5, it's today. So we are mobilizing effectively along with Biden administration a public-private partnership to look at how to look at the macroeconomics of intersections, you said, between climate, other economies, et cetera, how to transform them, and then how to decarbonize and mitigate the health sector, because we are actually emitting 8.5% of carbon US, and globally, the health sector is emitting 5% of all carbon emission. It's very big. Now, there's a, the private sector plays a really important role in supply chain manufacturing. So we bring together all the private sector with the public sector and the government to work on this. So thank you very much. I see this uh, group who's been with us from the very beginning. I think that I hope all of you are stimulated by today's event, by this report. And of course, our work is not done. And we will continue to work with all of you to push this forward, to certainly make a difference so that all populations, and particularly the population of older population, will be well served. So thank you very much. And I'm sure, well, I do know I'll be back here again in September, but I'm sure we'll be back on this topic again. So thank you. Oh, of course, I've got to thank John and uh, Linda commissioners. I mean, they have been such phenomenal leaders in the, this commission, this report. I need to say, thank the sponsors, Marion Zhao. Uh, I think and Chai has already stepped out, I believe as is uh, uh, others, but of course, Chuan as well. But thank you for hosting this. I thank your team, uh, John, phenomenal team, and of course, my team who's all here, and we look forward to working with you. So thank you.